Yeah. Yeah. Bill Bob started. Brian Bob started. That was my dad's first jump was in that. Is that right? And 65 for him, so he's a year after. You were there in 54? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Daddy was there in 65. Oh. When were you there? Uh, 94. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> starting to click and you couldn't be that old. Uh, yeah, the instructor said the hardest thing about jumping a C-119 is getting it up to 1,200 feet. <laughs> so you talk about fear. I never been so afraid in my life that first jump. Never. I gut wrenching, knee knocking fear. Oh, I wasn't scared the first one. It was the second one. I was that terrified. Right? That, 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 <laughs> you know what you expect first. after that. Most guys, their 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 first jumps are, are the worst, and they, they get progressively easy. The the uh, the courage fades over time, just like combat. If you're out of combat, I was never in it, but I, I read stories. And after you're out of it for a while, and you got to go back, and then you're real scared at first. And wow. so you were one of the few people I've ever run across that got more scared as they went along rather than less. Scared. I'll tell you, I just didn't know what to expect that first time, so it was just a wild ride for oh. the first trip through the door. But after that, I I got I guess used to it. But at the same time, it's something you always think about. Well, you visualize, everybody visualizes what a parachute drop or a parachute jump would be, and I did too before I made one. And what everyone fails to realize or visualize is the noise. Yeah. And, the and then the quiet. The, the lack of Yeah, noise. But, but it's just when they, the noise and, and the wind. Most people, when they think of the parachute jumping, they think of just, you know, jumping out. Because you see it, it's not a sound picture. It doesn't have a hot one. <laughs> You know, and it doesn't have that C-130 drop speed of 125 knots, you know, and yeah. so you're 135 miles an hour by a Class 3 hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> and so what it is, and you, no one ever visualizes what that, that hawk is like. It, it, they open those jump doors, it pressurizes all, every piece of nylon goes waving like that. So what do you, you want to talk about why? Well, how old were you when you were uh, in the military? Just turned 17. Just turned 17. Got my first adult arrest. I was uh, 17 in late November, and I got my first adult arrest. And uh, the judge no profit when I told him I was going in the Army. That's what the Army was like back then. They're doing it to the Army now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they waived before Mr. Mina rules. They waived no felony rules. They're going right back. But they waived, uh, they may have waived even a high school diploma. They're going right back to where they were in the 60s, a bunch of kill crazy psychos, man. She can't kill us, man. That's what we all want. Oh, man, I'm telling you, my, my, I was in Bravo, a, a rifle company for a year before I went to Special Weapons, and uh, the great majority of the guys in there were not high school graduates. One enlisted man had some college, he had two years of college. Right. And he was actually a U.S. that had volunteer airborne and then re upped and became RA. Yeah, so he was the draftee. <laughs> he was the one draftee in the company, and he was the one that had any college at all. <laughs> That's what it was like back then. It was like the French War and Legion, you know. Uh, you, you get out of going to court by saying you're going in the Army, you know. So, yeah, I'd gotten a big for the arrest. Uh, Childish done. Uh, me and another guy was going in the back of Royal Castles, which is like Crystal. And, right. and this is in Florida, Miami, did, uh, Dade County, Tyler. And crystals are like Florida, and we you knock and to use the bathroom. We we're going in the bathroom, stealing food uh, out of the back of it, and then throwing it in the car. Seventeen years old, <laughs> like, acting like a child. You know, we, you know, a, a gross of eggs. You know, which is only about this big, a dozen dozen eggs, one hundred and forty-four eggs. <laughs> you can you can do all kinds of stuff. With oh, uh, chop a custard pie. Just, just walk out in the. You, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a sociopath, man. I'm a, like what they call an antisocial. That's that's the new name for it, an antisocial personality. In, in my day, it was called a sociopathic character disorder. So it was known as. Really? Yeah, you just walk out in the middle of the street, stand on the yellow line, four lane, you know, like highly drive, blow large. Some people come along, you're standing right there in the middle on the yellow line, center line, and they're looking at you, and you're looking at them, <laughs> and they're looking. He's not going to throw that thing in. <laughs> and you, oh, oh. And then it run like that. Oh, I mean, tons of fun, man. <laughs> I love you. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gary, the, uh, like I said before, the reason we're here to talk to you, Mary's been adjudicated. Hey, I'm, I'll help we, you out on that case we, because uh, you, we made a deal. Yeah, we, and, we just, uh, just want to shore up a few things. Yeah. Yeah, I understood the FBI came to talk to you the other day. On um, Thursday. Yeah, this, 
we're, oh, yeah. we're not with them on, on anything. We're just basically going oh, no. to give background on Gary Hilton and just finish up our case. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, one, one thing that we got to get out of the way, due to the fact that you are in custody, mm-hmm. is our policy um, that we go ahead and make sure that you still understand what your rights are. Yeah, I which is, which is Which is our policy. I know you understand what your rights are because you basically, oh, yeah, quote, well, you right basically, right. You yeah. basically quoted them to me anyway. Yeah. But, um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to the Lord and have him present with you while you're being questioned. You cannot afford to hire a lawyer. Won't be appointed to represent you for any question if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Mm-hmm. Everything, everything good with that? Yeah. Um, basically, the, uh, from, from, from the military, I understand that you, uh, you met your first wife. Yeah. In the military? What was her name? Ursula. Ursula. Um, do what now? Lucy, that's the, what they call Ursula in Germany. And you met her in Germany? Mm-hmm. She, uh, how long were you guys married? Uh, just, uh, married in, uh, married in 98 and divorced in 71. I've been going with her since 65. She was 16 when I met her. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the worst mistake I ever made with her running her off. Really? Gorgeous girl. I mean, truly gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, the best body, uh, you know, none finer I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. She had a body so good she'd be at the swimming pool, she'd be going to the ladies' room, and I, I'd walk along behind her and see the little boy just in trance walk behind her and follow her right into the ladies' room. I mean, she was stunning, mm-hmm. stunning. And not only that, she was a good German housewife. Her father was a police. Hauptmeister, the highest in mm-hmm. the plane, first star. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. chief. Right. Hauptmeister. He was enlisted, but not an officer. That would be a uh, Hauptman. That was, I guess, you no know, Hauptmeister. Highest enlisted rank. He was a police officer. She had an older sister that had already married uh, GIE 5, so that kind of smoothed away from me. Right. But at any rate, she was gorgeous. A fine girl brought up by a police officer, fine German house for out, kept a spotless house, meals ready. Only wanted to do what I wanted to do. And not only that, she uh, had her training was as a draftsman. In Germany, they start them at about 15 into an apprenticeship program, where they go high school half the day mm-hmm. and learn a trade or a vacation, vocation the other half. Whether well, you're going to be a waitress or whatever you're going to be, it's called a learning, a learning, a learner, mm-hmm. an apprentice. So her apprenticeship was as a draftsman. There was, there was no computer assisted drafting back then. Mm-hmm. None. No CID. That's when they, when they hand drew everything. Didn't they? Everything. Hand drew, hand lettered. Everything. Even on the symbol or whatever. Add the whole blue. Imagine a blue printer. Yeah, a blue printer. Everything. Every single thing hand drawn. Sure. It was drafting. It was mm-hmm. what a draftsman was. So it's a high paying trade and it was hard to learn, very demanding and difficult. And of course, right up a German's alley because it demanded <laughs> precision. Yeah, yeah. That's what it demanded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just total meticulousness. And patience uh, and Germans are uh, with it. Anyway, the point is, she came over after I married her about over. She immediately was a good, uh, proceeded to get a job. Leslie Younger Company, my mother worked there, so that was the end. Got a job with them in the trust company, drawing trusses. They made trusses to order for buildings, and everyone had to be drawn, that kind of thing. So you actually brought her back to Yeah, the yeah. I married her, and after I'd been going with her a couple of years, I married her shortly before I left for the state, so that would put her in line for a visa. So right. I married her, got her, got her visa working back then. Visas were then hard to get. Probably yeah. still are for Germans. Right. Uh, and uh, got her working on her visa, and now she was my spouse, so, you know, bam, she had. And then at that time, I left. Went back and stayed briefly with my parents, rented an apartment or actually it was a guest house on the property on the Biscayne River, 125 or not. <laughs> sort of catty corner across from my mother and stuff all the stuff. And about two or three months later, I, then she came over. And then I worked another couple of months until December and uh, quit and entered uh, Miami Day Junior College uh, flying, going uh, pilot, career pilot program. Uh, using my GI Bill. Back then, maybe they still will pay 90% of you after after private pilot. You have to get your private pilot license. Back then, a private pilot license cost 900 bucks. You can get a Cessna of C-150s uh, dry for 11 bucks an hour, dual with an instructor for 14 an hour. That's great. Oh my God, I'm not telling you. Anyway, so uh, 
they pay would pay ninety percent. VA would pay ninety percent of your flight costs. For you. Oh yeah, and the tuition was one hundred and fifty a semester, but there was a community college. So you actually went through the training? And yeah, I got the degree at, uh, and I uh, got the uh, commercial ticket with a multi-engine and instrument rating, and I got a certificate of flight instructor instrument ticket. Wow. Uh, instrument thing? CFII. CFII, Certificated Flight Instructor Instrument. That's me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure a lot of guys are instrument rated even nowadays. No, no. Well, the instrument rating then was an additional 40 hours as much as it takes to get a, a, a right. private ticket. Yeah. Private ticket was 40 hours approved. I'm sorry, did you say you got commercial too? Yeah. Rated as, oh, oh, yeah. Commercial with a multi and instrument and then instrument instructor. Have you kept up with that? or? No, I've never flown to them. Oh, okay. You just got it. Just got it. And what what got me off off of that is that I worked 15 hours a week at the student system at the college. It was a nice allow. It was in the audio visual department. Right. At that time, right. Miami Dade Junior College North Campus was the largest in the nation. Twenty seven thousand students on one campus uh, out of that one campus. Maybe still is. Right. And as a result, the audio visual department wasn't just a bunch of old fifteen millimeter projectors. We're talking about production studios, TV, movie, movie production studios. On staff artists, on staff announcers. We can make our own slide presentations and everything with our artists and announcers could narrate them. Uh, we had a closed circuit TV system in uh, in '67. Uh, so yeah, using like the old uh, one one or two inch tape. Yeah, yeah. And we had what would they call a film chain where we could project movies into a TV camera and show them over closed circuit. Nobody had that. There was no such thing as a VCR or, uh, or VTR then, video tape recorder right. back then. Uh, they were, but it was commercial only. There were big decks, big, ones with big decks with either one or two inch tape. Uh, I forgot what it was. Yeah, very way cutting edge, totally cutting edge. And so it was a big operation, the distribution center, which did uh, every kind of presentation, in class, pre you know, handled every kind of in class presentation from slides to putting a TV set in for closed circuit to actually a movie, pushing a production. We did over 200 uh, runs a day at our distribution center. In other words, movie in class, over 200 a day, so that kind of thing. It was a real operation. I worked for, in other words, they had had about 30 student assistants per shift who was just working in the distribution center with two staff members supervising them, that kind of thing. So, so anyway, I worked as a student assistant for 15 hours a week during my whole time. When I graduated, they offered me a staff job, good pay, good pay, three twenty-five an hour. That's what UPS driver started back then, which is the equivalent of 15 an hour. No, so that was starting. You know. So you went to work there? Yeah, I worked to work there for uh, at, in 70 until uh, late 71, and they fired me. Absenteeism taking quite a well, like I said, I ran that girl off. You know why? Is that about the time you and her split? Yeah. No, no. Well, within four months after we were divorced, I ran her off. I decided, here we got a beautiful girl, made even at that time 25-30% more money than I did even on my good paying staff job. In other words, she made the equivalent of $20 an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, good grief. Right? Perfect house, squeaky clean, you could eat off the damn floor, meals ready, work to boot, gorgeous girl, and really only, to, only wanted to do what I wanted to do. And if I didn't want to do anything, she, you know, she wouldn't like it, but she'd do it. If I wanted to sit around and smoke pot or something, you know, she didn't do any drugs, didn't drink. I was a pothead, of course, by then. And everybody, we smoke, we could smoke on campus. It, uh, the staff would, would go into the, uh, Air conditioning room, which is a room uh, bigger than this, with an air conditioning unit taking up most of it, and take some student assistance there, and we'd go in there and smoke. We had the film society where we showed avant-garde films every Thursday night, Jean Luc uh, uh, Godard films, and uh, Ingmar Bergman films, and that kind of thing. And every the whole auditorium would be lighting up. And finally, the cops got wind of it and came in and busted 27 people. That was the end of the film society. But that was, that was <laughs> it back then. You know, drugs back then were uh, had not been demonized. Right. They were demonized very effectively under Reagan. Right. And he finally got that Omnibus Federal Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 in which 
the draconian penalties for for, for drugs. Uh, that was in 1986. So you end up with a Macon housewife importing a kilo of coke with two other people, and one of them had a firearm in their house when they were arrested. They had to add that up. The Macon housewife got 30 years no parole and serving it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's your demonization of drugs right there. Well, you you, you say you uh, got fired from that job for absenteeism because you were taking quite a yeah, and it's and 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 all ridiculous. Uh, within uh, three months, that was four, five, maybe five months after we got divorced. Was so, how many years total were you married to? From uh, sixty-eight, summer of sixty-eight to summer of seventy-one. Do you break it off with her? Or you... I ran her off. Oh, that's you know why I ran her off. You know, I'm telling you all these qualities she had. Well, remember now, I'm in. This is a cultural revolution. It's really hitting home. By 1970, everyone was in effect doing the 60s. <laughs> you know what I'm mean? caught up to? Yeah, yeah. You know that really hit people in California were doing the 60s in the early 60s. They were taking acid while it was still legal. You know, in 63, two, one. You know, and so forth. They were really doing the 60s. The diggers, the free food distribution, the real hippies. And by 1970, now you know the masses, including me, were doing the 60s. So I was doing the 60s and the 70s. Well, the army took away from that, too. I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I did a flip from being gung-ho to being, uh, you know, a, a liberal, uh, you know, uh, down with the establishment. But anyway, we had the Cultural Revolution going on. And uh, they, I was in college, and I, even though I wasn't on the teaching staff, it was, in a sense, the same status almost as being on. You were staff. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Air conditioning wasn't a blue collar job, nothing else. It's white shirt and tie and, and running a learning center or running a distribution center or this and that, supervising 30 student assistants, that kind of thing. Air conditioning, intellectual, that kind of academic atmosphere, right? Yeah. And my gripe against her was that she was just empty headed and didn't have a thought in the world and she was not sophisticated enough and not intellectual enough. You talk about speaking. Women today have too many thoughts. They have, they have too, you know what I mean? If you could find a woman that's just simple and plain and whatever you want, honey, and here's your food, and I got the house clean, good and I'm good looking to boot, and I make more money than you, well, my God, speak. women today have too many thoughts. They have, they have too, you know what I mean? If you could find a woman that's just simple and plain and whatever you want, honey, and here's your food, and I got the house clean, good and I'm that. good looking to boot, and I make more money than you, well, my God, you see how stupid I am? I'm a fucking yeah. idiot. There's a pattern throughout my life of, of taking good things and just crushing it, throwing them to the fuck. Did you, ever, did you ever run around on the way while you were working at college? I mean, all no, the no, way. no, I didn't, except at the end. Yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. At the end, mm -hmm. I did. Uh, some other staff members were, and, and as a matter of fact, the the third highest in North Campus of AV department, it would have been the director, assistant director, and then this guy openly had a student girlfriend. He was a man, in other words, married, and openly had a student girlfriend who was always with him and everything. And again, it was a different atmosphere. Back. Right. Now that that would be a, a felony, I think, right. for a teacher. I think for a felony, to, uh, a teacher to have sex with a student is, is having sex with a person in custody is, is the same as. I think it would be a felony. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, he wasn't a teacher. Mm -hmm. Shortly after after that went south, and you... You got another one? Yeah. 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 Y'all got geopolitical views. And <laughs> probably they had to stop. So the last thing that Pennsylvania deputy, uh, John, said to me, he said, <laughs> It was a little, you know. He said, uh, and thanks for allowing us to bend your ear. He said, <laughs> I laughed. I said, thanks for letting me bend your ear. Thank you. <laughs> so after college, or after your well, college. Anyway, I fell into the clutches of this older woman who was eight years older than me, and she was a drug dealer. She was from a New York Jewish diamond family, that 54th Street diamond family, uh, diamond folks that, that do these uh, million dollar deals with a handshake and you know you pass them and they wrap the diamonds in paper everyone's got their particular fold and they hand them you know each other a million bucks in diamonds and shake hands and that's it you can't get into it you gotta you gotta be born into it and yeah. Jewish okay what was her name uh Paulette and that's a her, her main name is Paulette Goldman Paulette Goldman and she was four years older than you eight eight years older than you mm -hmm. at any rate 
So she was the misfit. They didn't know what to do with her. She was a woman. So they had bought her a house at the edge of Coral Gables, between uh, Coral Gables, Coconut Grove, Downward. Again, Coconut Grove at that time was real avant-garde, artsy, artsy, artist colony. The Greenwich Village of uh, yeah, at Florida. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's, all that stuff has probably been torn down now, and big condos probably put on it. Back, back, back then, it was a village, like Buckhead Village used to be. Mm-hmm. But only much, much bigger, well, much bigger. And all kinds of cool, hip people lived there, so... And, of course, Cold Gables was a very rich place, and this was right on the boundary. So uh, they bought her house, and she was going to the University of Miami majoring in sociology. And she didn't even manage to, she, she managed to graduate with a, a, a bachelor's of degree in sociology. Uh, but she was a drug dealer, mm-hmm. and mainly marijuana, mm-hmm. ounce marijuana dealer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I moved in with her. Mm-hmm. And, boy, you know, that was not a good influence. Really? Yeah, well, she's the one that got me started on uh, the downs. I've never had a, a, a down. We call them downs. Mm-hmm. Central nervous system depressive. Right. Put it that way. Depressed the functioning of your central nervous right. system. And back then, it was the hypnotics uh, in the form of uh, methoclalone hydrochloride, which is uh, quaalude, pyrus, sopor. You might remember. Well, you won't remember, but sopor. Uh, and of course the barbiturates. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were still vital. Barbiturates were still widely prescribed at that time. Just the sleeping pills. Mm-hmm. We're talking about amitol, secanol, uh, amitol, secanol, nimbutol, and the combination of secanol and uh, secanol and amitol was tuminol. It was blue and blue and red. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like that. And they were considered the king. Yeah, they had that true. Narcotics, but through mm-hmm. opium derivatives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Straight man called my name. Down. Down. Yeah. Oh, oh, two and off were two. Mm-hmm. And then others were called by the colors they were. Uh, I think uh, red. Mm-hmm. Red. Well, there was red, blues, and uh, right. yellows, uh, right. and by the color they were. Right. I. I wouldn't be surprised if it's impossible to get hold of them. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, that I don't know if they yeah. have a fashion on them. I don't, well, the, uh, the newer classes of antidepressant and, uh, and sleeping pills, uh, you know, but back then, that was what people said. Oh, we'll take a sleeping pill. That's what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. Did you like by yourself and the hippie back then? Or? You know, by then, you know, what the hippies were, it was just every kind of outlaw street person. And mm-hmm. all. It was, I, you would count it, call it counterculture more mm-hmm. than anything, misfits. And the whole country was a washing them. It was just a one thing to be there back then. That was a movement kind of. Yeah, it, well, yeah. And, well, you know, and of course, they themselves were wearing a uniform and doing the style. And uh, the, the country was just a wash in young people. If you already, well, you don't, but uh, in Atlanta in the late 60s and early 70s, they, uh, since it's a regional capital, they, you know, they had up at, at the Piedmont Park, Penn Street, and the Peach Street there. It was just a wash in them. The whole country was full of, of just raggedy ass young people hitchhiking and doing not much of anything. And you know, at that time we thought drugs were gonna be legal within a few years. Yeah, the amazing thing to me that I'm always shaking my head over is this great big huge cultural revolution that we had in the sixties and seventies has almost utterly vanished. Utterly. And it's back to the fifties now. Back in the sixties, if I said, "Hey, businessman, that would be a bad thing." Hey, the businessman, take care of business, Mister Businessman. Mm-hmm. That would be a bad thing to say about someone. Mm-hmm. And now, what does every every young person want to do? Get a MBA? <laughs> They're all just you know little geeks on you know keyboards pecking away. Right. You know, the Bible says, "A meek shall inherit the earth." Well, I know what it means. It's just it's a fat fuck behind a keyboard, <laughs> <laughs> right? Got ten times more powerful than me, and I'm a stud. <laughs> I'm a stud. I can whip ass left and right, and then more powerful, ten times more powerful than me. Fat fucking a keyboard, sitting in a cubicle. Yeah, I learned to type in the '60s in the army when almost no man could type uh, unless you're a reporter or writer. But I won't type now. I call it women's work, <laughs> which shows I know we're making on the outside, which is, you know, why I'm sitting here doing life and, and realizing it's the only place for me. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You could take me to the front door of this jail and say, go forward and say no more. 
I literally had to turn back around and walk back in here. There's nothing out there for me. And you see what my relationship with society as a whole is. I mean, it's only 5% of the people that have come forward so very early and vehemently to, to knock me. But if the other 95% of the silent majority and don't, you know, they're not going to speak up. Oh, I know Jerry Golden. He's a, he's a great guy, you know. I know Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, Hannibal, you know, Hannibal the Cannibal Style. So, yeah. you know, I know Hannibal Lecter. He's a great guy. No, they're not going to say a goddamn thing. You'd be surprised people come forward and uh, talk pretty good about that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I'm not in the sense that they are 19 out of 20. Yeah. It's the people that they try to fuck with me which is, are relatively rare. Yeah. But unfortunately, I, I put myself in a position where I have a high degree, high amount of exposure to that type of people, and that is in dog situations. It's people with dogs. The average dog owner doesn't know jack shit about dogs. The average animal control officer doesn't know jack shit about dogs. Mm-hmm. They anthropomorphize. That means assigning human qualities to something. Anthropomorphic. Okay, and they assign human qualities to dogs, and what that means is is that they want dogs to be like humans, which is be nice and get along. Well, that's not the way it is in the dog world, because when dogs talk to each other, you know, they quite often revert back to the wolf world, and the wolf world is more incredibly savage and brutal than you can ever imagine. Wolves are one of wolves are one of the the only animal that I know of other than human beings that will run down and run down and run down and run down and go and go and go after another member of their own species to kill it. Okay. Just for the sake of killing? No. It's that, uh, it's, uh, it's that if they get in their territory, rather than just run them out, if they can, they'll go and go. Other, other animals, it's just brief contest of strength, more or less. But but a wolf pack, if they detect another wolf from outside their pack and their territory, they'll run it and they'll run it and they'll run it and they'll run it. And if they can catch it, they'll kill it. An alpha female, you got your alpha male and alpha female in a pack, the leaders of the pack. Okay, I heard a wild wildlife biologist say that they're they, they're studying them in yellow. They're back in Yellowstone now, so they're really getting good data on um, wolves in the last ten years. I heard a wildlife biologist on video say, you know. An alpha female may get up in the morning <coughs> and kill her mother and run her sister off. That's how savage and brittle the wolf world is. And that's what dogs can revert can revert back to when they're talking to each other. They don't understand, humans don't understand that in the dog world or the wolf world, there are no assault and battery laws. There are no murder laws. And quite often, there is no fear. Okay, imagine such a world where there's no murder laws. And there's no fear, which is why you see those chihuahuas getting killed all the time. They won't back down. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just grab them one shake and they're gone, man. You all see little dogs get killed that way, you know. They won't back down. Yeah. No murder laws, no no aggravated assault, no assault and battery laws, and quite often, no fear. That's what the dog world is. And you've got to understand that and, and be appropriately cautious. Mm-hmm. And humans don't understand that. And not only that, they they are aware that their their dog may fight and has fought and been they are aware of that. But on the other hand, they can't control the dog. The dog isn't trained. They no one has enough time to spend with their dogs to begin with to get them properly trained. So that means the dog is going to have to lead his life at the end of the leash and and he's jerking around. And what they want to do is is let their dog run loose. And every everyone that the dog confronts, they want to say it's okay. He's friendly, you know. And <laughs> and and they know it. I've had people. I've had people let their dogs confront me, and and fight and me fight the dogs. Have them call the police on me, and then in the succeeding year, have seen that same person and that same dog get in two or three more incidents of the same. Mm-hmm. A woman in Stone Mountain had two dogs 150 yards from me. I spotted them. And you're at a loss between trying to call they were and you're kind of conflicted as whether they're caller and warner or the fact is that as soon as they hear you call, the dogs are coming after you. <laughs> you know, you don't really know what to do. I called to her, I said, Yo, we've got a dog here, a dog under control. Wow. Dogs come right at me from a long way, 150 yards away. Dogs split up. 
So I'm, I'm doing stick work on one, and when they split up, then you're going to have to use whatever if, if they split up. You're, you're going to have to spray one at one if ever. No distance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily. Uh, it's hard to actually disable a dog with pepper, but uh, conversely, uh, dogs sense the pepper immediately, and, and it'll turn them. It'll turn them momentarily. If the dog, if the dog is determined, he'll he'll come back. Uh, so you know, you just take a shot at him. And I'm, I'm doing the stick work. They say the thing about the stick or the baton is that it can be used in a graduated manner mm -hmm. and that it does command respect in most dogs. And that's the, the, the beauty of the whole thing is a graduated uh, manner of, or as opposed to pepper or, or opposed to bullet. In other words, inviting a dog or a human with a stick, my goal is to shape the situation. Mm -hmm. My goal in a stick fight with a human or a dog is not to make contact with the dog. A successful stick fight it's preventative. To me, mm -hmm. is shaping it with a stick mm -hmm. and not making contact. Mm -hmm. Because it takes it to a, a whole other level mm -hmm. when you make, especially with a human being. You get a human being with a stick, regardless of the situation, it's probably going to ruin your day, buddy. Mm -hmm. And it may not go your way either. Mm -hmm. Even though it always has. I've had the police call on me 30 times at least, mm -hmm. and no exaggeration in, in 17 years. No exaggeration at all. At least 30 times. I've had them called five times in Murphy Camera. I've had them called three times at Stone Mountain uh, alone. In those, that's eight right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, at least 30 times. And in every single time that the police were called on me, mm -hmm. the police have confirmed that I did not act unlawfully. And there's been a couple of times the police have written me a letter saying that I could press charges if I want. The one time it didn't go my way was not with the police officer. It was with animal control. Mm -hmm. Animal control is, are not police officers. And might have been a majority of civilians with a uniform. It's all there. Police officers, the good ones, and most of them are good these days. Police work, of course, is kind of a professional. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to Cat North in particular. Uh, Cat North has seen a lot of me. And, uh, uh, police officers are trained to interrogate people mm -hmm. and to arrive at the truth. I found that police officers may not be able to tell if you're lying, but if you're telling the truth, they can tell. Mm -hmm. Generally, they may not tell you. They may not can tell if you lie, but they can tell generally if you're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in every thirty times, with the exception of the animal control, it went my way. Mm -hmm. And if it had not have gone my way. I was going to jail with assault with a deadly weapon, and that can be up to twenty thousand dollar bond in some cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so serious, serious charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, and every single time, I yeah. uh, like this instance I was telling you about. I had to spray with a dog uh, stick work, uh, just shaping the situation. And in other words, using it in a graduated manner ranges from merely presenting the stick mm -hmm. and showing the stick, to waving the stick, to to all the way to contact. Right. Okay. The thinking with the stick or mm -hmm. thinking with the stick. Mm -hmm. You know. One thing I learned about thinking with a human being, dogs are real good at movement. They, they pick up movement. Oh, like that. But humans don't. Right. And I learned with humans that if you're going to think with at a human, don't do it at combat speed because yeah, I'm too fast for them to see and it doesn't make an impression on them. So you're making a presentation you want to do with Yeah. You. I mean, I did that one time to a human. The guy... The guy just, after we were in the middle of a confrontation, he had a big loose male and said that there was a female in heat present. It was a real melee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the kid, a nut, this is one of the few times that the guy wasn't bigger than me. Usually, if, someone, if you have a stick and handling yourself well, the guy always going to be bigger than you. Well, this time the kid wasn't. He was only my size. And he comes right at me from 10 feet away, like, boring right in on me. So I gave him a thing, you know, I, I did like that, real quick. Just so, and so the, w what it is, what happens is though the tip of the stick is going right at you and then coming back. So you don't get the traversing motion. You don't get the impression of movement that a traversing motion would. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it was so quick that he didn't even see it. But the, the point is that I goofed up and I just touched him right there. Mm -hmm. And he said, because he didn't even see it, but he felt it, right? He said, mm -hmm. I don't believe you did that. I don't believe you did that. 
Did you see him do that? And I looked behind me and his buddy was coming up behind me, which is another thing. Keep your focus wide when you're fighting. That's the hardest, that's a critique that you can always make, no matter how good of a fighter you are, stick fighter you are, or street fighter, whatever. You can, you can, you, you do these post after action critiques and, and you break it down and try to analyze what you did wrong, what you did right, so you can learn from it, like you're doing right. You can always make a critique. Yeah, I didn't see my focus well enough. You tend to fixate on the target. Sure. You, you got to keep your focus wide. Not only to look for other threats, but to look for witnesses. Witnesses, of course, but a whole different thing. If you have witnesses, uh, you're lacking in some way. And if you don't, then you may act another way. Right. But you have, typically, you want witnesses because they always lie <laughs> naturally. But again, the police can tell when I'm telling the truth. They come, and I tell them the truth, and it makes sense to them. And the other people are, are not telling the truth, and they're giving a lot of excuses and rationale why they assaulted me. <laughs> and rationale why they assaulted me, basically. But anyway, the, so I, the, the, what I learned from that, in addition to keeping your focus wide, which is always what you're learning, is that when you do a, a faint, number one, two things. Number one, when you faint against a human, don't do it at combat speed. Make your faint real broad. Like grab it, okay? Don't do it at combat speed. Mm -hmm. And number one, number two, don't faint to the head area. Mm -hmm. that, that, so if you goof up, you won't have a head strike. Mm -hmm. You know, which you never hit a person in the head or, or neck unless it is a fatal force scenario. Right. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, get back on track to the, uh, to the same well, how long did you stay with, uh, what was your name? Probably, probably. All that. Um, till, uh, 73. 73? Mm -hmm. And what did you do at that point? Well, we broke up, and, uh, by then, I was destroyed. Totally destroyed. I mean, here I am now. I'm deep in the downs now. Mm -hmm. They're addicting. Right. Uh, barbiturates are physiologically addicting. Uh, well, so are quaaludes, for that matter, but quaaludes are psychologically addicting to right. the, the hypnotic class of drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've been taking those for two years, heavily, to the burn. A lot of them. And, uh, and I'd lost my job, my good job. Mm -hmm. Got fired from that. My hair had grown long. I totally fell. I was homeless. It's just totally fell. Totally fell. So what did you do? Started working as in uh, what would now be called telemarketing, but there was no such thing then. Back then, there was no telemarketing. Telephone sales really consisted of people uh, in phone rooms, boiler rooms, they were known as, impersonating police officers labor union officials, civic leaders, mm -hmm. and firefighters. That's what it was. You would be working in a FOP phone room, and they would be detectives in there mm -hmm. with their guns. And the phone men would be sitting around going, hey, <clears throat> Joe McGuire, National Peace Officer Association. I also appreciate a little sport, but I'll get you that sticker there with the uh, with the badge detail, put it beside your license plate there. And, I think you know uh, the state can give you a license to go uh, 90 miles an hour down the expressway to beat your wife, but I think you understand the look the preacher for. He didn't have a direct way to tell him you were a police officer, you know, he didn't imply that you were. Right. Same with the firefighters, same with uh, labor union officials, you know, you say AFL, CIO, change the state. We're putting together a book for our convention, supporting the kids at the same time, going to have the governor in, going to have a nice book to push across from us. I think you understand that any support you give to organized labor will never hurt you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. It's true. Back when my daddy was getting his head bumped on Ford overpass by coming to him. Yeah. We used to have to throw a bomb once in a while, send the boys over there, turn that place into a parking lot. <laughs> Those days were long gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what it was back then. That's just, just a bunch of people impersonating. And it would be the J.C., the Junior Chamber of Commerce. They were no trouble. And you moved to Georgia at that point? Or no, what? yeah, yeah. I, 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 then I moved to Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, by, what, what, by what time frame were we talking about you moved to Atlanta? Uh, 70, oh, no, uh, no, in 73 and uh, early 73. 
Harvey K. Yeah. 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 That was when you were in. Uh, oh, yeah, it was uh, several months after we were broken up, and I was just homeless, and I was working phone deals, and down in Miami Dade and getting my teeth cut. Miami Dade uh, or Miami, you know, Dade County right. was uh, really a hotbed of, of this type of stuff, uh, right. this type of phone fraud, if you will. And so was Atlanta. Actually. A lot going on in Atlanta. But the reason I came up to Atlanta was I'd been born here, but yet it was the only place I hadn't been to. Because <laughs> I grew up on racetracks all around the country. I left Atlanta when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And my mother moved us to Tampa, and then a year later she married uh, my stepfather. And so I How old were you when she got married? Seven. Seven? Yeah. And uh, so it, in Atlanta, I, I was born here, but it was the one place I, I hadn't been. <laughs> yeah, and so I came here. And, it, uh, and there's a lot of fun jobs here, man, of, of that type. Right. Of that type. JCs, police. All kinds of police organizations. Mm -hmm. did, now you said phone fraud. Did, did you actually, I mean, were you actually... The reason I call it, here's, here's, here's the difference between phone fraud and, then, and, and legal phone work. Right. In legal phone work, they took your money that they took from you, mm -hmm. and they passed it around and split it a bunch of, a, a, amongst a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. In phone fraud... I take their money and keep it all myself. <laughs> okay. so, so. That's the difference. Can you dig it? You know, two percent would go to the cost. Right. One or two percent, literally, literally, one or two percent would go to the cost. And then it would be split among the room managers, the telemarketers, the leapers, the sponsor, the promoters, what else. So they they take that basket of money and pass it around to everybody who takes some. That made it legal. And if you took the basket of money and just kept it all yourself, it was fraud. <laughs> okay, that's the difference. Right. So, yeah, that's why I call it fun fraud. It, it still is. I, I know of very few charities these days, actually, that are, are truly what people think they are. Right. Okay, truly, truly what people think they are. There's a few charities that that 70% of what they collect goes actually to a cause, but most of these charities, uh, Easter Seals is a good example, and uh, most of the other ones, it's, most of it is spent, most of the money they raised is spent raising the money. Right. It goes to the printers, they print the promotional items, who are friends of the, you know, and they, they pay kickbacks, and it goes to the promoter, it goes to every, you know, it, a, a whole bunch of people take some of it, and it's usually more the reverse. Uh, the charities who nationally known and everything uh, typically would be 30% to the cause, and if that much. Uh, many of the charities you're being approached to, even to this day, uh, police charities and so forth here in Georgia, if you'll read what they're doing, uh, only two or three, well, they have to disclose it to keep themselves legal around, mm -hmm. and only two or three percent goes to the cause. Mm -hmm. Even now. Oh, but of course, that stuff is so old and passe. It's just old timey and antiquated. You know? People are much more sophisticated in that respect, to say the least, mm -hmm. than, than they were 30 years ago. What kind of attracted you to getting involved in that? Oh, it's because you could work fucked up with long hair. It wasn't a job. Your parents weren't a big deal and all that. No, you know? no. When you sit there with a glass of beer or, or you had your bottle of whiskey in your coat jacket. Or a wine cooler in a glass. Yeah, you could be fucked up on that stuff. I mean, the promoter would, would often advertise the job, uh, and he would say, habits, okay, if you can afford them. Or if he was real strict on it, he would say, no habits. Hmm. Okay. And these jobs would be advertised in a billboard publication known as the Amusement Bulletin. And that was a, a the newspaper for outdoor exposition, state fairs, arenas, that kind of thing. And they had a phone. Because... Quite often, the cause that you were pitching was going to be a benefit show, in, in a benefit show or a state fair or something like that. So you'd be calling them up for the JCs, Sandy Springs JCs, and no, no, no. Uh, and and you'd say, what we're doing is we're bringing in a country and western show. We want to bring in a lot of underprivileged kids to it. It's just a dollar a kid, and all the proceeds are going to the, the boys' farm, you know, the, the boys' ranch, right? And uh, back then, of course, when you said underprivileged kid, it denoted a white child 
his parents were drunk and mean and abusive. Some poor little bird-headed owl who had to wear raggedy clothes to school. His parents didn't treat him very good and that thing. It, it was, nowadays, you say, Andrew Curtis Child, anyone knows, it's going to be an African-American child out of the projects. Yeah, you know. Now, look at Toys for Tots. Yeah, you really ought to see them distribute. You know this Marine Corps Toys for Tots? Uh, they distribute the toys typically. Uh, one location would be down there at the old Sears building on Pump which is now City Hall, City Hall East. And go down there and look at them distribute those toys. It'll be African Americans pulling up in, I kid you not, African Americans pulling up in Mercedes and Cadillacs going in there just loading up iron bolts and clothes. I mean, uh, toys. Uh, walking out. That's what it is now. People are hip to that. But back then, an unprivileged child was just a poor white kid. He was a good kid. He had just gotten a bad break. His daddy was in the penitentiary, you know, and his mom was a drunk, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's what it was. Oh, and anyway, the point is, we're bringing in a country in Western so hence the connection with the amusement bulletins, because that would be shows there. Sometimes you bring in a circus. You bring a little one-ring circus, uh, put it on in the margin of a shopping center, just like a, a carnival or something. Mm-hmm. You know. Bring it in a circus for the kids. Uh, children's Christmas shopping tour. You still see Chris, for, for the cops, uh, where they give the child the money and, 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 and you shop for the cop, you still see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was this, this last Christmas. Mm-hmm. I, I saw it, yeah. It would be that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'd ask for $10 in and sponsor a child. I'm sure it's a lot more now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that police officer's in the room. Did you ever get back on your feet in Atlanta, or, or I mean, you, uh, just, you just continued to do that? And just, no, well, yeah, I got back on my feet. I, yeah, no, I never did because, uh, you know, I, oh, because I didn't deep in the down, and now, you know, you know, reality sitting there, and I can't, I can't get any more downs. And for a person that uh, has an addictive personality towards now, what the problem is, uh, what makes a lot of alcoholics, uh, alcoholics, and so forth, is that they have a high level uh, of anxiety within them. I've heard it expressed the motor is all, you see this in heroin addicts too. Same thing. I don't mean your black stuff about heroin addicts. I mean white intellectual heroin addicts, you know. That manage their habit or the habit manage their sense. You have a high anxiety level. They can't turn the motor off. Mm-hmm. You know? They can't relax. And the, 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 the thing about what makes these alcohol and, and these uh, all, all these central nervous system depressants so addictive is that here you have a person who has a hard time relaxing, who has a hard time partying, you might say, mm-hmm. has a hard time being loose, is always anxious, worried. In my case, it was just a high level of what they call existential anxiety, which is the awareness of your future. You know you're going to die. Mm-hmm. And there's a psychiatric school of thought that says existential anxiety is responsible for most of our uh, uh, human neurosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're the only... Have you like that? Since I was four years old, my earliest thoughts were of death and that I was going to die. Really? When I was four years old, I could distinct, I could place it because of the situation I was in when I thought it. And I, when I was four years old, I looked, I can remember looking at my hand and pondering the fact that this hand one day will be a skeleton. Yeah, when I was four years old. Well, what was the situation that you don't know that? No, it was an intellectual thought. It was the awareness of my future. Oh, okay. The humans are the only animal that I know of that really has to cope with it, although it's really hard to tell. Um, hard to tell, but it, it's a tremendous psychic load. It's, the, the, the knowledge uh, of our future non-being or the inevitability of our death is the thing, is the thing that shapes our entire life. Mm-hmm. It is. Your life, my life, and everything else. It's the thing that is responsible for the activities you do okay. to escape from the thought. No, don't do it, yeah. Okay? You're so busy. You have your family. You have your activities. You have your, your work. You have your church. What you're doing is running from existential anxiety. Yeah, if you stop for one second and, and there's nothing there to distract you like your kids and everything else are better, quote, the most important thing in the world to you. And if that was just emptied out of your mind, the existential anxiety will catch up to you and it's just too absolutely horrifying without the uh, without the comfort of believing in an afterlife, believing in supernatural ghost stories. You see, I mean, we have the president uh, of the United States, the most sophisticated and powerful country in the world, standing up there, 
telling the world that he believed in a ghost story. Which is what? Jesus Christ is and that kind of thing. Talking about Jesus. And that that's a ghost story. That is that is of the supernatural, you know. And and here we are, most advanced peoples ever. And and we're talking about ghost stories. And they, they all do it. You see how stupid they are? They're total fucking idiots, but they're just being human beings. You see. They're just being human beings. They're running from their existential anxiety. That's why it's responsible for being so busy. Why you're wearing that tie. Why you're devoting yourself to work for the betterment of society. Hey, son, forget it. <laughs> so we're doing, look, any, any good anthropologist can tell you we're doing okay. And so can any cosmologist, too. It's just on a larger time scale, that's all. And so can any good geologist can tell you. Hey, don't you know... The, the super volcano under Yellowstone. There's over 70 super volcanoes. You don't even know what a super volcano is. Check out PBS dot, dot, uh, pbs.org and get their, their show on super volcanoes and they explain it. The, the super volcano that is the Yellowstone Plateau, these things are so big that they're hundreds of square miles. They don't weigh really a crater. They, they have magma chambers that, that, that can take a, a million years to fill. The super volcano under Yellowstone has erupted, um, three times in, in the last two million years. It has an average cycle of 600,000 years. When it erupts, it basically wipes out uh, downwind the, the eastern part of the U.S. If, if you're looking at, at a map of the U.S., Yellowstone is here, and project a cone like this, and it basically blankets the, in, in a cone uh, the, the whole eastern seaboard of the U.S. under several feet of ash and would just destroy any civilization in that area. Well, listen, it's erupted three times uh, in the last uh, almost two, uh, two million years. And guess what? It's got a cycle of 600,000 years. And guess what? It's been 630,000 years since it's last erupted. That thing could pop off any minute, pal. Okay. They know the, they know the power of the meteor. Meteor, I'm already talking about it. Yeah. That's all they're talking about. Well, that's another thing. That That is more unpredictable. It's going to happen, but when, we don't know. We know this is going to happen. We know the time scale. Hey, check it out, the Olympic plate up there in the Northwest, okay? In, in 1967, they had a, a mega, a, a super, a, a super earthquake in Alaska, over nine points on the Richter scale. It's only the third one ever known to human beings. And in this case, they were able to observe the effects. Relatively few people were killed because of that time Alaska was partially populated. Yeah, but ge geologists had an idea of what a mega, over 0.9 earthquake would do, geologically speaking. But they were only theories. And they were able to study the effects of this confirm it. And they have found that the Olympic plate uh, has, in in the last uh, in the last twenty thousand years, in the last twenty thousand years, has 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 shook itself out with a, a plus point nine earthquake eighteen times. Mm. <laughs> okay, and not only have they confirmed it, they geologic uh, you know by study. What they've done really to really get it precise is, is they always had a theory that underwater you have a continental shelf under the ocean, you have a continental shelf, and then it goes down to the depths of the ocean. And in that were kind of like ravines, sort of, or canyons. Mm -hmm. And geologists had a theory that a mega quake would make undersea earth slides on that, and it would leave a record. And so they were able to shelf under the ocean. You have a continental shelf and then it goes down to the depths of the ocean. And in that were kind of like ravines, sort of, or canyons. Mm -hmm. And geologists had a theory that a mega quake would make undersea earth slides on that and it would leave a record. And so they were able to study the effects of the Alaska earthquake and see that that was so. So they drilled off like Washington State, okay, into these ravines right at the edge of the continental shelf. That's how they found. It has shook itself out plus nine earthquakes 18 times. It was right there in the layers, pal. Okay. Okay. Well, now, that's, that's an average of about 500 and something years between mm. shakeouts. Mm. Yes. You know when the last one was? Uh, uh, Christmas Day. 500 years ago. Right? Well, we got a little while ways to go. We're in the zone, though. It was Christmas Day 1700. 
Oh, uh, 1699, not 1700, 1699. Oh, yeah, we dated precisely not only that, but geologically we dated. Well, we can dig up the, the redwoods that were buried in the tsunami tidal wave now. Now, and, and of course they're dated, and now that we know what we're looking for, and that in fact is what happened, okay? Hey, I don't know, tell you about Rainier. Yeah, you, you got to go see Mount St. Helens. That's the most awesome site you have ever seen, okay? They say it was equivalent to 400 atom bombs. You'll believe it when you see that. <laughs> I, I, oh, I hiked up into right into the blast zone, actually, to, to where the road ends and right up there where the blast came right out where you see how, it. Uh, how close to the earth, right? Or is it when the uh, volcano blew we got there? Oh, that was in uh, 95, so I was... So the was almost thrown back by then. No! No. Then? No. 95? 15 years after... No, it still looked like the moon. You were still now, then, you were just still now, then, seeing a few sprigs. Uh, those places are deserts, man, to begin with. All out, all of out west, unless you're on the east side of the uh, uh, Olympic Mountains, which is only a coastal strip of about 100 miles. That's real green and rain. Uh, the rest of Washington and Oregon are, are deserts. <laughs> they, call, yeah, yeah. they grow a lot of stuff because they're irrigated uh, heavily. And all those states are just basically volcano desert. You, if, if, if you go and drive through uh, western Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State, except for that coastal strip, you'll see that all of that, you'll come to realize that this place is all volcanic. Everything there is volcanic. Every, the, all the rocks are volcanic. There's no dirt out there. It's just kind of volcanic gas. You throw your duffel bag down and go, you know, really fucks up your back. You, you, you can immediately realize this place is going to blow the fuck up one of these days. Okay, what about Mount Rainier, man? I mean, they've got, Mount Rainier just looms over, over Seattle, okay? The, the, the western face of Mount Rainier is just rotten. It's just really mud and rocks glued together with ice. Frozen ice. All that has to do is be heated, mm -hmm. and and you'll have these huge lahars. They're called lahars. The mo the mud flows. Mm -hmm. That mud flow that killed forty fifty thousand people down in South America about fifteen years ago. Remember that little girl was trapped in it, and they tried to get her out. Guatemala or Venezuela? Uh, no, I'm sorry. God, I can't remember. You're you're obviously well traveled. You've been you've been several places. Uh, you know. Anyway, the point is, listen, but. Again, I'm not judging you because I understand you're doing the best you can to handle your psychic load. You're doing the you've well, got it couldn't have been that much for you because after a while, then you get kind of a. I know you had a Camaro for a little bit, so that was in the was that in the 70s? 1980. I got a brand new Camaro. Was it smoking in a bandit type or? Uh, it looked like it, although it was just a six cylinder. But it's a California Camaro, but in the event like California assembly plants, white, clean, black, no. Well, what made the move? But what did you do to get that? Just out of curiosity. Was well, it I working in marketing or? Uh, well, no, I I, uh, I started fraudulent telephone solicitation in uh, after I got up here within about a half on your own or all my own, just printing invoices and selling them. Oh, okay. Just from making up Southeast Regional Council to during, during that time, did you, you were making good money doing that? Well, yeah, but I was so drunk that, sick drunk, I stayed sick drunk until uh, September 7th, 7th. And, and then I quit. Yeah. But cold turkey or did you go to rehab? Or no, no, I did. I, I got uh, medical help on that. Uh, Where'd you get that at? A private doctor, and I came no, no. downtown to cater. And um, what I had been doing was going to Grady because my blood pressure had gotten so sky high, just tremendously high, like 145 over 150, just tremendously high. And uh, I was doing that, but uh, the hand right was on. They were giving me experimental drugs. That was like, I had a couple of convulsions, and the hand right was on the wall. And I got married to a prostitute. And on the day I got married, you know, I, I met and courted her and married her drunk. <laughs> and the day we got married, I quit. You know, bad mistake. <laughs> we always did marry her. What was her name? You remember her? Uh, yeah, Yvonne. Yvonne uh, Ball was her name. Oh, oh her, her real name, her whole name was Donna Yvonne Ball. But she went by. Diana? Dinah. Dinah? Dinah. Like Diana. Diane Ball? Yvonne with a Y. Okay. okay. Is, uh, is she still around or is she... I haven't seen her for decades, twenty over twenty years. Well, I, I ran into her on uh, 
pylon uh, 20 years ago. I was running, you know, down the street and I ran into her. And uh, we, I just said a few words, hi, how are you doing? And I uh, said, you're working. And what I mean is, did she have a job? Right. But in retrospect, <laughs> <laughs> in retrospect, and she said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and anyway, looking back on it, I realized how, really, she took that, that question to me. You know, right. She said, yes. <laughs> and, so she was still probably. Uh, yeah, and uh, I said, well, I'll well, well, see you. <laughs> and I, was just, well, I, I didn't know what else to say to her. Right. The poor thing, I, I just felt so she, she didn't have a chance in the world, that poor girl. She is so dumb, man. She tried to listen to her and she was too dumb to get in. How old was she when you got that man? Uh, she was about my age, and we got married in 77, so that would have put her about 31. And, uh, but at any rate, I quit drinking. But the problem is, uh, and I stayed, uh, I stayed sober for, uh, I stayed sober. I fell off the wagon for six months in uh, 82, quit again, and and uh, stayed sober until uh, 1985. Uh, not, 1995, I'm sorry. Then I stayed drunk for four years till 89, and I haven't had a single thing since 89. But the first time I quit, yes, I went to a private doctor. He put me on Melville. Um, it's called an antidepressant, but... Remember the doctor's name, right? Nah, gold something, but right. don't they all have gold steam, gold right. bar, gold, you know, whatever. You yeah. married you married again in 79, didn't you? Yeah, and uh, in 79, that year, and I was married for six months. So you were, I'm sorry, you were only married to Donna for how long? Six months. We were divorced in about uh, March, April of 78. And then I married the police officer to that Stone Mountain Police Department. Mm-hmm. And by the way, she was grandfathered in, so she was, uh, she, in other words, she was a police officer before post. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so she was not a post-certified officer, although the department, well, then the law had been passed. You, it, you right. know, everyone had to be post to be a real life police officer. Right. But she had started before then, so she was grandfathered in. And at the time I was going with her, or uh, married her, she was not post-certified. However, she was a blue light for it all. And you met her there in the park? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was running there every day, and I was really good, looking good and in great shape. And uh, uh, after after we were divorced in uh, late 79, uh, I started taking pills again. And the rationale was, hey, I'm not drinking. Uh, but I'll just take every pill I can get. Mm-hmm. And that was in the uh, waning days of the equator of craze. Right. As a matter of fact, you can even still get real lower Uh The DEA, one guy in the DEA persuaded the four or five people in the world that made methoquiline hydrochloride to just con- discontinue production. Okay. The same guy, and, and that, there was no more quaaludes, real quaaludes. And then they were all counterfeit made typically with diazepam, which is Valium. Right. And they were great. They were great. I estimate some of those counterfeit quaaludes made of diazepam probably, probably that, uh, um, perhaps even up to 500 milligrams of diazepam in it. And as you know, when it comes in 5, 10, 15, 20 milligram jabs, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I estimate some of those had, had up to, to, to five, I mean, they were instant white lightning. I mean, you take a, <laughs> take a whole one in, and if you were an experienced downbreak, you'd stay on your feet and would go, oh, do all kinds of things, but you wouldn't remember a damn thing of it later. Mm-hmm. I mean, these were wild. I've, I've woken up after a night of doing those things, walked out to my Camaro scene that I had my spare on it, looked into the trunk and see my original car was totally shredded, totally to pieces. And then in a couple of hours, have a guy from the noon, you know, I live in Stone Mountain, have a guy from Noonday Baptist Church at Highway 5 and 92 at Woodstock call me and tell me he found my wallet in the church parking lot. <laughs> okay. I had no business up at Woodstock, number one. I had a shredded tire. And no, no remorse at all of changing it out and putting the spare up. Mm-hmm. And a guy has found my wallet in a noonday Baptist church in Woodstock, you know, 50 miles away. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you can only think of God only knows what happened that night <laughs> and how many people I ran over or what, you know, that rear, that tire was shredded so much it was like, yeah, God, you know, get up. 
curve at 100 miles an hour. Mm. It was wild. It was wild. Yeah, those those were wicked, totally wicked. Mm. And uh, so he started doing this while you were married to Steve. No, 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 no. I wouldn't take a pill or nothing while I was married. I was in my 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 rebirth. When you start running, you see, I had a, a lot of strength. Uh, it's uh, four knowledge as far as being able to run long distances because I learned in the army in a class of 600 guys, okay, now, and that is that your average guy, if he's young, in good health, and not obese, your average guy can go out and run for an astonishing like, long time. If he'll do the LSD, long flow business, mm-hmm. like that, don't split, just dog trot, mm-hmm. you know, or just do it like they do in the army, just up, to Care one shot. Yeah, 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 exactly. That your average guy, that if he's motivated, he can go out and do an astonishing amount of distance. And as, as you get trained up, you can... So, I knew that. That was my... The average civilian doesn't know that. And they think as soon as they start to a double time, they go, oh, how long? How am I getting tired? Oh, this is getting, you know... And they don't, they haven't seen. But you see, in the Army, with 600 guys doing it, that that shows me that you can... That, 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 that is highly subjective your, your tolerance to mm-hmm. see, yeah highly subjective in that you can do it because everyone else is doing it that 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 proves that the how subjective fatigue is that's what i learned about fatigue in the army that was able to carry me through all my athletic endeavors all through my life the incredible stuff that i've done in the 90s as far as power working 30 mile trips you know carrying heavy weights Climbing three, four, five thousand vertical feet in a trip over thirty miles, just doing stuff that that people are really impressed by. That know, that know what it means. But see, my secret weapon is that I knew that fatigue was highly subjective, and that it can. In other words, what by subjective I mean, your response to fatigue is highly dependent on states of mind. Oh, your state of mind. And I learned that in the army. I learned that because. In the army, I saw that I could do stuff that astonished myself and everyone else astonished themselves. And the reason we did it is because we did it together. And he could do it. That's an airborne song, you know. If I can do it, you can do it. If he can do it, you can do it. You know. And you know, up the hill, around, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I learned that in the army. So I was able to start running in uh, 1978. And uh, and I met my wife through the money. I was out uh, in the sun now. Yeah, she would drive by and never would work through it, even in wintertime. Had the hairy chest and, you know, cut. I was lifting weights every other day and running 10 miles or, or more every other day. Yeah, she'd drive by in the police car. She'd put the intercom on, you know, the loud speaker. Oh, the loud, not the intercom, the, uh, broad, the, the loud speaker, you know. Well, they say, all right, everybody, you just disperse, you know, this show is over. <laughs> and she put put that loudspeaker on, you know, off top, and she'd go, mm, mm, like that, <laughs> and she'd drive by. Oh, yeah, she just scarred me, though, yeah, man. She's got, I was her fourth husband, man. She knew how to do it. Yeah, 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 it, yeah she scarred me right up because, you know, she, she, got, she got the feel for me. She found out I had VA benefits, and she wanted a home, of course, more than anything. What do all women want? They want their home and things, and they want their kids. Okay, that's what they want. And uh, so she was just died for a house and died for a house. And when she found out I had she I had ten, two, a six and eight. And when she found out that I had uh, one hundred fifteen thousand at the time, VA loan, which was the equivalent of three hundred thousand now, which is seven, eight, two, three times the money. And so that was enough. <laughs> yeah, oh. And so, yeah, you know, she got me married and went out and found the house. Got a good deal on it, too. Bought a house across from the school in the right. of Hollywood Drive. Bought that house. had been sit- sitting empty. I happen to know the guy that know me because he lived in the same apartment complex I lived in uh, before I, I married her. And uh, bought that house for 35000 then. And this was in 79. And that's just when the big real estate inflation hit down. That, that, those real estate, that inflation of the late 70s, Finally, the president, uh, Carter, had to put a cap on uh, That's back when they had 13% on your house and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but the inflation rates were so... Even going back to General Ford, he had the Whip Inflation Now program. Went. Anyway, those inflations of, of the late 70s was the best thing that ever happened to the middle class because that meant in five years their, their home would, would, would double because just of inflation, the, the price... And you may say, well, inflation, the money's only worth half as much. Well, so what? Uh, 
you know, if your home is worth 100000 in 75 and in 79 or 78, it's worth 200000 Well, so what if the money was only worth half as much? You still had the 100000 <laughs> <laughs> Right? Okay. Yeah. If you still had the 100000 Okay. So, yeah. So she bought that thing. She stole it from the guy. He had gotten a divorce and been sitting there. She saw it just sitting there like this. Sitting there and sitting there and everything. She got that house for 35000 When we split up, uh, got divorced six months later. We sold the, the first, we advertised, uh, I advertised, she wanted to get uh, another five or another two or three. I, I just, I said, I got a flying hair up my ass. I said, let's advertise it at 45. Mm -hmm. And bigger than shit, we advertised it at 45 and the first person that inquired on it bought it at 34 five. He asked for 500 bucks. That guy was Steve Brock. Who, whose mother uh, was a real estate agent who started for sale by owner, mm -hmm. the for sale by owner. Now there's a lot of for sale, but the for sale by owner, yeah. yeah he was, was buying it for people in California. We got that, uh, had a... We, got, we made 10 grand off that house in six months. Mm -hmm. A friendly breakup, though. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. It wasn't a... Not yeah, it was, it was... Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no. I've always been fair to my, my ex-wife. And, oh, no, no, she didn't, no, when I bought that house, I bought it in my name, but she was my wife, and she came to the closing uh, of the house, and so I bought it in my name, you know, VA, and at the closing, I said, Sue, do you want to have that house? And she said, yeah. So I told the attorney, can I give her half that house? He said, yeah, I'll make you a quick claim deed right now. And I gave her half the house, okay? And I thought it was fair because she's the one that went out and got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have had it. No. I wouldn't have made the ten thousand. You know. You so know, I, when we sold the house, I was I was uh, willingly uh, gave her her half of the proceeds. But you were in an apartment before that, kind of. Yeah, around. yeah, just apartment of the proceeds. But you were in an apartment before that, kind of. Yeah, around. yeah, just apartment. You went from an apartment to. A house with kids? With two kids, man, and then back What was that life. like? Just making that transition from... Well, you see, it's, it's, it's driving me nuts. Well, <laughs> well, back then, I, I was really a pathetic guy in that, you see, the, the saddest thing in the world is a loner, which I was. A loner trying not to be one. In other words, a loner that doesn't know themselves. And one of this, people with sociopathic characters, uh, that that are learners. What happens is all their life, all the way up through the present day, are programmed. They're bombarded by hundreds of messages every day, telling them that any activity is only valid if they do it with someone else. Every bit of advertising in the world, every in cultural message that you receive, everything is is programming you to the fact that. Any activity you do is only validated if you do it with someone else. It, 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 you know, it, it, whatever it is, it, it's multiple. It, it, and, yeah, I, I can remember a good example. I, I had a season pass for Six Flags in the summer of 78. And I told someone, uh, I'm going to Six Flags tonight. And they said, uh, oh, who are you going with? Well, I wasn't going anyone. I just had a season pass. I'd go out there and it, it's a summer evenings, long evenings, I'd just go and people watch, ride rides, do what I wanted to. It was always awkward, a single person getting on a ride, you know, it had two seats. But hey, there'd be uh, some other idiot there. <laughs> oh, they put me with him. And I had a great time. I saw all these people and well, the, the colors and sights and sounds of Six Flags. It was great. Summer evenings and everything. And I said, no, no one, I'm going alone. They go, oh, boy. Yeah. But that's the attitude of society. I mean, when's the last time you went to a movie alone? Okay. Okay, never. Okay. <laughs> You'd be afraid to. Okay. You think people would think you were odd. People are, are incorporated in the program to only believe that life is valid if they're doing it with others. So the problem with these poor loners, the sociopaths, is they're so programmed like that that in spite of themselves, they don't know themselves. They don't understand that there's no hope for them. They don't understand. 
They don't understand that they're a round peg in a square hole and that they're never going to fit in. They don't understand that there's no way in the world that they are going to get some real satisfaction out of a human relationship. They don't understand that any human relationship they have will always be less than fulfilling. They don't understand that. And they're trying to be like everyone else. But they're not. So, so, kind of so a, it's, the thing that's so wrenching about it is, number one, two things. Number one is, when they're trying to be like everyone else and they're not, what happens is, number one, they're not going to get the satisfaction. They're always going to have an odd disconnect, number one. And number two, and really the saddest thing is, no matter how much they try to be like everyone else, it's not going to be good enough for everyone else. Mm -hmm. They're not going to fit in and they're not going to be accepted. That's terrible. That's terrible. So that's and that's I, kind yeah. of experience movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, you know, but I didn't real I didn't understand myself until uh mm -hmm. one. Actually when I got a dog. And and all of a sudden I was no longer alone and I didn't have that wrenching sense of of loneliness and being alone, but yet there would be no salvation in the company of others. Mm -hmm. You're alone, your your life is empty, alone, lonely. But there's just no salvation or satisfaction in the, in, in the company of others. It's a terrible. I see many. Those are the worst kind of people. They're, they're tragically unhappy. And so the rest of them. Hey, we need another cup if there's any of that. You want another one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was it like uh, being with kids and then, you know, you. Uh, well, I'm trying to Okay, that. now, that's the answer. I'm to the question. Of I was that. trying to be normal. I'm kind of an apartment guy myself, you know. And then oh, you're, from, you're not married? No. Oh. And then you go from, from, you know, your own time, your own thing, to living with, were they boys, girls? What, what? I, yeah, a boy and a girl, and, oh. and both. I, uh, you know, I was trying to be normal. Was but I wasn't, working? I was involved in fraud. I, I didn't even have a job. You know, I was, she told me, you know. Because uh, I was presenting it to her that I was a uh, self-publisher and so forth, and these deals were sponsored and they were real. They were real. I even had her picking up money for me at the beginning of our relationship. Did she catch on to that, or was yeah. she? When she did, she said, "Man, it's not a job. It's a con game." She said, <laughs> and she was, did. You kind of try to keep that from her, or kind of try to hold it together a little bit, as far as yeah. not wanting to lose it, but I yeah. that she wouldn't. Oh, she probably wanted. And in the end, I think she's probably the one that turned me in. Yeah. Turned you in for uh, crossing the telephone for us. Oh. After, right, as soon, as soon as we were divorced, I got busted out. I had an office in uh, Decatur. Got busted out by Decatur County. Mm -hmm. and, uh, had a phone room. Yeah, busted me right on out. Took everything. Phone. <laughs> phone. <laughs> phone. <laughs> so, what when was time? this? This was in uh, 79. You got busted in 79? Or? Yeah, at the end of 79. Right after the divorce. Do you have any time for it? Or? Oh, no. It was a misdemeanor. Well, I don't tell them to listen. But they didn't give you any of your phones back or your office? Oh, man, they did all this work on it, including running an undercover officer through the operation. They ran a black female juvenile uh, officer, police officer, through the operation, had her come get a job, work a day there. And then when they came for the arrest, they showed up with crime scene vans uh, with their own boxes. Now, were you were you married at the time? No, no, we, we had been divorced just a week or two or a month or, or whatever. I think our divorce was final in about October of 20th. How did that divorce go? Was it kind of, well, with any, was it more an amicable thing like oh, you yeah. both decided or was it? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, did you call it quits with her or did? Well, yeah. Uh, I had, and then she had. She had, okay. enough, had enough, too. I mean, you know. Oh, well, she had been shopping out by then, and she already had the next guy lined up. No, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did yeah. you react to that? Hmm. Well, I, I, had, I had to laugh, you know. Uh, I think, you know, these, these girls stay looking for a husband, and I call it sleeping around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get to tell on your perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, no, she the fuck out the police department out there already <laughs> before she met me. Oh, she had fucked the captain. Uh, did she tell you this? Or is this oh, yeah. She kind of learned oh, 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 no, she told me. Oh, no, she was crazy. Oh, God, Lord. Like how? She was 
She was one of her boyfriends was making, uh, uh, not a police officer, but one of her boyfriends was making uh, eight million, you know, they had, uh, you know, well, they didn't have a video, very little video right there, and was making eight millimeter films of her dancing nude, you know. I, how did that come up in conversation with the, yeah. with the new husband? Oh, that's the way it always is. Don't you know that? <laughs> if you go on with someone sooner, it gets over sooner or later, and typically the chick, because she's the one that's got the pussy and can fuck any time she wants. Sooner or later, it comes around to all the people I fuck. It always ends up that way. Don't you know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Anytime you have a relationship, you can go on with someone that sooner or later, there's who else have you fucked? And and almost invariably, at least with the chicks I go to, go with, uh, they 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 want to tell you, you know. Yeah, and, and the reason why, <laughs> obviously, I, I missed out on an important part of the conversation. I mean, and the reason why is that you see, and it's a fine distinction, uh, for women to threaten to give it away, that pussy, I mean, and for them to let you know that they could give it away and they have given it away, increases the value of it. Howard, there's a it's marketing, but a sophisticated woman understands that the threaten to give it away increases the value, and actually giving it away to someone else decreases the value. And some women aren't smart enough to know the difference, and they fuck up that way. Was that Sue or they all do that? <laughs> <laughs> they all do that. You know how they do it? You know the nice girls do. Are you married? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the nice girls. You know how they all they do it. They say, either you marry me or forget about it, I'm going to find someone else. That's the threatening to give it away. That's, that is what it is, okay? <laughs> and that that's how they get men to do what they want them to do. Oh, yeah. Always, yeah. Either you do what I want or in the end, I'm going to give it to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And you see, that part of my uh, dislike, or I wouldn't call it hatred, but almost, for women is that they have all the advantages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. And I, so I finally came to the conclusion, uh, I mean, the last piece of ass I had, except for Ruddy Pier, was in 89. was in January of 89. And I never... You kind of dropped out of the game, man. I was never so happy after I did that. Oh, yeah. Well, once you stop getting led around by the dip, and we all are, dirt like a fucking animal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All of us are. We're, that's right. That's right. You, that's why we become less than men. That's why we start doing a woman's agenda. Hey, listen, how many little nine-year-old boys have, have said to the little girls, oh, you know, I would like you to get your toy tea set out and let's have a tea and let's get our dollies here and have tea with our dollies. You've never seen a boy do that. But, but that's what a woman wants you to do as an adult is to play house. Okay. And the hand children. How many nine-year-old boys? Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that uh, for many men, having children is, is the greatest thing in their life. But nevertheless, how many nine-year-old boys have you known that have said, "Oh, you know, I don't want to be, be a soldier, or a pilot, or astronaut. I want to grow up and, and have a family." <laughs> Bullshit. Okay, that's not what men are about. Okay, <laughs> but in the end, puberty happens. The hormones rise. We start getting laid around by our dick. You get that tax break. Oh, and, and in the end, we become women. You look at any married couple, virtually. I when I say any, that's a big word, but, you know, virtually. Any married couple, especially the other one. And what you have is not a man and a woman. woman. You have two women. And one of them has a penis. And he's the designated dick, you know. It's like, honey, you know, can you give me my dick back tonight, you know. And you have two women doing the things that a woman wants to do and having the values that a woman has and leading a woman's agenda with the so-called man given permission to do symbolic, almost ritual things that make him the man. It may be whatever. It may be having this collection of snap-on tools in the garage. You know, it may be it, his honey business. It, you know, it could be his fishing or his hunting. These are symbolic, ritualistic things that they're allowed to do to say they're the men. And even 
generally the toughest of men, roughest and toughest, generally they go home to a soft house, to a soft woman's environment, to a nice night. Look at those damn Muslims we're fighting. Man, they should have kept a damn mud wall on their damn ass and eating fucking shit with their hands. And there ain't no pictures on the wall because they can't have pictures. It's forbidden to, to you know, by Muslim people. Yeah, and, and they're just, they're tough as fucking nails. They're thin, they're wiry. They eat a handful of mud every day and they shit once a week. They sit on the fucking floor. I uh, mean, and here, our so-called men, they go home to cushy, cushy and everything's nicey, nicey and it's all got the woman's touch and everything. It's two women there. Did you, you look at any this? man's home. You look at any man's home. I'll ask you a question in a minute. You ain't look at any man's home. It ain't no man's home. It's a woman's home. <laughs> and what is this man thing? Having a nice lawn. Oh, Jesus Christ. Give me a fucking break. Out there cutting grass and digging in the dirt like a fucking animal. All, you know? all, your, uh, all your travels and, and camping and stuff you get... By yourself, you get a lot of time to, to think. That's the thing. People have a lot of insight. Now, that, that lawyers and everyone else ask me constantly, how come you're so seemingly intelligent? Are you well read? Are you well educated? You're right. You hit it right on the head. That's very perceptive of you. The reason I'm so seemingly intelligent is that I, alone amongst almost anyone, including you dudes, have time to actually stop and think about things. Yeah, you don't have time to stop and think about things. You are so busy distracting yourself because you're running from really the reality of the situation, which is you're going to fucking die. And you are so busy just frantically, desperately distracting yourself with every kind of thing in the world, including your work. Now, again, I'm not judging you. I mean, you're just human beings. That's all you are. You're just human beings, and God bless you. I mean, if there is, you know, Lord, I'm not judging you, but I'm just saying, you're so embedded in this matrix that you live in that you can't even see it. Again, I'll refer you back to what the advertise. Get the uh, Persuaders, pbs.com, two, two one-hour shows called the Persuaders on Advertising. An academic thing, in other words, this is academic thought, not orthodox academic thought. He says, the goal of advertising has always been not only to suffuse the atmosphere, but to be the atmosphere and to leave us no way out of or around the world they have created for us. That's orthodox academic thought. If you studied advertising and got a degree in it, that's what you would learn, that the goal is to be the atmosphere and to leave us no way out of or around the world they've created for us. And they succeeded. <laughs> You are so in this matrix of culture, you don't even know it. Sociologists as early as the late 70s, and certainly by 1982, were dealing with the concept of, of virtual reality, of hyper-reality, and the fact that we are so divorced because of all these distractions that we have entered, because of this truly artificial world and environment, and environment of thought that we build around us, that we can't know what's real and we shouldn't even try. <laughs> and you can't. And the, the, so you don't. You, you're just too busy to distract. You don't even know. Uh, and you can't see the horse go with But that's the thing. You, you hit right on it. The reason I seem to be intelligent is I alone, uh, amongst very few people, have the time to think. And when you're into hiking, when you're into running, and you're hiking and hiking, <laughs> or you're walking your dog every day, day two, two or three hours, you know, and you're walking, you're walking, and you're walking. Right. you got to stay heads up and watch the dog and make sure you don't get run over. And it's always like a combat patrol that you're going to have to fight at any time. You may hear the clickety-clack of dog nails behind you and spin around and there's a shepherd in your face ready to rumble, okay? So it is that kind of combat patrol kind of thing. But otherwise, you got time to think. That's one of my personalities. I'm a philosopher, I'm a soldier, I'm a scientist, and I'm an artist. Well, and those are all distinct personality types that represent different, distinctly different things. And, and I'm all of them. And what it really is, 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 is two opposing pairs. You have the rational, intellectual soldier and the scientist, the coldly rational uh, soldier. Uh, the, 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 coldly, 
Yeah, and they call the irrational scientist. The scientist, if it can't be demonstrated, it doesn't exist. It's only a theory. You know, you got to show me the facts in science, okay? So those two are the cold and rational ones. The artist and the philosopher are interested more in the textures and, and the why and wherefore is behind it, you see. So you're having a balance between the two? I have all those there, and, and it's not as complex as it sounds. If you know, know, if you're aware that I'm a soldier, a scientist, uh, an artist and a philosopher, if you're aware of that, then I'm a very simple person even though I may seem to be a startling juxtaposition of, you your, know. What, what's your artistic set? What, what do you mean by artist? Well, by artist, I mean truly in the sense of being an artist, in that you see everything in terms of not the linear, but the impression of it, and so forth. And as far as the medium goes, um, I'm an artist that people ask me, you know, I told them I'm an artist, and they say, well, what's your medium? Are you a sculptor? Yeah. No, my art is my art is my life, and my art is weird. No, laugh, laugh. No, no. <laughs> no. I'm an artist. My no. art is my life, no, and my I, art is weird. I'm actually, laugh, no, I'm laugh. Actually, no, I'm actually not into this. Okay. Laugh. Of course, it's true. It's Seriously. all true. Yeah. It's true. It's real. Well, everything well. I'm telling you is true. Everything I'm telling you is real. Like, I'm actually, no, I'm actually, laugh. No, I'm actually <laughs> not into this. Yeah. Of course, it's true. It's all true. Yeah. It's true. It's real. Well, Everything I'm telling you is true. Everything I'm telling you is real. It, it exists. It's true. Well, what, what I'm what I'm saying is, is, is you say your life is is your is your medium, and oh, and, and it's done for an audience of one. Because yeah. the the rest of the world, they can't really understand. They people see me, and I I delight in presenting a fantastic spectacle to people in terms of my technicality. You know, I'm all teched out. I'm strapped. With every kind of layer of equipment, just just to be walking, because I need it. That's why. When you're four, when you're four or five miles from your house, you better have a pair of tweezers if your dog gets up. You better you better have a compression bandage in case he slices his leg open or you knock a thing in there. If you don't have a compression bandage, if you don't have a compression bandage and you do something like this, okay, okay, it'll bleed it. As you're walking, it'll bleed. It won't stop. It'll fill your shoe or boot up with blood if you don't have a compression bandage. Mm -hmm. So, and I present this fantastical spectacle uh, to people, but the, I understand they can't understand it because it's so fantastical. It's kind of like the Lone Ranger, and the Lone Ranger would come galloping into town. There would be all the schmuck townspeople, right? And here the Lone Ranger would be wearing this mask, a skin tight outfit. A really elaborate two-gun rig mounted with silver with chrome pistols and just a theatrical outfit. He'd be mounted on this beautiful Palomino. He'd have this trippy Indian named Taco with him. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and, and if the Lone Ranger would ride out again, what would they always say about the Lone Ranger? You don't remember. It, but not. They would always say, Who was that master? Yeah, who was that master? <laughs> okay, that's... That's what I do to society. Well, let me ask you. They, they, don't, they can't get their mind around it either. You, you, you That's why up. they remember me. That's why I can't go anywhere without a hundred people calling me. I bet there's people, excuse me, I bet there's people that have called in that met me one time over ten years ago for five minutes yeah, and remember me. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> what, brings up, what brings up something interesting that you're, that you're talking about and, and why... You know, one thing I'm curious about. What you you bumped into a uh, you bumped into a Cherokee County deputy up on some private hunting property back in yeah. this October or something, yeah. and that was widely publicized after your you mm -hmm. know after we caught up with one another. And, and did you hear that? Did, did he get on tape my joke about deer hunters? Yeah. What's the three reasons the deer have to go to Yeah, yeah. No, I made that well, up. Well, I'm they, a comedian, too. Well, they, I mean, you, <laughs> you, threw that, you threw it out there to him that you were a, uh, what do you throw out there? That oh, right. Um, that's my standard. That, I finally realized what I was doing. Does it? I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this day after day, and I finally realized it about now. not combat patrols where you're going to stay alert on uh, Well, it's not, yeah, uh, combat patrols and uh, that's it. And, and land navigation, for, uh, it's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Every time I go out walking my dog. Currently? Yeah, every time I go out walking my dog, I, I'm like a police officer. I understand that there's a significant chance that before I come home, I'm going to be fighting for my life. Right. Every time I walk my dog anywhere. Right. 
You know why? Because go go and take a seven mile run through the neighborhood. You'll see you hear a million dogs barking. Well, all it takes is one gate left open, one door left open. I got a Rottweiler this big. One time, I'd run a route for well, over ten years, and I never knew the dog was there. And I'm passing by a house, and 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 I hear hear a guy go yelling, "Bad dog! Bad dog! Bad dog!" And I look, and that was his dog's name. It was a big ass Rottweiler coming for me. He had gotten loose out of the house and that was the dog's name bad dog <laughs> God, I mean that's the way it is man you know it's like police work you know I mean you know, 90 minutes of boredom and 10 minutes of let her you know puck her up shit man right but I, 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 I it's happened so much though I fought so and again I say fighting I shape the situation rather than kick ass because if you kick ass it's going to run your day regardless even if you're right it may not go your way you don't you don't, you don't have a bad so you know so, yeah, uh, so, it's, oh, anyway, I realized that, you know, about 1995 or so, I realized that that's what I'm doing. I do just like you do on, uh, for instance, uh, on that. we were mechanized, too, in addition to being airborne, which meant we had armored personnel carriers, the one 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 M113, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's typical mechanized stuff. You, you get in the track, you drive somewhere, you unamp, you form a perimeter, you run a patrol, you come back, you... You unload again, move. It's just a war of movement, you know. You move, get out. You don't hang around that track. It's a good target, you know. You don't sit in the damn track. You know, you get out any time it stops, you know, because you're going to be safer in there. RPG will take that track out, man. It's got an 80-gallon gas tank. Whoa. And, 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 and that's what I do with the truck, with the dog. I, you know, I get in the truck or, or the vehicle, move, get out, get my shit together, run a patrol, Come back, eat, you know, sleep, move, get out, get my shit together, run a patrol. And I, I, I finally realized that I was just on perpetual field maneuvers. And I said, well, ain't much of a lie, but hell, it's a lie. Well, when, you, when, when, you, you, when you throw that stuff out like that, they, I'm... I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out you know you you call it artistry or or whatever. Is it, is it, <laughs> well, you're not calling it insanity. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm not saying that. No, you're not. I, I don't think you're insane, but no, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. no. What what I'm what I'm getting at is 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 it almost like a little acting on your behalf to I don't know kind of steer this law enforcement officer away from you or well with him no I was being perfect, I, perfectly uh, candid with him I steer him away from me yeah I mean I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what you know well here's the thing uh, police officers are individuals so of course they're going to run across the whole spectrum of human behavior but right. there's there's a large number of police officers that are highly experienced right. and that they are pros right. and they recognize a pro when they see a pro right. and I'm a pro right. okay. I'm not some bum out there sleeping in my van right. I'm a pro right. he saw my map collection because I showed him maps man I got it I got it and these are just the maps I carry. Right. I got a rubber made 36 gallon rubber made container full of maps. Right. Area maps, topo maps, every kind of map. Okay. Right. You're not just laying around on your train. I, I got, I got a, right. a, a, a map collection that's so exotic. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. It's got every kind of area map, every way, everywhere from Shining Rock Wilderness to all the way down to, uh, Ocala National Forest in Florida. I can pull out any map. And I got Topa, actual USGS Topa map, so much of the North Georgia area, every kind of, every, every kind of map. I got Cherokee National Forest, Nantahala National, every national forest. Not only that, I have multiples of many of them. Because you lose a map and you only have one map. I, right. I've done it. it. It screws you up. It's hard to get another one, too. Well, in the, in the interest of time, let's, if you don't care, let's, let's go back to, where did we get up to? The early 80s? About 80, 1980. Mm-hmm. Early eighties, right after the divorce, you were still in Atlanta at that time, and you were back yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, when I got busted, uh, I had to go straight for six months. So I got a job. What did you get arrested for? Fraudulent uh, telephone solicitation. It was a misdemeanor, but no, now it's a felony. What uh, what what type of oh, telephone hey. fraud were you doing at that point? Well, the usual Georgia Veterans Journal, Georgia Inspectors Journal. 
right. Southeast Regional Council, Georgia Youth Support Project. You know, back then, the, the BBB had a list of, of charities that were not approved for giving. They didn't say disapproved. They, you know, they just said not approved for giving. Don't meet their guidelines or wouldn't respond is what it was. They were on one sheet, and it was just tiny little types. So you had like three, four columns. So you had like... Uh, probably 300 charities on, on this one sheet, 250 charities. Well, I was like, just me was like four or five of them who was on that, and they, and they were me, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, Southeast Regional Council, uh, the, uh, the Georgia Christian, <laughs> I call it the Georgia Christian Index because just out of my subconscious, I came up with that. But actually, the uh, the name of the it turned out that the name of the official Southern Baptist publication is the Christian Index, and you know, and I call it my Southeast Regional Council because somewhere out of my subconscious, I had seen Southern Regional Council, which is a decades old organization, mm-hmm. quasi I got my that kind of thing, and somewhere I'd heard that, and and thinking I had no a priori knowledge of that. I thought I came up with it on my own, Southeast, but but it was pretty damn close. What year was that you got arrested for that? 79. 79. Yeah, probably about November. November. And uh, so I played that out, uh, and I went and got a job. I had to quit what I Well, they took everything. <laughs> and uh, everything. And uh, I did a search warrant on my house, too. And uh, so I got a job for about six months. I got a job until July. Mm. And by then, I was long divorced. Oh. I, what kind of job? Uh, on the phone selling industrial chemicals, okay. long distance, on a watch line. Back then they had wide area and telephone service, you know, dedicated long distance right. lines back then. Right. Yeah. And uh, got that job, kept that. What, what, what was, was that? the name of that place? It's no longer existent. Uh, Kim Manufacturing, K-E-M. Yeah, I mean, so that was what, like, right after you got out of 81-ish, like the beginning of 81, or? Right. Well, if you got picked up in November. Oh, no, I, I uh, in 1980, I went, uh, in July, I kept that to July of 1980. Okay. And then what did you do? Oh, I uh, went back to my old habits. Yeah. Tough old on the job now. Yeah. Yeah. Where were you? I asked a guy one time in DeKalb County Jail, 20, oh, it was in 79, I was in there on that bus. The guy was telling me his life story, these were all... All of them were white guys at the time, you know. And it was, if you'd have told me, you know, one day DeKalb County would be majority black, that would have been the furthest thing from my mind. This was back then, DeKalb County was a white suburban county. Mm-hmm. DeKalb County Joe, this guy was telling me the story of his life, and it was just, you know, a tragedy. You know, the guy was getting in. Yeah, he's a recidivist, okay. And I, I said, so I asked him, some of the truest words I was talking, I asked him, well, why? Why? Why do you keep doing this? Well, why? You know, why? And he said, because I can't get up and go to work. And, you know, if that describes the most criminals, I, I mean, that, 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 I mean, you could say a criminal is that someone that does, breaks the law, gets away with it, and keeps doing it until he gets caught. And that's a good definition. But another good definition is one that can't get up and go to work in the morning. That's the artist. Don't you understand? That's the artist in me. Artists don't get up and go to work in the morning. Artists. That's why they call them con artists. <laughs> right. So, okay, anyway, anyway, okay. Look, I started doing that, and uh, I kept doing it uh, through the 80s. I took a bus in uh, 87. Uh, did my uh, G, uh, GCIG, or my computer printout, has, has it set by taking, but the actual charge is set by deception, T by D. Misdemeanor again. Right. The woman lured me over there to Dunwoody, Mount Bourbon Road in Ashworth, Dunwoody, right in the heart of Dunwoody. A fucking yuppie woman lured me over there for to pick up a $25 check and then kept me waiting for the check. She was really good. She was pretending she was on the phone and she would come out and let me see her on the phone. Kept me waiting there for 30 minutes, you know. When, when I told my criminal friends about it, they said, oh, I can never sit there waiting for 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> taught me a lesson. <laughs> taught me a lesson. Yeah. And they showed up, uh, DeKalb, DeKalb County North again, and they showed up, uh, arrested me, 
they they got the check. They got the woman complaining. They found my car. Okay, the car I was driving was a stolen car. Really? It had been stolen from a rental company that I'd been running from. And uh, what kind of car was it? Uh, Chevy. Uh, it was 1986. Uh, your Chevy, uh, not Cavalier, not Citation. Oh, there was a million of these cars. Anyway, it's just a generic rental car. Right. Chevy, Chevy, Euros, something years old. And uh, I've been renting these cars from them. Mm-hmm. 14 a day, unlimited mileage. Hmm. That was a killer. Hmm. Man, I could go out and, you know, if I save all my stuff I had to pick up, I could just rent the thing once a week and go put 200 miles on it for 7 cents a mile. You can't, hmm. you know, you can't, just, you can get something for 7 cents a mile, just jump on it, you know, because, you know, your car's going to cost you 30 cents. You know, pretty <laughs> it is, you know, at least days it will. So I do that. Not only that, if I rent it on a Friday, they used the key job. They were closed on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And they were at the storefront, snappy rental car, storefront shopping center. And uh, so if I rented it on a Friday, I had no way of determining when I bought it, brought it in. I'd bring it back Sunday night. So it was, it was sweet, but they finally stopped that. And I had it, and uh, I had a bunch of uh, rental forms. That you know, from actually running the cars, mm-hmm. they were like the third copy. You couldn't read them anyway. Right. And that was not only a proof of ownership, but it was also proof of insurance. They had checked off if you had purchased insurance mm-hmm. check, and so I just drove it on that. Had dealer drive out tags on it. And at that time, dealer drive out tags were just not the issue. Tag. They were just the old you right. know, Joe Jones Chevrolet. Yeah, right. Yeah, on there. Ridic- I mean, one time a cop in Tennessee in a, in a state park, High Falls State Park in Tennessee, I was up there with a stolen car and, and uh, a park police or police officer, some jurisdiction saw me and he followed me and followed me and followed me. I, said, I knew he was following me inside this park. And I was going to the office to pick up a map there. So I pulled in and parked, and I got out. And he pulled in and got out. was walking in. He says, uh, is that what you all have in uh, Georgia there? Those things? I said, yeah, yeah, that's what they usually show. It was no good for a police work. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking little does he know. Just hang up the car. Yeah. You when know, when yeah. was that? Uh, 87 or 80. I drove that car to, to 80. I drove it for years. I drove it for years. Wait, wait a minute. When did you run it? Oh, you mean still what? Uh, yeah. 86. Oh, okay. I drove it yeah. to 89. The first day I used it, the reason I used it is I just, I drove it for years. The wait, wait a minute, when did you run it? Oh, you mean still what? Uh, yeah. 86. Oh, okay. I drove it yeah. to 89. The first day I used it, the reason I used it is I just, I just took it and, and put it, stored it in midtown and would keep it washed when it, when it through the, uh, Car wash. You're not going to charge me with this, are you? No, 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 no. Thank you for running out. Man. We just, we okay, just I, I, yeah, well, I just <laughs> don't know. Anyway, I kept the stats. But anyway, I uh, I broke my arm uh, uh, running. I, I broke my arm running. I was I was uh, running along a uh, just you know running in Midtown. I was going along a rock wall about nine feet over a parking lot, and one of the rocks was loose, and I I fell off of it, fell all the way down to the uh, to the pavement and really broke my arm real bad right here. And then the next year I broke it by falling off a mountain bike, same place. But it was bad the first time. Displaced fracture, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so I, my other car, you know, I had this old Ford, 77 Ford. The power steering was broken, so I couldn't drive it one hand with it. So. And that's the reason I've been renting them anyway, because my, my car was so decrepit. You know, it looked so bad. Dude. Anyway, so I'm What kind of car was it? A Ford. That 77 Ford uh, LTD. Yeah. Yeah, a big old monster. Like a knock car? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it wasn't blue, was it? No, no. It was, it was, <laughs> it didn't have light right oh, on it. It was all scaled. I was horrible looking. Uh, but anyway, the first day I drove the uh, uh, Chevy Cavalier. Chevy Cavalier. That's Cavalier, no. Still not ringing right. Anyway, the first day I drove it, the very first day I drove it to work in, you know, I was out picking up my fraudulent money. And uh, on the McGinnis Ferry Road, uh, State Patrol, Highway Patrol had a, a road check there. Came along and uh, right where you cross the Chattahoochee River on the uh, east side of the river, they had a road check set up. 
And you really couldn't see it because they were kind of in dead space or something. Well, you know, that's the way they had it, of course, so you can't see it a few miles away. Still would be good, of course, if you turn around, they'd be after you. But anyway, yeah, I drove into it. I, you know, I was just in it before I knew it. I went go. And uh, this is before the computerized insurance, so you had to have proof of insurance, too. And he said, uh, 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 proof of insurance, driver's license. So I flipped, flipped in my orange uh, contract, which you couldn't read anyway. It was a carbon copy, but it, I had it. The, the date was just illegible, but the legible part was that I had insurance and my name and address on it. And I kind of half-assed to raise the date. It was carbon anyway, so yeah, it just looked, it looked real. You know, it's just like the third carbon on some. But you could see it was my name and address and that I had purchased insurance because that box was checked proof of insurance. And uh, so I handed that my driver's side. He didn't even look at it. He just shot it back to me, returned mail. He opened it and I said, oh, jeez. Well, and I drove that car for three more years. <laughs> like that. Until I bought a truck. I bought, I bought a yeah, Mazda. But uh, when did you get the Mazda? 89. <laughs> so you got it 86 and you drove that way? Well, I started driving it. I had it stored for several months until I broke my uh, my arm. And then I just started driving it. And once, once I went through that road check, it was okay, and it did have the drive-out tags on it, but all those uh, celebrities, that's what it was, the celebrities, celebrities, Eurosport, yeah, nice, nice car. Those were those cars had a great design. Uh, the uh, the trunk was just a box. You could take a bike and just take the front, front wheel off and put a bicycle right in the trunk. I mean, and it was just a box, a four-door, just beautiful, usable space, sporty enough. Uh, good handling, good performance. They were just, you know, crummy, uh, crummy built. But uh, but once I ran through that road check, I said, hey. oh, but anyway, it had the drive drive out tag, so it was supposedly a new car. But they all looked the same in those years. Also, they used the same design all the way through uh, through '89, uh, because uh, or even through '90, yeah, through '90, because uh, and I was living in an apartment on uh, 11th Street, right on uh, Piedmont Park. Right on the park. And so once I ran through that road check, uh, well, hey. <laughs> oh, and I kept it washed. I always made sure I kept it clean so it looked neat. Did you have any roommates back around that time? Right? No. You by yourself? All the time I've had a roommate was that time with that, uh, or twice, a guy named John Moss back in 82. Uh, I lived with him for about six months. Uh, and uh, Chris Johnson, who called in telling uh, again one of the people that called in 12 years later to lash me you know Chris you know it, that was in the article called Misfit with the Mean Street and that was really a hassle job he said I drifted around for North Georgia for a decade Jesus Christ and from 97 to 2007 except for a six month break I worked for 10 years I worked for the same company and for 9 years I was at the same address, checking on DMV. And they're making me out to be some drifter. I worked for the same company ten years and I have the same address for nine years prior to prior to my rent. Since ninety seven? Yeah. Ninety seven ninety seven I started there and in ninety eight I lived there, started living there. Right. And in two thousand one I had a six month break I was away from. What did you do for that? Work for another company. The guy was stealing from me the whole time and uh, it was a shame, real shame. Uh, it, we all, we all, even guys like myself that are just totally sociopathic, uh, we still need some human to trust, right? Even if we're not close to them, right? To trust them, even if it's a business associate. And I chose to trust them, and and that's why it is a John Taylor. John Taylor. Yeah, okay. And that's why I got away with it. You see. It's because when you choose to trust someone, it's kind of a dimming of awareness. It's like with your spouse. You're in love with your spouse, so you dress them up in your love. And you make them quite often into something that they really weren't, even oh, though a pedestal on them. It, that's what I mean. Dress them. Cindy Lauper put out a song. You remember Cindy, Cindy Lauper? And just dress them up in my love. And I thought that that's a good line. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And and and, so, and and quite often people find that their spouses really weren't who they themselves made them out to be. Right. And they find that their spouses were looking them in the eye for the whole ten years and saying, "Honey, 
I love you. There'll never be another one. And sleeping with them and being intimate with them. And the whole time sharing their body and their life and their emotions with some other woman or some other man. But it's an all too common story. It's psychopathic behavior, but everyone does it. Because one of my favorite observations that I've come to learn through my philosophical insights is that personal integrity is so hard to judge because everyone has different degrees of integrity according to what they're doing and who they're doing it with. Mm. And ain't that the truth? We all do. Yeah. We all do. We all do. Well, maybe you guys always have integrity, but but whether you're a preacher or some outstanding member of the community, I, I, I think I used the example with one of you driving up here. I think both of you were with me, weren't you? Mm. Didn't you, both of you drive me up to Union Cabin? Yes, Dan. I thought you were with me too. Well, you were in the back seat and we were talking about hiking. Yeah, do I don't know my shit or what? I, I searched from uh, boots to shoes, actually. Great. And uh, do yourself a favor. Well, modern hiking shoes uh, generally have a good padding. But consider, how, are, are, are your shoes plenty big enough? All right. Okay. If you're ever having any trouble at all with plantar or your bottoms of your feet getting sore, the feet themselves. Yeah, we talked about that. Make sure you put a pad under them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, get a double <laughs> shoulder, double thick, double thick pad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some people, if, if some people say they need the ankle support, well, that's for them to judge. But I didn't need it. Now remember, when you roll that ankle, go with it. it stress relief. Don't go all the way down, but don't fight it either. Just mm -hmm. go down. Re relieve the stress. You know, I. I what? So, the nineties was pretty much the same deal. You were staying in an apartment up until... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I went homeless in uh, early 90. Early 90? Yeah, the reason I went homeless is I was being investigated once again, yet again, by the police. For the same thing? Yeah, yeah. And I knew, I knew what went down. Uh, I was hiring people to go out and collect. Right. And they were not cognizant of the reality of the situation. They thought it was for real. Naturally. Can't put that in the paper and hire a good say this is a con game. Now, I had a whole story that I'd give to, to make it real. This is out, you know, King James production out of, you know, mine and Georgia Veterans Journal, and I handle this once a year for them. They have this project. I do it. And so I'm using you and all these, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you, and here I am working out of the apartment. I could get, I kept three phones in an apartment, you know, in all my apartments. And several times a year, I would hire people to come in and call my taps, as they're called, accounts. And the reason I did is because I can only talk to them three or four times a year that recognize my voice. And ditto with picking them up. I could only pick them up three or four times a year, even wearing disguises, you know. And so I have to have a new voice and a new face to pick them up. So I was using a collector. The collector failed to, to come in. And I started calling around roommates, parents, and I started getting the bites. Something had happened. And it, by the and then now it's happened. And it, by the and then now it's sort of later at night. And, you know, police officers are like any, anyone else. They like to work regular hours if they can. So I knew they wouldn't be there until the next morning, more than likely. So I got up real early the next morning. I got all my stuff out of the apartment that was sensitive. And when I had a storage locker and went and put it in the storage locker. Then as I came back, I parked my car in Midtown and I broke through Piedmont Park and sneaked up on, on the dead end of 11th Street and, and peered over the embankment. And uh, there were two plain clothes off. Oh, and I left a note on my apartment door. Back soon, please wait. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> And waiting, they were in a, guess what, a Chevy Celebrity. That's what Atlanta play, uh, play close police used for all, during all those years, of, uh, Chevy Celebrities, same as mine. As a matter of fact, that celebrity was white, and it looked so much like a police car, because the police, the police used it all during those years, mm -hmm. that I would go over in the African-American side of town. There's no place I wouldn't pick up. So I'd, I'd, I'd be picking up black liquor stores, in the heart of darkness over there, places where Simpson Street, uh, all these places, uh, places where to, a white person to walk down the street would be, the two, you'd be scout, you'd be fucking scout. I just mossed them, and I'd act like a police officer. I'd get out, I'd drive up in that car, I'd have the invoice in my hand in an, in an envelope, 
Well, I, I had the mindset that this was a war. Or something, you know, and I was a cop. And, you know, and I looked like a cop, you know, because I was well built and, and I carried myself like a cop. I drive up in this plain clothes police car, get out, you know, like I owned the damn place. I got my, my court order in my hand and I go in there and pick up my $5. I'm telling you, I go, I go into the risk my life to pay. Anyway, more than once, I've gotten out of, I'll tell you one time, I got out of the car, slammed the door, and in a black guy, it's a liquor store, and you know how they hang around there. there I, I got a, I got a run a gauntlet of black guys hanging around in front of a liquor store. I got to walk right through them. Okay, that's what you call um, occupying your space. That's what you call officer presence. Okay, <laughs> I had, I had, I had a guy one time. I got out of that car and he was in front of a liquor store. He put his hands up. And he said, "Okay, you got me." <laughs> I said, I don't want you. <laughs> he thought I was there for him. <laughs> and Did what? you carry any weapons with you? I mean, no, I, no, no, no. I had a gun. But <laughs> well, <laughs> no, uh, because I was convicted of felon at the time. I got a uh, felony dies of ham uh, conviction in 84. Uh -huh. We didn't go over that, but it's on my record. Right. Uh, You'll also see a concealed weapon uh, conviction there, it's called. I was convicted of that. It was dropped. I had a permit. Right. I had a weapons permit. And no, what I was doing is I was walking around a, an apartment complex, looted out on dives and headless, with a pistol in my fucking hand, a 25, looking for the maintenance guy to collect the debt for the girl that I had fucked the night before whose husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. And I walked right into the looted out, looted totally out. Walked right into the apartment rental office with a 25 in my hand. I had my little date book and I had it pressed up against that, so I wasn't carrying it like that. But it was out. I thought my shit was so good looking for this guy. I was going to collect $12 from him. That this I booked the check the night before who was my dealer for the Quailies, who was a musician out of town, right? And uh, so that's how I got busted uh, because uh, Forest Park Police responded, uh, flagged me down as I was driving out with the chick in the car. Uh, the chick was messing with her purse and got it up ended and about a hundred pills spilled out of her purse. You know, it was get out of the car time then. Mm -hmm. And I was so fucked up. But anyway, so the charge was dies of hand and marijuana and the pistol. But I had a permit for the pistol. <laughs> Believe it or not. But I got the felony conviction on diazepam. Any amount of diazepam was a felony or is a felony. Anyhow. So you, yeah. And so I, I so the, I was convicted of felony. And so carrying a pistol uh, on any kind of bust would have made it 30 times as bad because I've I, I, I weathered uh, a couple of free busts and, and a half a dozen investigations uh, on, the, on the fraud, you know. And... I can do that. I can handle that, but not not firing by felon. You know. Oh, probably half a dozen times I found out I was being investigated. I called one of my accounts up and one of my tests up that I've been calling you know four times a year for ten years. You know, hello, it's me again. <laughs> you know, hello, it's me again, Georgia Veterans. Or hey there, huh? Georgia Inspectors Journal. Oh, is that who you are this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah ten dollars. Okay, you go there to pick it up. Store owner would look up and say, "Oh, it's him again. He couldn't get anyone to come for him. He's done come himself." And I'd walk up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, they asked me to pick this up, you know, like I've never seen him before. They'd start making out the check. Their manager would say, uh, "What's that for?" And they'd say, "Don't ask." <laughs> they know it was a game. They still give it. It was amazing. It was just totally amazing. But <laughs> anyway, no, they didn't carry gun. Uh, <laughs> anyway, no, they didn't carry gun. Uh, I don't even know where I was going with that, except. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, but so the the collector was out, and I knew something. I knew they'd been busted. Something had happened. And I knew they'd be there for me the next morning. I sneaked up, looked. There was two plain clothesmen and a celebrity. And it's so funny. I had the craziest urge to walk up and verify that they were the police, even though I knew they were. I damn sneaked up to avoid them, and I, and I knew they were. And I just had the craziest urge to do so, but I didn't. I sneaked back off and went over to my lawyer's house and stayed. And so uh, later, uh, several days later, they, within a day or two, they served the search warrant on that apartment and turned it upside down. They left the search warrant tacked to the uh, inside there, but an arrest warrant was never issued because what they were going to do, of course, is search, have probable cause, then arrest. Mm -hmm. 
but they searched, but they didn't have probable cause, no warrant was ever issued. But I was out of that apartment, and I couldn't go back, obviously. So I, I went homeless. You went homeless? In, in 1990. I started living in storage. In storage? In, in storage, storage bills? Off, yeah. And I lived in storage, lived in storage for eight and a half years. Eight and a half? Same storage place, right? Yep, yep. And I would stay about uh, about 75 days a year in a Motel 6, free local phone, 7,500 days a year. Mm -hmm. Free local phone, and Motel 6s then uh, were uh, 17, 18, 19, $20 a day. Do you remember what storage facility? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, eight and a half years, I'm sure you remember it. Oh, yeah. It was. It went through several incarnations. It was Hack and Stack. Now it's a sure guard storage in um, Jimmy Carter. On uh, Jimmy Carter in... Uh, on that? Yeah, Norcross. Right on the uh, county line, I guess. Yeah, a couple of times I had to leave for a while, lay low and be truly homeless, and then I'd get back in. What's, What's the address on that? Do you I know? Just down on Jimmy Carter? Yeah. Oh, uh, Jimmy Carter and Singleton Road. Singleton Road, uh, right on the corner. Uh, east, east, side. east side. Okay, and that was probably all the way up through you say ninety eight. Yeah, is that when you got on with John? Oh, I moved in at John. I've, I've been I've been working with John since uh, ninety seven. Ninety seven. Mm -hmm. okay. John John lived there right before he got married right, and uh, he got married in late ninety seven. Uh, late ninety seven. Right. And he wouldn't let me go, go in for a while, but he did. He, he needed me too bad. I left him uh, in early 97 and stayed gone several months, and he needed me real bad, so he let me move in. By the way, you can tell John Taylor that I'm the one that killed the girl, okay? I'm the one that killed her, but the reason she's dead, I want you to tell Taylor this. The yeah. reason she's dead, now I killed her, okay? Yeah. But the reason she's dead is that when I called him on Wednesday, I guess, or Thursday, yeah, when th well, Thursday, mm -hmm. or whenever. Thursday. When I called him, that girl was alive. Mm -hmm. She was in my van. Yeah. She was in the parking lot, that whole house. And it's just like when I, I told, I gave the girl's body up when I realized that I had been caught there in square. Right. That's what I told you, because they had me on the kidnapping, and it, they, it was going to stick, the evidence was good right out of the dumpster, it was just a smoking gun, they had me. And on the kidnapping charge, it's the same as a life sentence for me. It's either 30 years for first degree or life or with bodily harm. So I was getting a life sentence and they had that. And so there was no real use in keeping the girl's body except not to be charged with murder and everything. And I did it under those Thanks because they had me, and I did it for the girl's family. Right. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is I gave the girl's body up because you had me. Right. You had me there in square, and I was getting life. But you were talking, you were talking about yeah. Taylor. Okay, but Taylor. Mm -hmm. So the same thing applied at that time. The girl was alive. Mm -hmm. And if Taylor hadn't been such a little smart ass, he's such a girl. These yuppies are all, we got a little nation of cattle tails here. These guys are such, he is a, he is a, a bisexual. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he works the, uh, tri the big, uh, that huge, uh, transport city, uh, parking lot, truck stop in Douglas County. These are cities within themselves, you know. 500 trucks. They got some, it's a small metropolis of truckers. They got stores, all for truck. Yeah, he goes and works that. He works restrooms. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm hip to that kind of stuff, and uh, yeah, he is. But at any rate, if Tabor, instead of trying to trap me, I called Tabor up and I asked him, I told him I needed money, and I wanted to start working again for him. Mm -hmm. And I was really sincere in trying to start work again for him because I saw that this uh, robber shit wasn't getting it because I hadn't I'd gotten any money off her. <laughs> You know, I had gotten a dime. I had spent money on her. I had forty-five dollars to my name, and I had spent thirty dollars of it driving all over North Georgia trying to work her ATM card on the bogus number she gave me. I, I've lost money on that deal, you know. And uh, so Taylor has to be coy, and you know, uh, carried all the way. Asked for eight hundred. Well, I don't know if I can give you that. I spent. I said, Well, give me blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, I'll leave you a check. Yeah, he's such a damn girl, just a smart ass yuppie. If Taylor. Trust me, 
Phil favored this. If he hadn't been so, he tried to entrap me, he wanted you know come and get it at the office. He was just setting a trap for me. He's the one that called him to begin with. He had, all, he had, he had already seen that on TV and, and called him and said it was me. He's the one that the first one that turned me in apparently. Although. I don't worry about that because if it wasn't Tabor, it would have been someone else within a couple of days. There's too many law enforcement officers in North Georgia, four service officers that know I carry a bat, an expanding bat, that are very familiar with me, including the people out of, uh, out of, um, Union County there, and I get on all the WMAs. I, I had plenty of in Anyway, if Tabor had a said, instead of trying to entrap me, I mean, what's the use of that? I mean, really, because if they knew who I am, they're going to catch me anyway. It's just a, if Tabor had said, "Hey, uh, Gary, they know it's you. Yeah, they know it's you. They're onto you. They're looking for you now." Because I wasn't in the paper that day. I, I joked about it with a girl. This this was the second day or third day I I had her, second or third day I had her, and she still wasn't in the paper. I said, "You know something? No one's even missed you." And she said, well, I'd be mad if I, if once you let me go, and I came back, and my boyfriend said, have you been gone? <laughs> she said, I really, we were laughing about it, because nothing had appeared in the paper. It was like she hadn't even, I said, they haven't even reported you missing yet. It was like the second or third day, or the third day after she went missing, something like that, the day before she was killed, okay? The day before she was killed. Tabor had already turned me in, but it hadn't hit the papers yet. Okay, it hit the papers on Friday. Mm-hmm. I got that, and you know, I was on the front page. Well, I saw that article like two hours after I killed him. Right. If I had bought a paper that morning on Friday instead of that afternoon, she would have been alive. Because there are they, my pictures on the front page, a color picture on the front page of the AJC, looking for me and everything. I wouldn't have killed her. I mean, for Pete's sake, no. And the, the same holds true with Tabor. If Tabor had just said, instead of trying to be a smart ass, and lay a trap for me. Say so you've got to carry it all. These people are such women. That's what women are always doing. The dogs are running loose. I spray their dog. What do they do? They call the police. Okay. The police come and say he's got a right to defend himself. Your dog. You know, any time a any time a, a woman or a person says to a, a police officer, they start a story with, "Well, my dog was running loose." Well, they're already wrong. Right there, they they're in violation right there. You know what I'm talking about? But they're wrong from and the police officer. Anyway, if Tabor had just said, "Hey, Gary, that, that hiker," because she wasn't in the paper. I bought a paper there. I bought I just bought a paper in the gas station before I went there and looked in the paper. They didn't have a payphone at the gas station. I bought the paper at, so I went across to the huddle house to use the phone. I was within looking distance of where I bought the paper. I'd already looked in the paper. I showed her the paper. I said, they haven't even reported you missing yet. You're not even in the paper, right? If Tabor had just said, Gary, they, they know it's you. They're looking for you. The girl would be alive. Girl, listen, the reason for killing the girl, it was either once you've taken someone, you're either going to kill them or you're going to get caught. It's as simple as that. In my situation, look at me. I got the dog. I got the van. I'm me. I'm famous anyway, <laughs> regardless. And I knew it. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. If you release them, you're going to get caught. I mean, am I right or not? If I would have been sure. Smith, right? Well, she's seen the van. She's seen the tag. She's seen the dog. She's seen all she has to do. Is they have to put that out. And 10,000 people would be calling, including Tabor. He was just the first one, you know. Of course I knew it. You either kill them or you get caught, okay? But if you're already caught, there's no use in killing them. I didn't kill them because for any satisfaction. It was distasteful. It was dreadful. Trust me, it was. Of course, I was able to do it because of my general rage against society. Of course, of course. It's because I'd become... Well, you get that way in Atlanta. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me, I think we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, you get that way. It's more than traffic. And people. So the people are just, now, the, the new aristocracy, they act like they're fucking royalty. You know, they're idiots. And, uh, I guess Tabor's kind of part of that then, somewhat. Oh, uh, Tabor's, uh, uh, kind of part of that. Kind of part of that. Uh, but, uh, Tabor's a little more, uh, 
I have a saying that when it comes to individual or human beings, the answer is really simple. I, I, I simplify groups of human beings, and you really have to actually to preserve your scalp for that matter. You have to, you have to, you, you have to make broad judgments about groups of human beings, but always understanding that individual human beings, the answer is really simple. It really is. And so Tabor has a, a lot of different sides to him. He's got that secret life of a bisexual that he apparently hides from his wife, even though I'm sure she's found out after 10 years of marriage. I'm sure she knows it. They just have an accommodation. So any any 95% of homosexuals are lived the life of a heterosexual. And the reason I know this is I spent 17 years in public parks with dogs, spending buku time in public parks with dogs. Fantastic. People say I hung around Murphy Candler. I didn't hang around Murphy Candler. I was doing laps around the damn lake. You know, okay? I'd be there two or three hours. I wasn't hanging around. I was walking my damn dog, okay? I was exercising, you see. And, uh, but, and in these parks, there are many parks and, and national forest areas and national rec areas that are homosexual cruising grounds. And as a result, you get a first-hand view of exactly what a homosexual is. And I'm going to tell you who they are. They're your spouse, your, you know, they're your husband, they're your father, they're your supervisor, your manager, your uncle, your dad. That's who they are. They're not, you know, flaming faggots, man. They're guys that look just like men and, and you know, and everything. Sometimes the more manly they look, the more they're bad. And that's who bags are. And these guys, what they have to do, Sam Rails, another one, you may, uh, he's an attorney. Uh, these guys live a, a lie. They live a lie, whether they're married or single. These guys inflict untold harm on, on women because, like, Sam Rail was an attorney, uh, young attorney, unmarried, so he was a mark for every kind of social climbing buckhead bitch in the world. He pulled a lot of good pussy, including girls that went with him for a long time. And he ruined their lives by passing for straight. They were going for a faggot and didn't know it. You know, I used to say, I have a, I have a joke to myself about Janet Taylor. Janet Taylor's an attorney. His wife is an attorney. She graduated number one in a law school, too, which is an accomplishment. Now, I used to have a joke. I, I'd say, Janet Taylor was uh, smart enough to graduate number one in her class in law school, but dumb enough to marry a faggot. And, and, and the reason she did is, is because she went, she dressed him up in her love. Tabor's an immensely attractive guy, totally well-mannered. He has the, the manners of, of a rich person, although he's near near rich. He went to Druid Hills High School, which is a, a very, it's a public school, but it's, you know, and he's, he's into country club culture, and he, in fact, et cetera, et cetera. So she went for that. She saw the window dressing. Uh, he has a, a many great personal qualities uh, about him. Uh, he has, he's just a lot of back that lies about everything. You can't trust him about everything. I don't know where all this is leading, but uh, you, you, you and Tabor were pretty tight, though. It's no, the no. way I get it. No, I was tight with Tabor. Tabor was not tight with me, nor is he tight with anyone. Oh, okay. Listen, if, if Tabor would screw me, the, the guy who's, you know, I talk to him a lot, and it's me talking to him, and if Tabor would screw me, He'd screw his mother, he'd screw his wife, he'd, he'd screw anybody. Okay? Right. He's a psychopath. I, I'm sure Tabor's laughing now because I, I call Tabor a psychopathic criminal with no heart, no conscience, and no moral compass. And I'm sure he's saying, yeah, look, he's talking. Tabor's worse than me. He's just not dangerous like me. He's, he's just, you're a, a girl. <laughs> he, yeah, he's a girl. I'm a stud, okay? So I do the crime that studs would do. Yeah, he did the crime that, that girls would do, which is lying and stealing. You know. Did he confess this, this bisexuality to you or anything? Oh, I've been around enough, man. That older woman I told you back when I left my wife, she was what, back in 1971. She was what they call a fag hag. She was a New York Jew. She was what they call a fag hag. A fag hag is a woman that just runs with homosexuals, you know. And it works out good for them because they, everywhere they go, they're surrounded by these gorgeous, good-looking guys who don't look like queers. And, you know, and at the same time, she relates to them as a woman, not as a man. So they can, they can, they can, they can be girls with her, the girl side, you know what I mean? They, you know, they, they can be girls with her, the girl side, you know what I mean? They, you know, they, fags have, have the, 
heart and soul of a woman with a sex drive of a man, basically, which is why they're so inordinately and flagrantly promiscuous. You know, you've heard the stories of, you know, the bad back, back clubs and so forth that are having sex with a hundred men a night. You know, can you imagine with your sex drive of a man being able to fuck all the women in the world and that all the women you want to fuck, you, you, you fuck a hundred and not, not, I don't know, that you, you know, if you have the sex drive of a man, you know. And, uh, no, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm so hip to that kind of thing. I, I've still been around. I've only had one homosexual experience in my life. It's when I was 16, mutual masturbation. But, uh, again, starting from her and, you know, and, and being with the dog, that's the biggest education in the world, just spending Un, uncounted hours in public parks. Uncounted hours. And also in National Forest. You can go down to, uh, that Lake Chicago Forest for that matter. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, there's a place called, uh, Lost Lake there. And it's a day use area only now, which is why. That's not about a homosexual cruising ground. That's a place that's got a, a, a lake there, so several acres with a perimeter road going around it. And an entrance drive, and you drive in, and there'll be guys in, in vehicles, single guys in vehicles, spaced all around. And as you drive in, there'll be one or two of them staked out of the entrance to see who's coming in. They want to get good on you if you look good. So if you look good, they'll start following you, and they'll follow you around. And when you park somewhere, they'll park about 50 yards away. There's another park that was notorious, although Gwinnett County is really cutting down on them. That's Lucky Shoals. Park on Britt Road, which is between Old Moore Cross Road and Jimmy Carter Road, and it's a, an extension of uh, uh, Singleton Road, I guess, something like that. And yes, yeah, so Lucky Shoals Park. You have to check it out sometime. I opened that park up. Me and me and Ranger did when it was built. Uh, it was being built in 1991. I opened that park up. And that got so bad as a homosexual cruising ground that it had a circular drive at the end of the, you know, an island of vegetation and trees in the middle. And, and so it would be like guys park, you know, all around, you know, with the, you know, it was, you know, facing, I don't know, you don't call it parallel park, you know, regular parking slot. And so they'd all be sitting around there, they'd be holding a magazine, you know, like this so they could masturbate, you know, underneath it. And then uh, the other, the cruisers would be cruising around and around in a circle. Oh, it's funny. And uh, finally, though, it attracted the attention of, uh, of, of Gwinnett County. And uh, I got to know the officers there, and uh, they were saying, it's embarrassing, you know, and you're a single guy over there, but at least I got an excuse. I got a dog. If I was a homosexual cruiser, I'd make sure I had a dog, I'll tell you the truth. Because <laughs> any single guy in there would be pegged as, as a homo, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the cops would pull, pull up to me and they'd go, hey, how you doing? Hey, great. And he said, no, how's the crowd tonight? <laughs> I'd say, well, if you're being uh, the soliciting for sodomy crowd, uh, <laughs> They just keep it down a little bit, you know, and if they bug me, I tell them they don't know what they're risking, man. Gwinnett County is undercover in here. They come in here and arrest 27 people over last year. One time Gwinnett County did, not there, but at another part, I think it was Shorty Island uh, part, uh, did a, uh, a, a undercover, you know, sodomy operation on lunch. Arrested 20, 27 guys over lunch. And it showed the vehicles that they were in town, and they were company vehicles. <laughs> yeah, you know, they were like celebrities, and, you know, buddy, just company vehicles, uh, company trucks. <laughs> oh, my. I think they've been there. And, you know, can you imagine that having a family and they were soliciting for sodomy? I guess it was, I don't guess, I don't know if sodomy's against the law anymore. I might be now just soliciting for sex in a public park, but it was soliciting for sodomy and everything. Oh, so give me a huge insight. And, uh, I, and I know what goes on in the, uh, the truck parts too, because I've known prostitutes that work with big transport cities and everything. They'll just get in their car, and they'll go driving around with the window open and wave the guys, and if, if a guy wants to talk to them, he'll flash his lights or, or wave at them. They'll just pull, stop and get, they, they, you know, 200 cent lights pulled up. Mm-hmm. And that's what homosexuals do too, because a lot of these, uh, rough tough trucks. Truck drivers are gay. Did you ever see the Cops episode? The t- you know the TV show Cops. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. You, there was one episode where the police stopped a guy. He was a trucker. He was running down the street and he was wearing nothing but uh, uh, leopard print pit, print panties uh, with pantyhose, uh, a woman's wig, and woman's makeup on. <laughs> and 
he was a real man too. You know, a real, real, real guy. And it turned out that he had uh, got a guy in the cab of his truck for homosexual sex, and the guy grabbed his wallet and run. And, and <laughs> it was so funny to see a rough, tough truck driver, and he was too, big old fat guy. Talk like a truck driver and everything. He didn't want no pansy waist either. And he's wearing this pantyhose, leopard skin briefs, and a woman's wig and, and with a woman's makeup on. It was, oh, that was a hilarious. And they replayed that several times. Uh, you, do you guys watch that show? Yeah, I, watch it. I, I, I like to watch it. Uh, the, it shows how police officers work. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's very impressive. That's why I know police officers is so that and my personal encounters with them. Right. You know, back in the sixties or fifties, I mean that no shit I I mean they were just they were just guys that couldn't get a good job. Mm -hmm. Basically. Just goons, more or less. Well, of course they were individuals. Right. But uh I, my my hats are off to the police, the modern police, because almost uniformly just in the smaller departments like Duluth and Shambly do you see uh, people that are obese and that are just not like the far. I mean, I like to say with the Shambly police, I've had my share of encounters with them too, plenty. And the Shambly police are just the type that would drive up and jump out and, and shoot the victim instead of the perpetrator. <laughs> <laughs> really? One time I had a panhandler chasing me, and I flagged down because I told him, get lost, go away. He was in Shambly, and, you know, he'd come from downtown from Martin and come up there in front of the Walgreens and everything, and I always had my bat with me. I, I won't give out, as, as I said to that Cherokee officer, I, I take it in everywhere but banks and government buildings like post office. I carry it everywhere. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I had my bat in my hand, actually. I told him, you know, get lost, get the fuck off, and he started giving me a bunch of shit, and he started coming at me, and uh, I saw a Shadow Police drive by, I flagged him down, and, and, uh, and it turned out there were a couple of them, and they came in, and I ran up to them, to an officer with him chasing me and my bat wasn't deployed it was just still pulling you know I hadn't he didn't even know I had it I hadn't waited or nothing I just had it and you know if I can run I'm not going to hit someone you know I, I'm, I'm obligated to try to get away you just you know you can't stand there and hit them you, you got to try to flee okay and I ran up to one officer and and then another officer grabbed the guy and then I was talking to one officer, and the guy, the beggar, the panhandler, broke loose, he's a black pack panhandler, and came after me again while I'm talking to an officer. I had to run away again. That officer grabbed him, and then another officer drove up and started getting my story, and I called his attention. I said, just to make sure he saw it, because, you know, it's only nine inches. I said, I have an expanded bat in my hand. And he started going, what? What are you doing with that? You can't carry that. And it, okay. Here I am, a guy chasing me, running for my life, and now he's chewing my ass out. So, <laughs> really, there's just the kind of guy that would drive up and shoot the victim instead of the perpetrator. <laughs> they are. They're sorry. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, with, with notable exceptions like that, most largely metropolitan uh, departments, the police, uh, the cab north, great, great. I've I, I run across a couple of bad officers. Gwinnett County. This is Gwinnett County South, man, I swear, I think that half of those, of their officers probably have psychology at least. They, they're, they're good. They're really good. And these are the dudes that chase and fight and shoot, too, you know. You know. What is that? What, the DeKalb, DeKalb County in that period of time killed 12 people in about 15 months. And guess what? And, and shot a lot of other ones. And, you know, they had a big fury and they had the blue ribbon panel investigated all, including, the, you know, the Baptist ministers, the whole world. And every shooting was justified. They were all good shootings. None of them were bad shootings. So these are the same dudes that fly, chase, and, and shoot, but yet can be professional and, and, and arrive at the truth of the situation. That's what saved me every damn time, is that it was a professional police officer, you know. Because here would be that woman, Pam, someone that called into the journal saying I was crazy. Well, she's the same woman that I asked her to hook her dogs up. She finally did after I had asked her a million times. And I made the mistake of smarting off to her. I said, you're the type of your dog owners a bad manager. Like that. I went and did another lap around Murphy Camel. I came back to my van. She had her six four husband waiting for me. Yeah. They she'd gone home. They got in their Mercedes and driven around to the parking lot. She had her great big old husband waiting for me, telling me he was going to kick my ass. I was carrying a 36-cent solid bat. 
and and I just let him back me around the parking lot. It was a, it was a slow motion chase, and the whole time I'm telling him, call the police, call the police, that's the police handle. And the woman's watching me, and she saw I was, I was about to snag him, you know. Uh, it's, again, it's incumbent upon me to try to get away. It is, but I'm going to turn my back and run either. That's a good way to get cold caught. So, so it was a slow motion chase backward, and I'm, I'm doing it the right way. And so they call the police. They tell the police a bunch of lies. This is the cab north. I, I fled and called the police and told them where I was. I didn't know the parking lot I called in. I just wanted to get away from them, not being the defendant while the police were coming. So the police came to me, took my stick. He said, first thing, he said, where's the stick? I did. Okay. Took my story. Then another unit arrived. He, he sat on me. And while well, the first guy that took my stick went around and got their story, they told him their pack of lies. Let the cab north officer came back around, got out, opened the back door of his car. I thought, damn, she's going to put me in that? He got my stick out, gave me my stick back, and he said, I told those people that you have a right to carry this stick, and you have a right to defend yourself if they feel, you know, that you feel you're afraid of their dog. And I guess he left it unsaid that he told them that what the guy had done is just committed an assault on me. It's what, what he did. He forced me to flee. So that's how good police officers are. They, they, every time, every third, of all those 30 times, every time they have arrived at the truth in that I did not act unlawfully. They, they, they may not be aware they, that they made the whole story. Every single time. And that, that just reflects so good on them because these people lie. They tell outrageous lies. That woman I was telling you about the Stone Mountain, I called to a dog 150 yards away, sprayed one stick the other. Well, she come running up saying, you're just egging them on. <laughs> she said, this same woman, and during the next year, I saw her twice out of Stone Mountain, moving in the same direction I was on the trail. So I just kind of trailed her from a discreet distance. And both of those times, her dog attacked the child. Once they attacked a little African-American boy, and his father had to grab the boy, and put him on his shoulders. Another time, they attacked a white boy that was fishing there with his father and ran the little boy into the lake. Okay. Now, this now this same chick and the same dog, I went and, and did six miles around the, over well over an hour later, and I come back, and she is there with the police. Still not part of the police. Telling them that I sprayed all, every kind of thing, verbally and everything, and the police asked me the story. I told him, the dogs in front of me, put me in fear, discharge my pepper twice. So, he understood. That's what I mean. They can understand when they're talking to a pro. Most police officers are pros, and they can understand when they're talking to a pro, rather than just a civilian, you know. But that's, that's an example of how the police have, have the, the quality of the police work, is that she was mad enough to wait for over an hour, have the police there when I got back, tell them a pack of lies, and he was able to rapidly arrive at the truth. And it doesn't matter. Uh, back on point for just a little bit. The uh, from from ninety seven until two thousand seven, I guess you worked for Taylor, correct? And during that time, what kind of marketing did you do, or what kind of telephone solicitation did you do with that? Oh, uh, signing residential signing, residential signing. Yeah. How did how did you how did you Pick your people out when you're doing telemarketing. Do you look it's, at No, it was a process. It was an education. I just got into uh, opinion citing mates when I went to work for Table. I'd had a job for one other company and been trained. That was a Disky Home Crafters uh, Superior Side mm-hmm. Window. Same guy owns both of them. How about one more copy if there's any more in there? And uh, so I was just doing a traditional way, getting a crisscross directory calling blinds. Uh, just Getting in an area and just calling blind and skipping the apartments. Don't worry if this is not going to anything like that. And skipping, uh, skipping, skipping the apartments. Okay. Okay. And skipping the apartments. Uh, but it progressed. Later on, I started realizing where the market was, which was in this defective siding where there's so much of it. I had been trained and, and uh, solicitors had been trained until then to avoid the defective siding. Uh, because there were so much lawsuits going around. They sent a salesman over there, he'd do his uh, song and dance, and then people say, well, thank you, but what, we think we're going to uh, litigate this thing. Mm-hmm. So they were getting burning with the wild town, so they were trained to avoid it. But finally, though, in, in uh, 90, uh, 98, late 98, someone called in off a uh, yellow page that said, Taper Head, and they said, I got my Elf Louisiana Pacific settlement, it's $900 for the whole house. That's 
what it got down to. And I thought to myself, hold on, nine hundred dollars. I can find nine hundred dollars in savings. I can have a special sale going on to save nine hundred dollars. That that amount is moved, don't matter anymore. And when, once I came to that conclusion, I started doing what everyone else was not doing. I started going after it, systematically telesurveying and identifying the subdivisions. In starting out the large real zip code, three four three four 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 five. I mean, that's the home of defective siding. You know, that's forty fifty thousand houses in those zip codes with defective siding. I started. I got a map. And I started going and identifying each subdivision, what kind of siding it had, identifying the subdivision with defective siding, and then systematically telemarketing those subdivisions using a street directly, crisscross street directly. Mm -hmm. And then it got on, uh, I, I did leaflets for several years too, which did not look like a leaflet. It looked like a note off a notepad. I would hand letter, please call me if you've ever wanted, uh, thought about vinyl siding, and hardly found siding. I promise to give you the best price you'll ever see. Name, brand, quality, work. Call me, good day or not. Mac, that's what I come up with, Mac. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. trade. Yeah, it's trading. It looked like it was a note. Mm -hmm. Quarter page, rather than a leaf, it was reproduced, but right. it was in my hand letter. Right. And it looked like someone left them a note. Mm -hmm. They go right up to it and grab it and read it. Mm -hmm. Someone left them a note. Mm -hmm. And it was my leaf. If it had been a leaf, they'd have taken a crop over and not, not paid any attention to it. I did that so it was that work. And then I really got sophisticated. I'd take a horse recorder and I would drive through the subdivisions and Surveys and siding on each house. It was a quick process. Mm -hmm. it, the street numbers went 40, 40, 40, 50, 40, 60. Then, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real quick process. And I would literally, I'd go to these subdivisions, which already knew that bad siding. I would just drive through them, survey them, and see the ones with the siding was wrecked. Right. And I dictated into the thing, you know. Mm -hmm. 40, 50, uh, beat it, uh, at, you know, I had a shorthand, uh, and a verbal shorthand, tell the exact type of siding, flat panel or beat it, mm -hmm. and the condition of it, mm -hmm. you know. I had a candy, uh, super candy, et cetera. And uh, then I would transcribe that onto a legal pad. It was a time consuming process, but once you have this, then you could work them for years until they got their home decided. I transcribed the addresses mm -hmm. onto a, a legal pad and then uh, leave, a, leave a space and go to the street directory mm -hmm. and look up that street in the street directory and get the name and number. Mm -hmm. And there's your list. There's a list of people that need it and have to have it. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And it, it works good. It works good. It works good. Hey, oh, and here's the approach, though. Because y'all already know they need it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like that. You go, oh, hey, Mr. Jones, hey, Mac, the siding guy here, working in your subdivision there. Notice your house the other day about the siding there, mm -hmm. the LP siding you got. I wonder what your price from Stella Hardy plant. Five ninety a square. Be glad to help you. Okay. If they said thank you or get lost, that'd be good. If they said, well, how much does that equal? Okay. If they said thank you or get lost, that'd be good. If they said, well, how much does that equal? Right. I said, yeah. well, well, you know, it's, it's slow right now. John, John Taylor, this is John Taylor's out there. Mm -hmm. way to all this. You've got, got 22 homes in your subdivision done, which would be true. Mm -hmm. I got them all. Right. Got, we've done 22 houses in your subdivision. This is John Taylor's outfit. It's a little slow right now. John's giving me a couple of installers. I got them out measuring. I'll get one of them by, measure it up, get it back to me. I'll give you a call with some good news. Really lucky. Mm -hmm. It's a step at a time. Mm -hmm. And I had the whole program. That pretty much all you did was siding stuff? You didn't do anything other than that? Well, we did the windows too, but we, we I didn't concentrate on windows. Some people make a lot of windows money on windows, but Taylor can't sell, so he couldn't make any money on windows. Mm -hmm. The uh, the gear, I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing around a little bit. The gear that you had, a lot of the gear that you had was real high end, like REI, mm -hmm. uh, North Face. Real high dollar stuff. Oh yeah. How did uh, how did you come across that kind of stuff? Quality is a necessity. Right, right. And I agree with you hundred percent on that. <laughs> so what I I came out of my my uh, years on Eleventh uh, Street mm -hmm. there. I had the three phones, and I had a, I had some good years there. Mm -hmm. I was drinking, right. but I was successful in hiring new crews of people. Right. I say crew, two people. Right. Four times a year. 
So uh, I, I, I came out money ahead on that. And so what I, the reason, one of the reasons though I, I did it is that uh, in the early 90s, I started wanting to be a god and an outfitter. And uh, so I started accumulating, you know, buying, uh, I had a uh, North Face rep. Mm. Uh, at the time, North Face was, that's the really high. Right, right, right. 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 And right. had some of those mountain mines. Those are good jackets. I got three of them. Yeah. Right. I got two in medium and uh, one in large. Those are good jackets. I got, did you see, uh, I got uh, I got four North Face bags. Yeah, two of them are, and then, uh, well, actually, three of them are cast me out. One has a thermostat lining in it. It's a later and a uh, snowshoe. And the snowshoes uh, are nice. I got a snowshoe. It yeah, great. it's a plus five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two of them were for the dog. Two of the cast me out were for the dog. You carry two for the dog because they're subject to getting wet. They dry in a flash, but yeah. nevertheless. And uh, that's why the girl wasn't cold. She had, a, she had, you know. I was telling you, she, she didn't. She was cooperating with me. But that wasn't that wasn't some kind of. To get the REI stuff and to get the North Face stuff, that wasn't some kind of uh, scam that you had gotten to Oh, no, that. no, no. Oh, well, here's the thing. I, I got the uh, North Face wrap. At that time, in uh, the early 90s, right. North Face in the Southeast was distributed by a manufacturer's wrap company, and it was a guy's name, like the Frank Jones Company. Right. And this guy had North Face. He distributed North Face, and, and uh, he distributed Red Wing. Shoes mm -hmm. and Boots, you know that brand. And I think he had some other brand, top brands. And he had the Southeast. He's the one that distributed North Face. And he would send his guys out to the different stores. This is even before REI opened. And, and well, a lot of these stores didn't exist after REI opened. And, you know, you, you had a lot of them around town until North REI opened. And so they would go out and just demonstrate Gore-Tex and sh show people yeah. actual samples of Gore-Tex. Three-ply, four-ply, all that. Uh, uh, Two-layer and three-layer, yeah, and, and one-layer, and um, and so forth. So I, I met one of these guys doing it, and uh, I bought some stuff off of him. I bought a, uh, a Bigfoot, minus five degree yeah. bag. Yeah, yeah. I bought a Bigfoot from him and some other stuff, and uh, got to know him. And he was coming up with North Face stuff that was heavily discounted. Heavily discounted. At the time, North Face was having in their clothing of this era, North Face was having a quality control problem, big time in their clothing. That's when they already stepped up and started mass producing. Big time. I have actually, I got a jacket from him one time, a mountain white jacket that uh, well, Mountain Light three, up eventually 335 yeah I don't know what they cost now you know it's like I had a Denali jacket in there too. Yeah. yeah Denali's are awesome uh -huh. yeah. The, yeah the reason I'm asking you about this what's uh, the guy's name that you talked to uh, uh, Walter guy. what's the name Goddard Goddard uh -huh. Walter Goddard uh -huh. he used to work with him at a chemical outfit or something chemical plant um, I gave him some, one, I gave him some stuff is that the Kim plant you were talking yeah. about? That's where you That's met right. him at? Okay. Um, he had made mention that you had some sort of scam with REI, you know, when we talked to him. And like I said, we're not here to prosecute. Oh, no, shit. No. Like that. You know what I mean? No, no. no what I did. <laughs> we're, 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 trying to, we're trying to figure out how, you know, yeah. how all this came to be. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, with the REI, I'll go over that night, but with the uh, North Face stuff, mm -hmm. he would come up with this stuff. And I, I have a feeling that it was returns. Because I got a uh, mountain light jacket from him one time. You know, they have the North Face label right inside there. Right. right on you know, right. Uh, the North Face with a cascade. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, no, it was it was sewn in upside down. Oh, wow. The North Face la the label was sewn in upside down. So, like, showroom rejects or something like that? that I have a feeling that's what it was. What's that guy's name? That you... This is over over 10 years ago. Well, I mean, you had some, you had some new, nice yeah, the new models. Oh, no, no, no. Mountain no. money. The no. green one. No. What about the jackets? All, all that stuff was, is, is going on 15 years old. The when jackets you, and stuff? Or? Yes. I don't wear it that much. No. Oh, okay. The good ones. Okay. Uh, no, if you got a, if you got plenty of it, uh, it doesn't wear. Right. Oh, I don't have a piece of equipment 
except for socks. I don't have it in water bottles. I don't have a single piece of equipment that's newer than 13 years. Nothing. No clothing. Nothing. And that's so what, what did you have? I'm telling you, that stuff lasts forever. The thing that, that'll kill it faster than anything is done. Now, all of my microfiber pants, mm-hmm. the newest any of those are is uh, 94. And some go back to 90. Mm-hmm. But I had I plenty of pairs of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the shirts, the Sonoma shirts, again, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a single piece of equipment. None. I don't have a single piece of equipment or clothing. John Caper gave me a Columbia, Red Columbia pullover. Mm-hmm. That's, that's newer. He gave that to me. Mm-hmm. I don't have a single piece of clothing or equipment that's newer than 1994. The, that red North Face jacket and that blue North Face jacket, they look brand new. Yeah, the green one. Looking, yeah, hey, green one. hey, son, go, go get yourself some quality and you'll see. Uh-huh. Okay. But the thing is, I have other parkers too. Right. And, and, and frankly, frankly, uh, most of the years I had those, I, I tended to save those for town use rather than field use. You know what I mean? And there are two reasons for that. Is is of course it has the cachet, the stratospheric prices. Uh, you know, with the logo, yuppies love that. You see them walking around with their Denali. So a Denali jacket never been in the woods, I think. That, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And another reason, though, is that even though it's worth it, uh, your North Face mountain light jackets will be almost a full half pound heavier than a uh, an REI right. switchback parka, for yeah. instance. Okay. They're they, three ply, I think, and then, then aren't the uh, aren't the no, three ply? No, no, no. You, these are called layers, and no, uh, you you've got one layer, two layer, and three layer. Okay. One layer is where the Gore-Tex is bonded right to the outer nylon. Mm-hmm. It may be lined, and it usually is, but it's called one layer. Okay, two layer is where the Gore-Tex is not bonded to the outer one, so you have one two, and then you have a net inside of it, which is a third layer. It's not counted as a layer. That's two layer. Okay, three layer is where you have the outer fabric, the Gore-Tex not bonded to it, and then lined with a tack of the top lining. That three layer. Mm-hmm. So actually, two layer have three layers, but the net, the net mesh not counted as a layer, okay? One layer has two layers, but the lining is not counted. Right. And the, one of the significant... It doesn't supply any like, water protection, correct? Is that the reason why it's not counted? Or? What? It's not, it doesn't have any, like, it's not waterproof? Yes, it is. It's just bonded it directly to the... Oh, 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 I think yeah. that. I, I don't know why, but that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Uh, you know, it's, that's, the, that's the construction uh, of them. In other words, bonded directly to the outer fiber, one layer. Not just suspended, more or less, uh, two layer, regardless of whether you have a, a net mesh or, or not. And then if you have a full lining inside of it, a cloth lining of a taffeta type, mm-hmm. uh, silky type, usually polyester, polyester taffeta, that's three layer. Okay. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, uh, another reason I didn't uh, feel use my... Uh, Mountain lights very much is that uh, you'll find an REI parka. Uh, you'll find a highly technical REI parka, which is I think it's called a switchback. It's got full zips here. It's got a detachable hood. Beautiful thing. Weigh it. Weigh it. You'll you'll find that it weighs uh, uh, about 15 or 14 ounces. Weigh the mountain light. It's a pound and a half. <laughs> now you get it's worth it. It's worth it uh, uh, for expeditionary use. Okay, it, right. It, 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 short term. it is, but just for like a day hike, yeah. and you know, very little of my stuff is, is really multi-day trips. It's mostly power hiking on day hikes. I don't like to carry backpacking loads. I told you, that's yeah. injurious. You, you, you injure yourself. Injuries. And oh yeah, you mess yourself up, man. You do. You get big toes out of joint, knee, and, and so that's really the thing. It's just uh, a half a pound is significant. Backpackers have a saying: ounces count. Well, that's not quite true. But quarter pounds and half pounds, they start counting. Ounces don't count. 
Ounces don't count in that you can carry 16 things that weigh an ounce that you don't really need, and it's only a pound, 16 of them. But if it's something weighs a quarter pound and you start carrying a bunch of that that you don't need, it adds up yeah. real quick. So, in other words, my, my, my philosophy is if someone, something only weighs an ounce, you really need it, and it's subject to loss. Carry two of them. The only reason I ask about that is, like I said, Goddard. Oh no, Goddard, I was just interviewed him. He talked. He talked about the fact that you had some kind of scam going with REI. No, he was like mistaken that. that with the uh, yeah, the North Bay threat. Okay. Uh, but no, but but then starting in uh, early nineties, mm-hmm. I wanted to be a guide and an outfitter. Mm-hmm. In other words, have in other words, not so much a guide, but a backpacking school. Right. Teaching people equipment and materials mm-hmm. and technical walking. Right. Along with that, I, I, I've got a technical walking system just to, I, like I have a stick riding. Right. And really teaching them that rather than guiding them per se. Right. And outfitting them with the good stuff. Right. Okay. And so I, I bought out a hiking club or a guy that said he had a hiking club. It had been in storage. He said it was an industry sponsored hiking club. This was in the early 90s that didn't go nowhere and he said it's really because he didn't put any time and it was supposed to be to educate people in the equipment and create demand. Right. Okay. So I bought that out and I just bought a lot of stuff on my own too. Right. For me also. And uh, I used both medium and large also. So I had to come up with some small and uh, I, I had extra backpacks too. Also, which I just threw away. I actually had those. I just threw them away when I uh, left Tabor's. Goddard also said uh, that you had a telemarketing thing that uh, primarily you 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 liked talking with hairdressers about. Is that no? No. Back in the days when I was running uh, my fraud, unlawful charity. Right. And by the way, that's what I fell on in '95. Right. It was a charge of unlawful ther- therapy uh, and also a, a theft charge that wasn't related to that at all. I started working for this book this white company and became disgruntled and stole the stock. But I considered it a, a credit issue rather than a theft issue, but hey, it wasn't seen that way. But anyway, I took my fall on uh, the unlawful charity in '95. I had actually quit it in 1993. Mm-hmm. They got a grand jury in '94. January of 94, when that uh, Cobb County grand jury got 19 complainants and 23 counts. Total damage, $540. Okay. Which I did on restitution. Yeah, it was $5 and $10. Okay. But by, by an unlawful charity, any count is a felony. Right. Okay. At that time, they got the indictment and they set a 25, the Superior Court set a $25,000 bond on me. That went January of 94. And then April of 95, I was arrested on that warrant. Took my fall, pled it out, five years probation, restitution of 540, pled the theft by theft charge out, restitution $5,600. Concurrent five-year probation. Did the restitution and did the probation. Restitution of 540. Pled the theft by theft charge out, restitution $5,600. Concurrent five year probation. Did the restitution and did the probation. And I went forth and sinned no more. So you pretty much got out of the telemarketing. Oh, no. Where you got that? That's going back over 20 years ago. No, 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 no. If if you want to work on Saturdays and you're, uh, whether you're selling advertising or whether you're begging, who are you going to call on a Saturday morning? Who's going to be there? A beauty shop. I mean, the owner. The owner. Right. right. Yeah. A beauty shop. Yeah. So you get your uh, Dun & Bradstreet microcosm out, and by zip code, it's got SIC, Standard Industrial Classification. Uh-huh. It's got, you know, it's a four, four-digit four code, and you look under beauty shops. Right. And in any zip code you want to work, that's called a Dun & Bradstreet microcosm. And it's got beauty shops. Right. And if you want to work on Saturday and make some extra money, and, well, who are you going to call on Saturday? You're going to call Jones Manufacturing and try to get the boss on Saturday morning? No, 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 no. I mean, the argument against that is that the owner's going to be there, but they're going to be so busy that they won't talk to you. Well, 
that's your average person, not me. <laughs> yeah. I get through to the person that uh, answers the phone. They think I know the lady or, or guy. I get them on the phone. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. I don't ask for too much. And, hey, just to get me off the phone, you know, hey, you know, give me $10, give me $20, give me $25. Can't do $25. you got to remember back 20 years ago, this stuff was epidemic. The people would lock, literally, I've had people, plenty of times they keep a log of it. They have logged over 250 calls a year of the nature I was giving them. Okay, they would set a budget up. Your typical small business owner would <laughs> want, want to get right off for them. For and, them. Yeah, yeah, they'd set up. I'm going to give away two thousand dollars this year, three thousand, and they'd give it away first come first serve. And when the budget was gone, you couldn't get it if right. it wasn't. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't <laughs> because they'd tell you why. I've had two hundred people call me, and I've given away three thousand dollars, about ten bucks a piece. You know, okay, and you couldn't get it. If you did, you did, and that's you know that's the way it was. And so that's where that beauty shop, shop comes from. So they, they're working on Saturday, and that's primarily... That's their day. That's when the owner is going to be there. That's the busiest time of the week on any beauty shop, this right. Saturday morning. But they tend to give up good money. As well yes, as well, yes. And in there, and, you know, what? Women tend to give the money up a little bit easier sometimes. No, not play at all. On the not at all. Not, not at all. all. Not at all. I'm going to tell you something, and you take it from me. Really? No. You, you know what you're being fooled by? You're all being fooled. You're being fooled by a woman's instinct, not her free will. Her instinct is that of nurturing. Mm -hmm. That's because she's instinctually she raises the kids, mm -hmm. and that's and you're being fooled by her nurturing instinct, and she has a soft spot for kids and small furry animals. But I'm going to tell you something. You take it to the bank, pal, and you take it from a guy that begged professionally for over 20 years. The the sex that is the most avaricious, accumulative greedy and heartless is women really? is women I've had more women take the check right out of their husband's hand call up Joe stop and go out in Rex Georgia you know hey now hey Joe yeah 25 bucks go out there to pick it up be right the thing this fucking battle axe wife I'm like, what you doing there and you're, you're not getting that and just take the thing don't listen that's that's what that's why we're in the condition we're in. Is be, don't ever forget this. You don't be fooled by a woman's nurturing instinct. Look at their free will personalities, and you're going to find women are the most hateful, avaricious, accumulative, greedy, and heartless. My God, when the American Indians, the the woodland Indians, and the Iroquois, and so forth, in the Northeast U.S. They'd bring a captive back to, to torture. You know, it was like a, they were inflicting you know, one captive. There's a sociological, a cultural reason for it I could explain to you, but just let me say. When they'd bring a captive back to torture and to death, you know who did the torture? No one. Yeah, yeah, they come out with their hot coals and their sharp sticks, okay? You know who the ones that are on? You send them to war. You may think, oh, my son. Yeah, my son had to go to war. Well, I'll tell you, I've, I've seen it on video more than more than one World War II that been over there fighting. He'd been fighting so much that he's amongst the earliest relief. Come back home and have women on the street saying, you ought to be over there fighting and everything. Women are the most... Women are what got us in this, this situation we're in, man. Yeah, I mean, the reason why is what do women want? The two things. They want their homey kids and they want things. Okay. Hey, do you think pottery was just uh, invented 7,000 years ago? They always knew that clay would harden. The thing is, when they were hunters and men were men and men were in control and, and, and they moved around and they were free and not enslaved by the states because when they settled down, the states were able to... They, they couldn't have things... You can't have pottery. You can't carry pottery around. It's too fucking heavy. It breaks. Okay? So they had to use bowling bags and so forth. And women wanted their things. They wanted their pottery. They wanted their homes. They wanted to settle down. So what happened? At the end of the last ice age, the Pleistocene megafauna, the great big-ass animals, went extinct. Women used that 
to get us get men to start planting seeds and grubbing in the earth like animals, okay? And once they got them settled down on the farm, then what happened is, you know, ecological disaster, they destroyed, you know, they, men have never lived, you know, agriculture people have never lived in harmony with nature. What they had to do was move out of the Anatolian plateau in Turkey and northern Iraq and Iran, and they had to move down into the river valleys of Mesopotamia, the Tigris and the Euphrates, ditto with the Nile. Once they moved down into those valleys, desert there, water there, irrigation, then the state was able to assume control by getting them in a hydraulic trap of these giant irrigation projects, which they did, dams, canals, everything. And once the state got control of the water, they had control of the people. And after that, humanity descended into degradation, slavery, uh, pauperism, that 99% of all humans, the, the history of, 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 of civilization is the history of 1% of the people, the elites. We don't even know what the dredges wore back in many times. You know, nothing. They were just dredges. They were, uh, and, and they would intensify their production and, and try to get more and more. And the end result is no one could eat meat, and they had just eaten mush, you know, which most of the world still eats, you know, rice or you know, whatever, maize, that kind of thing. And it's a, it's a story that's been repeated over and over. And what started it all? Women wanting to settle down and have things and have their kids. When they moved around, you see, they had to kill the girl babies. Female infanticide. The reason they had to kill the girl babies is you got ten men, ten women. Well, if you kill nine of the men and leave all the women, well, that one guy can keep them all pregnant. doesn't do any good to kill the men. You can't control the population by killing men male babies. You can't. What guy can keep a hundred women pregnant? Doesn't do any good. you got to kill the female babies. Okay. Infanticide was the dirty little dark secret of the old stone age. But we're still doing it in the modern times. I consider abortion uh, infanticide, although I'm not judging. I, I, you know what I mean? There's a woman's right to choose. But hey, there's no joke about it. Listen, to, to abort an enviro that would otherwise come to term, it's killing a person. It, it is. It, it just is. And we're still killing... What, in the U.S., how many uh, millions a year? No. Uh, uh, that's infanticide, just another form of it, you see. And so women wanted to have their babies, and they wanted to have their homes and things. And what has happened is that the homo sapiens women, did some kind of mutation in the homo sapiens women, because before, the humans before us, which is homo erectus, okay, they had a run of almost two million years. And their toolkit changed very little. The tools they made and so forth changed very little over that time. Can you imagine such an immense span of time? You know, Homo sapiens, the very first Homo sapiens skeleton that we had now found is 164,000 years old. And more typically, Homo sapiens skeletons are no older than 70, 80, 90,000 years old. And just in that short period of time, what's happened with them as opposed to Homo erectus? Homo erectus, by the way, and so did Homo sapiens, stood taller than modern men. We're stronger, we're in better health, and lived as long as human beings until the year 1900. In the year 1900, the average span of, uh, in the U.S. was 47 years old. And that's about what Homo erectus and home, early Homo sapiens lived to. They were in better health. They had not picked up these horrible diseases acquired from domestic animals such as smallpox, measles, influenza, and a host of others. Those all came from domestic animals, mutations, like your bird flu now. Yeah, it, it, but you see that in the women of the day now, as far as the same type of traits that you... Son, I'm telling you, I'm an observer, I'm a philosopher, I'm a man of vast experience. You're an I've been a professional beggar for 20 years. And I'm going to tell you, who has the biggest heart? It's going to be men. Really? You're fooled by a woman's nurturing instincts and her softness. But a woman isn't soft. It's the difference in our personality. Uh, men tend to be more con confrontational and grab the whole thing, while women affect an air of softness and get it a bit at a time. Almost manipulative, you mean? Much more. So, And I always remember, they got the pussy. <laughs> we're fine. We're totally fine. <laughs> but hey, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Be a Republican. Have a party. Your world is kaput. Your world is over with, pal. It's gone. Okay. Your children will never, never... You want your kids to grow up to be a lawyer? Be, forget about it. There is no future for your kids. There is none. That Muslim scatters by the gasoline balls. 
before they had to come across oceans to get at us. And once they came across oceans, they had this huge country that even if they could get at us, they couldn't invade us and occupy it. Like I say, Russia soaked up invading armies twice. Napoleon with over half a million men. The and Germans were three and, well, no, the Germans were three and a half million men. Okay, these were huge armies. Napoleon in 1812, over half a million. Germans, World War II, three and a half million. Okay, soaked them up, just the vastness of it. They couldn't get out. Now they don't have to. Again, I'm going to tell you, I've told you before, I'm going to tell you again. We have this huge, vast, interconnected socioeconomic structure. You're, you're embedded in a matrix in a world that isn't real, that has been constructed totally for you, and it's all interconnected. It's built on values which are virtual, okay, but it's built upon the harsh reality of cheap gasoline. It's a house of cards. And son, once that starts going, the cascading effects, the ripple effects of this are going to be unimaginable. But just to give you an idea of, of, of what ripple and the interconnectedness of everything, we have a bunch of people here with subprime mortgages that don't pay their mortgage. Okay. A bunch of African Americans and other low rent people that don't pay their mortgages. And what does it end up? Our four national banks so far have written off a hundred billion dollars and it's probably twice that much it's going to end up to keep from failing our biggest national banks Chase Manhattan and the other the big four have had to go and sell parts of themselves for billions and billions twenty to overseas to stay solvent because a bunch of people didn't pay their mortgage yeah. Okay, you see what I mean? Yeah. I'm now that's child's play. That's that's just enough more coffee. I'm on the. I, I'm I know on the you. Side. I know you're trying to get out of here. No, I'm. I'm but not trying but to get you out see, of you see the inter interconnectedness of this. Now, what's going to happen when that cheap? What's going to happen if with if gasoline, if nothing goes bad? I told you. I told you before. I I handled atomic bombs. Mm. Okay, I was in special weapons, and I've handled atomic bombs that damn big that weigh seventy nine wow. pounds and. What's going to, and that's assuming nothing like that happened, right? That's assuming nobody gets uh, weaponized anthrax and shuts down our postal system. All it would take is a few anthrax letters to shut down our postal system. Everybody's forgotten that. Okay, but if nothing bad happened, what's going to happen if gasoline goes up a buck a year for 10 years, and in 10 years it's at $13 a gallon? Son, it's going to bring you down. It's going to bring you down. That's why they can bring the fucking death penalty on me, okay? Go ahead, try me. Bring it on, okay? Because it's going to take me three or four years to come to trial. It's going to, even at the federal level, they'll be able to knock a little time off. It's going to take an average of about 12 years to, to impose it, maybe even longer, really. And, and, and by then, you know, now we're talking 17 years. This society. Well, our case is, our case is adjudicated. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the future, right? That's my feelings towards them. I, I'm giving you a lot of the stuff, man, that, I wanted to say for the profilers because right. they uh, oh, that, they're going to be they're going to be interested to talk to you anyway. Yeah, but, but you know something, you, you you know well you were a little rough on me the first night, but I don't blame you. I don't blame you. You might have had a live girl on your hands for all you knew, uh, but you treated me fairly. You've been a man of your word. Uh, you're cops, of course. I understand that, and uh, we're never going to be friends. But you've been a man of your word, and in the end, you lived up to your deal. And uh, in the end, you treated me professionally, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm giving you something. I'm giving you cooperation. I promised you cooperation that night. I gave it to you. The only question I didn't answer was on the advice of my attorney, and I would have answered that. That's right. what she was doing from the beginning. Right. Yeah, she was. Right. She was because I just told you, once you've done it, you're either going to kill her or get caught. There's, there's no other solution. It's not that, you know. Uh, in the end, you treated me professionally. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm giving you something. I'm giving you cooperation. I right. promised you cooperation that night. I gave it to you. The only question I didn't answer was on the advice of my attorney, and I would have answered that. That's right. what she was doing from the beginning. Right. Yeah, she was. Right. She was because I just told you. Once you've done it, you're either going to kill her or get caught. There's, there's no other solution. It's not that, you know. And, and that sounds cold and cruel. Yeah, it was. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a soldier in me. Mm -hmm. A soldier doesn't matter why. Say. He just does or dies. Okay. I was about to say that's part of the, I guess, the operations order there. Yes, yeah, and it, I, I, I'm trying to impress on you though. It was nothing sexual or, or pleasurable. Oh, you talking about dreadful. being a pro? It was dreadful. It was dreadful. 
you asked, wasn't it you that asked me what's it like to cut someone's head off? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it was dreadful, and the only thing you can do is so dreadful that the only thing you can do is go on autopilot. I told you it wasn't real. Right. Okay. That's all you yeah, can do. Yeah, surreal. It was yeah, body yeah. It, it's so dreadful. Mm -hmm. It's so fucking dreadful that all you can do is do your duty and go on autopilot. It's the same as combat soldiers that told me from Vietnam. They told me the same thing. They'd see bodies, you know, with guts, you know, loped all over the place, heads blown off, and it didn't, it wasn't real. It just didn't look real, you know. You know. Yeah, but it's dreadful. There was no pleasure uh, or anything else. And one may say, well, you're the one to, that chose to make money by killing. There's other ways to make money. There's bank robbery and so forth. Well, you know, in retrospect, I regret not attempting a bank robbery. I really do. Because all of this shit got me nowhere but caught. Okay. And so I might have been caught robbing a bank. But if I'd have scored, if I'd have got five grand, I could I could live off that for over half a year in the woods. You know. And so, yeah. yeah. But, it's a, but it, as to why I chose to kill for money, that was, part of that was rage against society, sociopathic rage against society, uh, against all those people that are now coming forward and so forth. How did you find Walter Goddard? He must have called you. Or did you get him off my cell phone? Well, so, was it that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, and, and, and you know, there again, we're here to, we're here to, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I promise you, I, when we did a deal, I promised you cooperation. Well, well, and uh, by all rights, I shouldn't be talking to you. My attorney's warned me a million times, don't talk to no one without an attorney. But uh, I'm not telling you nothing that, you know, you know what I mean? Right. Well, uh, we're talking about that. history. Right. And uh, I was going to say the history for the pro parts, but there'll be psychologists and psychiatrists, so they'll want to go with that. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to... Well, I'm going to dig my heels in. I don't want federal custody. They're going to send me to Supermax. I just know they are. Huh? What about it? No. Uh, they sent Ted Kaczynski there. All the notorious people. Listen, Rudolph went there and he only killed one person and indirectly two. Okay? He killed one woman with a bomb and another guy had a heart attack. Okay? He only killed one person. Yeah. Yeah. He only, oh, no. He killed two of the police officers. Yeah, the police officer. He killed two. He only killed two people. Okay. Well, and they sent they sent Kaczynski there. He only killed I think two people, but he was a Unabomber. Right. And he's in Superman. Right. So it's where they send the notorious, infamous people. Well, okay, I mean, they're sending my ass to Superman. Well, I mean, that, that, it, it's it, it's debatable on what, on on who who calls you notorious and who calls you mm -hmm. you know just a. A mad guy. <laughs> well, you know, what, what, I mean? what a mistake. The infamous, you know, Jack the Ripper, whatever you want to put it. Yeah. Okay. But, of course, at that first they had to convict me. Right. Well, yeah. Know, I mean, you know. One. And if they, you know, and, and if they want to spend a uh, million dollars, uh, two million to convict me, and then uh, then uh, another two million to, to get death, and then uh, another eight million to uh, defend the death penalty and get around and get around to executing me 17 years from now when I'm 78 years old and I'm, <laughs> I'm decrepit and anything. Hey, they can do it. They gonna, can do who's going to be the one to have to have to call you the Tories, though? Me. You are. I'm infamous. You are. My God. I mean, I I read a little of the news that my lawyers brought me a little bit, but. I don't, you know, I don't really want to read it. <laughs> Curl your fucking hair, man. You know, I mean, <laughs> drifter with a mean streak. <laughs> that's what the that's what the AJC article, a drifter with a mean streak. I, or, or no, misfit, misfit with a mean streak. Yeah, yeah. Well, misfit, I am. Well, it's true. <laughs> I do have a mean streak. I didn't. I think they don't understand. That there's something a little more than that, though. That, that they don't understand that, except for this rampage, I was the injured party. <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. They have screwed Jude and Pat in me every, every which way society has. They called the police on me 30 times when they were the transgressor, trying to get and me... And people in the park type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of society, trying to get me in trouble. If they had their way, they would tell lies to the cop. The cop would arrest me and send me to the penitentiary, take my dog away, and ruin my life. 
just because they don't want to be wrong. Okay? It's as simple as that. You talk about cruel and heartless, man. And you talk about, you know, hey, kill the motherfuckers. You know, you start getting that thing, you know, you just raise against society. Well, you're getting, you're getting a little bit into the, in the you're, you know, more than what we're trying to discuss here. Well, what are you trying to get at except a biography? Well, that's basically it. I'd like to have a biography of you. Well, don't, you're not going to give this to the press. I'm saving no, 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 I'm saving this for a book, man. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, the, hey, I've got to keep some money on the book. Right. I okay, i got lots to do. I understand that. <laughs> and no one's called you up and said, hey, i got some money for Gary Hilton. i, I got to get some money on the book. Right. Okay. And my coverage, you know, I, I deliberately kept the coverage of me limited. You notice when they try to do the perp walk, uh, I insist that we run. I, and, and the day is fine with them, you know. Yeah, you know, I got the best on and everything. The sooner they get me into that car, the better. Although they don't even have to get me in the car, they can walk me right through. And I'm the one that insists on running. To right. the car, you know. You, did you see the way we, did you see yeah. it on TV? Yeah. We, 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 oh yeah, right. I'm the one that wants to do that. You see, I was going, I was leading them. And they'll, they'll open that door, one, another one open that door, and I'm the one that just dives in head first, you know. So kind of like a Hollywood celebrity that's been bad and now yeah, trying yeah, try yeah. to do, you see what I mean? The, the more you limit it, it's the, the bigger demand it makes. Now, if I'd have come walking out like Eric Rudolph, that would said, oh, he's a fucking smug, is all he is. But when I come <laughs> right, it, it is. But, you know, when I come running out of there and then dive into the car wearing the vest, it, it's, it's a mystique. Yeah. It's you got a style about you, Mr. It's, it's, it's the style. The style. Yeah. See, I'm saving it. It's your gravitas. Now, now, yeah. So, so you see, Everybody's got to No one's got pictures of me either, but I got, I got 5,000 pictures of me. Yeah. Bye. Right. from 1990 on documenting everything all my daily lives nothing unlawful nothing unlawful yeah I got it I got it no one has a, a damn picture of me as far as I know except mug shots <laughs> and no one has a single picture of me not under arrest no one nobody I, I think actually Goddard has you have have you found some oh yeah 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 I'm sorry yeah North Carolina had two of me uh, that a woman took yeah that a woman took in uh, in uh, Transylvania County yeah oh you come across the more well I wouldn't right. be I wouldn't be surprised because people are we're not we're not I'm like the lone ranger we're not, we're not in this for the I mean you can you can have a book deal or whatever we're not in for that we're what in, what other pictures have you come up with tell me come on I'm just telling you well yeah, oh, it's okay. You ask him. What's the, uh, no, we, we, we got some pictures of you from, uh, is it out west somewhere? Yeah, I think it's out west. Rainier, I think. Mount Rainier. Rainier. Mount Rainier. Uh, you mean Mount St. Helens, more than likely. I was at, but I was at Rainier, too. But I only spent an hour, hour or two there. Well, but you, you, you can't have about both. You talked about wanting to be a guide or wanting to be a, 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 a teacher. And someone just took a, 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 a picture of me. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Someone took a picture of me, and I know who it was. It's another fucking woman. Women are just... There was a guy in the New York Times Sunday magazine. He was a Iranian descent, American born and everything, but he was Iranian. And uh, he was decided he was a photographer, right? And he was just had a little off time. He was going to do a project of traveling to each state capital, taking pictures of it, and making a montage and this and that. He and he was he rented an uh, uh, bought an old van. He was going to do it. Well, he's taking uh, an airplane to pick up his van to first leg of his trip, and he explained to a woman what he was doing. Uh, I'm going to go to each and she's mm -hmm, uh, an Iranian state capital. And while he was asleep, she took pictures of him snitched on him and if this guy's touring each day castle it gets harder and harder they were like waiting for him they got him on the list he was arrested several times and detained he was refused entry it, he probably had to stop it because this one woman he had told about his project in all sincerity and truthfulness you know took his picture while he was asleep on the airplane and snitched on it, okay? <laughs> and so there's a woman in North Carolina at a picnic area. She drove up. She's just a piece of white trash, and her boyfriend apparently was driving it. And I think she was drunk. 
too. She was acting like she was drunk. She was being very poor and everything, no real inhibitions. And everything. They drove up there, and she set out the window. I had, you know, my typical clothing on, as, as usual. You know, presenting my typical spectacle. You know, as you know, I was being the spectacle, the long, the the long, yeah, you know, my stick, doing my stick. And she said, uh, "And what uh, is your costume supposed to be?" You know, yeah, smart and off, basically. And I said, "I'm the prophet of microfiber." <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it never caught on. You can't even get this stuff anymore, right? It just fucking blew her mind. She didn't know what the fucking. I was about to say, and she probably didn't appreciate. Nah, she, she didn't, and and I, 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 yeah, and I'm almost sure it was the, the photograph was taken from where she was sitting, and I'm I'm, I'm I'm almost sure it was her a piece of white trash. She takes this photo, she saves it for four months or whatever, and then comes forward and here. Here's a photo. She ain't nothing but a piece of drunk white trash herself. Okay, so I, I guess you have gotten. Well, I, I well, guess there's actually a lot of pictures. Well, this, of me is, that this is what I'd like to know from you. One thing I'd like to know from you: where all have you hiked? Where all have you been uh, all over the United States as far as... Uh, oh, uh, I know what you're getting at, the unsolved murders. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not talking about any unsolved. I'm talking about... Uh, what I'd like to know is, is is how accomplished of a hiker are you? Oh, I mean, it, it, you've, been to, you've been to... Been to uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I've never met anyone, ever. And people are full of shit on this, too. But I've never met anyone, anywhere, any way that has the time in the woods and the time on the trail that I have. That I have. I've never worked full time anyway in my life except for the U.S. Army and for the six months I went straight. I worked full time. Okay. In 79, 80. I worked six months. Other than that, I have never worked full time. I've been a criminal. Okay. <laughs> I was a career criminal in lawful charity from 73 to 93. Okay. For 20 years. Okay, and so I never worked full time. I've been a criminal. I couldn't get up and go to work every morning, and I've just been a soldier. It, it took me to the nineties to really realize what I was doing. I was just replicating what I did in the army. It was all I was doing. I was doing field maneuvers. I was replicating what I did in the army. I was, and I, I, I came to understand that I was just not perpetual field maneuvers. Is what I was. Hey, that's good enough. Some guys do it as a career. Nobody, but nobody. And I've had the dogs, too, which means I always have a hiking companion. One thing that holds a lot of people back from getting a lot of time in the woods, again, is an activity is not valid unless you're with someone else. That's, our human, that's our human nature. Right. We and, and so, of course, it's hard. You you ask ten, ten people, oh, do you hike? Oh, yeah, hiking. Yeah, I hike. Well, let's go next Saturday. Well, no, i got a wine tasting next Saturday. Right? You know. That, that kind of stuff, right? In other words, they're, they're, when the pavement ends, they get nervous, <laughs> you know, basically. And, but I had the dogs. And a golden retriever, man, the, the worse the weather is, the more cold, nasty, wet, dreary, bitter, windy the weather is, the better they like it. They're duck dogs. They're game dogs. They're bird dogs. That's when you, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I always had a hiking buddy. That was the revelation in my life. That was at the time I ceased to become the poor tortured sociopath that was trying to fit in but couldn't, that never could, and it would never be accepted anyway. I went from that to, to never being alone and understanding my place and purpose in life and the true nature of my personality and what my fate was, which was to be alone. I, I came to understand that was my fate, my, to be alone. That, that was me. And to try to be something else would be to ensure unhappiness. Okay. And that, that really picked up uh, after it, in uh, 91 when I started dog running, but it, it, it got going in the uh, 80s, uh, from 84 on. And ask Walter Gar, he'll, he'll tell you, man, uh, the, all the stuff I'd... Walter Gar, I'd go out into the uh, Oconee National Forest every weekend and just... Or even around here in uh, Gwinnett County, it wasn't developed like, a, like it is now in 84. Oh, my God, man, huge tracks of woods along the Yellow River and so forth. They're all subdivisions now, but you could just go hiking in Gwinnett County. Hell, they had a deer season in Gwinnett County, you know, then. A gun season, okay? And, and like, as late as 83, they had a gun season and, and you know, uh, I knew a contractor, either cement slab contractor, and he'd just, while the screws were pouring the, the, the thing, he'd take his gun in hunting season and sit out there to see a deer, okay? And so you could have... 
And so I've just been driven. It, like you, you're desperately, you guys are desperately running from it, your existential awareness. Well, in a sense, I am too. And uh, I was a, a hobby runner before. I, I started hobby running in 78. I told you, you know, and that's how I met my wife, long distances and everything. And I did that. And starting in 84, I read it, I discovered the North Georgia Mountains. And by then, I'd been pavement running for six years. And so the, uh, the field maneuvers in the mountains was just replicating what I did as a paratrooper. And it was a new form of exercise. And I'm telling you, when you're in shape, uh, there's just something, to a certain personality, there's something totally addicted to going, like the ever ready bunny, to going and going and going and entering, and entering a state that I call hyper fatigue. When you enter hyper fatigue, totally addicted to going, like the ever ready bunny, to going and going and going and entering, and entering a state that I call hyper fatigue. When you enter hyper fatigue, sort of like the runner's side we've heard about, when you enter hyper fatigue, the world is a different place. And you're like a god in it. The very fabric of space and time is altered. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 you can do it running real easy. Uh, run over 10 miles on a hot day. <laughs> okay. It's almost like a sweat lodge for the uh, American Indian. A vision quest. Yeah, yeah, and they get their vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The the American Indians when they were young, uh, the men when as a rite of passage, they would go and get on top of a mace or something and simply go without food, water, and sleep mm -hmm. for a couple hundred hours. Trust me, if you go 110 hours without sleep, you'll hallucinate. Believe me. <laughs> Pull in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I were talking earlier, and you, you described yourself as a pro. And uh, I mean, in, in talking about that, I as a, as a police officer, when you and I encounter one another, I'm going to know you're not. And I, I know yeah. what you mean, but what, how do you define that? As far as how are you a pro? I'm a pro in that I'm not just styling. You see, the average civilian, their entire life is a style. Nothing is real. If they're rock climbers. Oh, rock climber. Yeah, yeah. I go to the gym. Rock climber. Hiker. Oh, you could do well twice. They've driven up to Neil's Gap and and done the little last part of Blood Mountain and they climbed Blood Mountain. We're all different. We we even, everything is virtual. We even virtual grief. We even have virtual grief. You see the candlelight marches for Meredith Emerson and other people and people show up and they carry the, people that don't even know the girl, mm -hmm. most of them don't, and they carry the things and, and they look, you know, for the news rammer. Hey son, if they want to grieve, if they want to grieve, what about, if they want to grieve, I mean, 35,000 people a year get shredded, maimed, and beaten to death in car wrecks, okay? I mean, if, you know, what I'm talking about is a virtual grief. It's a, it's, it's, they, so you're it's, saying it's like, it's like support the troop sticker on the back of your toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a virtual thing, okay? And so everyone virtually is, is a style, right? They're talking the talk, and they're not walking the walk, and they're styling, and that's why you see posers. That's my word. Perfectly precious posers. That's what yuppies are. They talk instead of do. They pose instead of act. Because they're perfectly precious. Right? Okay. I really started saying that phenomenon in the last days. I got to pee my part and everything standing around perfectly precious and dozy. They have these flat affects. They won't talk to you because they're afraid to. The yuppies work on the uh, philosophy is it's better to not say anything and let them think you're a fool than to say something and they have them know you're a fool. Yeah, yeah. John, well, they're, they're a little bit wiser than they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're posers. And the police officers can see that I'm not just styling. That's why all the hikers you see, 999 of a thousand, they're dressed as is depicted in TV commercials of what a hiker is supposed to wear. They're wearing all cotton. You, only just now are you starting to see a little technical clothing. And you'll see some hikers with a, a technical shirt on, okay? And in other words, a non-cotton shirt, okay? Or microfiber this and microfiber that. It's just now. I was done. In 1990, 
Uh, when I got into your microfibers, I predicted the demise of cotton. I said jeans are finished. Jeans are just nothing but lousy, stinking rags. They're wet and God, and they get, I mean, uh, they're heavy anyway. They're not comfortable. Soak up water. And oh, man, they never dry. They're heavy as can be. They're uncomfortable compared to microfibers. Jeans, jeans are out. Well, was I wrong? You know. Everything old is new. Oh, man. It's the uniform. No one, every, they, uh, what the attitude did you take to that professionalism as far as your, just your gear, or is it just extended to hiking, that sort of thing, or? No. Lifestyle, I tend, what? Yeah, I tend to try to systematize everything and uh, break it down to... You're the, saying discipline and, and, and... No, understanding. Understanding. Uh, whatever activity you do, just like a police officer does. He just learns... He, everything for a police officer, every kind of situation, everything is systematized for him. And he does it by the numbers. And like a yeah, yeah. And uh, the stuff the police officer's training he's exposed to is just awesome. It's so varied. Yeah, many of them. Many of them do. Uh, they're taught every kind of situation. The shoot, don't shoot training that police officers do these days. They use their, their own service weapons and actual sets in uh, constructed bank lobbies or mm -hmm. parking lots. And they use their own weapons. They, they wear armor, full body armor, and similar to paintball armor. And they shoot each other at close range with their own nine millimeter service weapon using a reduced power load and a frangible bullet. And it's so awesome to see them do that, man. It's incredible. They'll shoot it, at, at, they'll just shoot it out just at, at ranges like that, man. It's totally awesome. And, and, and they do it over and over again, over again. So as a result, you see some little, you know, pudgy fuck police officer, man, that can handle a piece so good. Bam, 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 drop the mag, bam, 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 drop the mag, bam, bam, bam. I mean, just awesome. Just fucking awesome, man. And, and they're trained, you know, all the way by the numbers. And that's what I'm talking about. But, but, but really when as I'm... As far as your own training or as far as your attitude towards any summiting a mountain or whatever? Oh yeah, it's all systematized. Even my walking is systematized. I have a I have a, a I have a block of instruction I can give you on how to walk. I, I, if, I, if I was teaching someone, listen, if I'm teaching someone about backpacking, I'm going to teach them how to hike. I'm going to teach them how to walk. I'm going to teach them how to dress, get dressed, and I'm going to teach them how to piss. Okay. <laughs> It, you'd be surprised how easy it is if your pissing is to piss on your equipment. <laughs> your, your clothes are your equipment. You know, you got these, uh, especially with layers. I'm going to teach you how to take a shit. Okay. <laughs> right? It's all systematized. Yeah. As far as this one, like when you're, you know, planning to summon a mountain or whatever, do you come up with contingency plans as far as, you know, if, it, if I don't make it by this certain time, then I'm going to go down to base camp yeah. one, that type of thing. And, it, and you do, for purposes of equipment, you do worst case scenario planning. In other words, what if I fall and break a femur? Bam! And I'm, I'm, I'm cross country. What if, here's, here's the complicating thing, what if the dog goes down? 100 pound dog. Uh, what, what, what if your dog lane comes up lane? What if you got an old dog and he comes up lane? What you gonna do? Okay. You can't leave the dog and say, stay here, I'll go get the shirt. Come back. Here's a flashlight, here's a whistle, here's a sleeping bag, here's some food, here's some water. Cool out, listen for my whistle, blow your whistle in, come and show me your light, I'll have the sheriff with me. <laughs> you can't tell the dog that. The dog weighs 100 pounds. What you gonna do? What if you, what, you know, and you're not on the AT. I only use the AT generally as a, as a connector. I'll climb the mountain to the AT, work the ridge, I mean, climb the mountain to the AT, take the AT along the ridge, and then come back down another route. Okay. It's typical when you're really, truly mountain climbing. Okay, so you cross country. What you gonna do if the dog goes down? What you gonna do if the dog gets his foot locked up? Well, as I said, what you gonna do if the dog gets a thorn in his foot? Have this reason. What you gonna do? And what else? Your glasses, reading glasses if you need glasses. Okay, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it goes on and on and on. For a wintertime hike, if I'm carrying what I what I really should carry, and you can't carry enough water, you can't. It's just too heavy. 
but I'll, I'll typically carry a, a five and a half pound backpack, a North Face uh, snow leopard. I'm getting those snow leopards back, by the way, because I, I, my lawyer's getting them. He hikes uh, Rob McNeil. He's a big time uh, Appalachian Trail deity, et cetera. He's a real hiking enthusiast and everything. So uh, he owns all that now. He owns that. He owns uh, all my personal possessions, and he owns my van. So as soon as you guys can cut it loose to him, I, I'd appreciate it. He's a good guy. He's, my, he's the attorney for the public. Okay. No and everything. And he's, he's got, he owns my van now, too. Okay. And he's going to keep money on the books for me also. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah you have all that all that planned. Uh, it's, as far as the right. worst-case scenario planning. You well, I think that kind of extends, though, when you're talking about your, your dealings with the police and stuff. I mean, you read ahead, knew the law, that sort of thing. I think you, that professionalism is kind of permeated throughout your, is that the way yeah, it is? But I see, I, but when you get desperate, you ignore it. In other words, when you, you when you're going out to kill somebody, if you're seen by a single other person on the trail, then no, that, that that day screwed. But when you procrastinate because you don't want to get up and kill someone, and you let it go and you say, oh, I won't kill anyone today. We'll just go hiking with my dog, have fun. Time we're doomed anyway. And so you get down to the point where, well, it was like Meredith. I had $40 money and several days food. I was going to have to kill somebody in that, in that period of time. Okay. And when you get down to the bitter end, you ignore all the rules you set, which I did, which got me caught. Straight outside of your own criteria for... In other words, yeah. In other words, on Blood Mountain, it's a good place to hunt because it's the most used day hiking trail in the state of Georgia. And uh, this is a three-and-a-half-mile hike up, 1,400-foot climb, and return. So it's a seven-mile walk with 1,400-foot of elevation gain. And I'm amazed at the number of people that do it, but they're able to do it because they're not carrying anything. <laughs> they carry what they're supposed to. I've seen people in that bitter weather that Meredith was taken in, not 11 degrees at night. Uh, I saw the day before going up as I was coming down, the sun setting behind the shoulder of uh, blood, and going up three boys, going up not carrying a single thing, and one I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> they're betting their life. Literally, that they don't they don't stumble and hurt themselves. Actually, yeah. and it's amazing not not more people uh, get in serious trouble up there. It, it does happen up there, but it's amazing. But see, uh, but anyway, it's a good place to hunt in that you have a huge selection. But it's a bad place to hunt in that you a lot, have of people, a lot of people. People. So the way you would do it. So the way you would do it would be to lurk in a blind, so to speak, off the trail. Observe with binoculars right. and work, but I didn't do that either because I like to hike. <laughs> so a bunch of people saw me, and then it was a mistake to pick me up. Yeah, because as you said, uh, she almost whipped my ass. You said I didn't. You say I, I bet that 120 pound girl almost whipped your ass. She almost whipped my ass. She damn sure did. I lost control of both of them, uh, both the knife and the bat. Showed her the knife, grabbed the fucking, it's a bayonet, so it's dull shit anyway. All it is is a spike to stick with, you know, it's not a slasher. Grabbed the bayonet and somehow I lost control of the bayonet and, and lost it, period. And, and it went down. I pulled the bat, deployed it, grabbed that! I mean, it was not my finest hour. It, it was not my, I, I mean, I'm better than that. I am, but I, I found out she was a fucking black belt. Too, which don't mean shit again. They're styling these black belts. They're, they're styling. They're not fighters. They're, they're, they're learning to do some little. But on the other hand, doing that kind of thing does uh, increase your coordination, your okay. hand eye, etc. And it gets you more than used to hand to hand combat as opposed to an untrained person, even though they're not really fighters. And she really. She didn't do no shit. It's just that she had no. She was real quick with her hands and had no hesitation about grabbing weapons and everything. And not only that, uh, she was hard to subdue. And I fought like hell, man. Fought and fought and fought and fought. And then once I gained control of her and got her 10, 15 feet away from the trail on that little side trail I told you about, she started fighting again. And I had to fight her again for several minutes. And her doing that is what got me caught. Because if I'd, if I'd been back uh, to the uh, crime scene, 
uh, just a few minutes sooner, just several minutes sooner, I would have beat those people that found the bat, and I would I would have picked it up. But but as it was, I had to bite her twice, and bring her all the way around the corner of the mountain, and then secure her to a tree, mm-hmm. in spite of her protestations, and uh, then go back for it. So she she caught me fair and square. Yeah. Now, one thing I didn't ask you about this, uh, when you, since you're on that point, one thing I didn't ask you about, did you have to put something to keep her quiet, a, a gag, so to speak, or no, anything no, like never. that? No. She, she, was she unconscious at that point? Never. Well, I'm never. wondering I'm wondering why she wasn't yelling when you zip tied her to a tree. And uh, when you went back to clean the crime scene, what I'm getting at. There comes a point, they fight, and then they submit. Right. And a lot of it is because of me. Right. Mm-hmm. I reassure them. I reassure them that it's going to be okay, but just quit fighting or you're going to get hurt. I tell them, listen, honey, I'm going to spend life in prison just because she said no. I'm calm as can be. I'm a very experienced fighter. You know, the, the thing that separates a martial artist from a brawler is three things. One is the martial artist has a footwork. Secondly, the martial artist is not willing to lose. And thirdly, and very importantly, I learned this from the police, a martial artist doesn't get mad. Okay. If a cop is getting mad from a brawler, there's three things. One is the martial artist has a footwork. Secondly, the martial artist is not willing to lose. And thirdly, and very importantly, I learned this from the police, a martial artist doesn't get mad. Okay. If a cop is getting mad when he's fighting, then t- he's doomed. Okay. And the martial artist doesn't get mad. The martial artist stays calm because the martial artist has confidence in his proficiency. And paradoxicalism. It is. Paradoxically, the better you are in fighting, the less you have to hurt people. And the reason is, is to use minimum force, you have to have confidence in your proficiency. It's the difference between hitting someone on the head and hitting them on a knee. If you have confidence in your proficiency and your ability to deliver the stroke accurately and in what it will do, then even though you're afraid and your impulse is to knock their head off, you're so afraid, you have confidence in your proficiency and you break their knee it's measured. instead of their head. That's what, what it is. And I have confidence in my proficiency because I've been there a million times I fought two or more people with three or four dogs. I've had big guys, well, except for that one guy, they're always going to be bigger than me. I mean, I've had a guy one time with the Chattooga turn right around and get hold of me and everything. The guy was that big, like that man. Looked like an air, and I think he was military, to tell the truth, in his haircut. This is over in the Chattooga, it wasn't that far from Fort Gordon or Fort Stewart. And, uh, and get a hold of me and tumble down a mountainside and and, and still had my shit together and come up with him being on me, but not having control of the stick, but having me, and having the guy realize that he was about to get his face knocked in and just dropping me and running away, okay, because I kept my shit together. I didn't lose it. I was able to take him and flip him off the trail and roll all the way down the mountainside to you know, 15, 20 feet, him come up on top of me and still have my shit together and be ready to... Bam! The, usually, that's what I call the extended fist. You have kinetic strokes and you have power strokes or muscle strokes. And the extended fist technique is, you know, here's the bat right there. And I use the bat like you're supposed to use it. A lot of police departments hold the bat like that. In other words, a lot of police departments teach you on a 36-inch bat, right control, they teach you to have the strong hand down, but you have the strong hand up, like right. this. Yeah, you have the strong hand up. And that way, you can use the extended fist technique, which the tip of the bayonet is there, uh, the uh, stick is there. And so what that is, is this tip of the stick is a extra long and extra hard extension of your fist. Bam! It's awesome. It's devastating. Not only is it very quick acceleration, you know, it, you know, that's where close in work, okay? For at a distance work, it's going to be a kinetic stroke. Kinetic means moving, and it's kinetic energy. And, and in other words, the energy you're imparting into the hip is the energy of something uh, moving. In other words, it's mass times speed yeah. equals force. Okay, so one of them squared. So the, you visualize the tip of your stick as a projectile, and and the object is to get tip velocity. 
So you think that and that type of thing translates as far as in a situation like you were just talking about? What? This training, this practice kind of kind of comes out as far as when you were, you said you didn't have to cover a mouth up or anything. Like oh, yeah, yeah. It's the calm and the calmness I have. I, you know, anyone else when they w- would be doing this, if they weren't a highly skilled martial artist, well, they wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> yeah, they'd, they'd be nervous or what? Well, I don't know what they'd do. I mean, you know, imagine what... It goes back to the pro thing. Is what it's yeah, 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 it goes back, to, and, and it's experience. It's a combination of experience and knowledge. Well, it's like a police officer, or like a soldier. The way a cop wins fights, the way a soldier wins fights, is planning, training, and equipment. That's how, that's how police officers win fights. Planning, training, and equipment. The planning is doing scenarios. What if two guys and another guy comes this way? What if the guy does that? What if? What if? What if? Planning. Okay. And rehearsing. And then train, rehearsing. You do your scenarios and equipment, of course. Well, with, taking care of... Uh, which would translate to weapons, you know. Uh, you call it weapons. Uh, and that's how police officers win twice. Planning, training, and equipment. You know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, little schmuck police officers do way fast. Because they plan, they train, they, they, they are equipped. But, uh, Meredith Bell got the best of me there. <laughs> yeah, she did. Oh, but they, they ask you a question. Once, once she goes over the edge, I got her around to the tree. And she said, no, no, don't, don't, but she wasn't yelling anymore. I said, no, honey, don't worry. Listen, I just gotta go back. I'll be right here. Listen. And I said, and, 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 and also, the first thing I said is, where's your debit card's credit card? And the card and say, what's the PIN number? One, two, three, four. Okay, look, honey, look, look, look. I got your credit card, I got your PIN number. It's going to hurt you, I hurt you. I'll be back just a second. Go, go, go. Uh, just take it. And she just called right there. And from then on, she was just cooperating, like, right there. It was like she wasn't even... And, and to take her back down to the parking lot, I had to go through some really thick stuff, cross a really steep ravine, a drainage with a, uh, a, uh, train at the bottom, really steep, about 15 vertical feet or 20 vertical feet, really steep, cross the, the creek and then come up it again through thick roadies, and then take her down the tail end of a boulder field and then cross country straight down to the parking lot. She was unsecured, totally unsecured except just I put a, a loop line around her neck and just like a leash, like a dog's leash, and that's the only way she was secured. Okay. And I told her that I had a gun and that, you know, I was going to shoot her ass now. But I didn't have a gun, but I had the baby this will look like a gun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was going to shoot her ass down. And, you know, she you know, took off running or something. You know, because, <laughs> yeah, got to do that because most girls could probably outrun it. <laughs> you know, not that fast. And uh, and after that, from then on, she totally cooperated. We we traversed the blood mountain through the stick stuff, down through the drainage up, and it, she was totally cooperative with me and everything else. And it was all the way through. And as time went on, she got more and more cooperative. The last morning, again, I told you, that tank truck got stalled and blocked the road or stuck and blocked the road. And he said he was calling for help. And I, I, I said, honey... Look, we gotta get out of here. This guy's calling for help. Come on, just start throwing stuff in. Don't worry. Because she, she by then knew the procedure for packing and unpacking the van. And she would help me, you know, and how we would do it, and, you know, et cetera. What, what went where. She, she knew it all. And she would help me. And, but I said, hey, now just grab it and throw it in. Grab it. And she just, man, was really going crazy. But I want to tell you though. But, you know, the advice to people that they're abducted is to engage your abductor and to make yourself a person to them and not have them think of you as an object. To engage them, to tell them your name, to tell them about yourself, tell them about your family, tell them about what, tell your abductor that, you know, tell them what you study, what your dreams and hopes and plans and schemes are, and, and try to engage them and make yourself a person rather than an object because the abductor is psychopathic he's looking at you in in, in a human way you want to make yourself a human it was always me it was always me engaging them first thing I ask them is uh, what kind of music you like what's your favorite song what do you do for work where'd you go to school 
for you to, and talk to. It calms them down, calms them down. But none of them ever did that to me. Meredith, the whole time, I knew her thing because I saw her, I knew her name, but I saw it in the lesson, but I just called her Hunt or Honey. You know, I said, come on, honey, come on, let's go. Got to do it. Come on. No, ain't, ain't, no, no, come on. Yeah, that kind of thing. She never once told me, hey, my name is Meredith. I mean, that's what I'd be doing. I'd, I'd be pitching the guy like hell. They don't even pitch me. Like, really, I won't, I won't say a word, you know, just, you know, I'd be saying, hey, listen, hey, no sweat, listen, I'll tell them you had me blind over all the time. I didn't even see you, nothing, I don't know a thing. I had no good, hey, I'm not even going to report this. Hey, just cut me loose, you know, cut me loose as soon as you can. If I can get back for a big alarm is raised, I, I'll never even report. I'd be pitching the whole damn time. I'd be bending. If I was abducted, I'd be bending their fucking ear. You know, engaging them and, and making them think of me as a, establishing a relationship. You kind of expected that, but never got it. it you're right. It's amazing. It's totally fucking amazing. It was me. I, I did form a relationship, but that was because of me. Because I, you're it, reaching out. Reaching out to them, and it, it gets their cooperation because now you're making yourself a person to them. Instead of an inhuman monster, you're making them see as. It's just a guy who maybe got screwed with, but nevertheless, just a guy who's rational, sounding. You know, the act wasn't rational, but my actions otherwise, and and, and everything is rational. Who's intelligent? Who's intuitive? You know, who is well read and educated, and they start to see they see me as a person, and they see that I have a, an interest in them. You know, again, first thing that I would say is. I mean, right there. I mean, while I'm leading them away, uh, what kind of music do you like? You know, that kind of thing. Masculine preferences, things. What do you do, and everything? And tell me about your job. Uh, part of it is I'm curious. You know, if, if as an artist uh, and as a sociopath, if, if you're doing this, you would like to select your victims on an artistic sense. But when you get down, you procrastinate and you hit someone's got a fall. <laughs> you know what I mean? But nevertheless, I want to know them and to see what, you know, who I have got rather than just a faceless person you're going to kill. There's nothing else, something interesting, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, and it's not to say my mind could not have been changed uh, with the right kind of people, but... I don't know. You know, I have a rage against society, and I guess most people would fit the bill as far as the victim goes. Yeah, actually. Again, I'm remorseful over Meredith because just for the fact that, if nothing else, she drove a Chevy Cavalier. You can't, I can't tell you how much I respect that. Why is that? Why, yep, he's going to drive a little cheap white Chevy Cavalier. My God, you can get a... No a brand name is what you're saying. You, no Acura. Nothing no being no, no sub, okay. You can get a two or three years Cavalier off rental or off leash for four thousand dollars. I mean, a new. You can get four. You look in the fucking blue book, okay. You can get a new Cavalier for four, five, six thousand dollars, man. Jesus Christ! And the fact that that girl drove a Chevy Cavalier, I asked her why. She told me that the sensible reasons and everything. I respected her to no end for that. Yeah. Uh, she didn't have a brain in her head, but hey, neither do you either. And I, you know, hey, you know, what the hell? No one does it, yeah. right? You know, that we're all just running. We're all just passing the time. We're all just finding a way, some way to divert ourselves from the the inevitability of our own end. Anything. Divert me. Divert me. Divert me. And by God, don't let me stop and think about it, please. Make me so busy that I can't even think. You know. I can only, you know, just be immersed in the matrix and, you know, everything virtual and nothing's real and just keep it spinning, baby, keep it spinning, mm -hmm. okay? So, yeah, she was brain dead, uh, of course, but, you know, I, 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 the fact that she drove a Cavalier, the fact that she had this job selling boxes, commercial boxes, okay, you know, to stores and, so, and displays and everything, it's just a, a and it was an entry-level slot, she's out there calling on store selling boxes. And she was so optimistic, enthusiastic about it, even though she didn't, you know, wasn't passionate about the job. She sold boxes for Pete's sake. 
but she was happy in it in that she felt she was progressing, building her resume. Six, and as, she, as Meredith said, she said, if I can succeed in selling boxes, then it's going to show the next higher level that, you know, I can go out and do it. If I can go out and sell boxes, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. She was happy in that. She wasn't, did anyone else would be up to, you know, bitching about it? No. She was happy to have the job. She was happy to do it. She did it. She was doing good at it. And, and sure, her life was just stupid, but the thing is, it was full and, and she was happy at it. She wasn't dissatisfied. You see, the human condition is to be dissatisfied. That's that's why we had to settle down and have things and get more and more and more and more. And it's especially the women that are dissatisfied. My God, man, you're having to buy furniture every few years. You're having to buy carpets. They're never fucking happy. And every few years, you got to get a bigger house, okay? They are never satisfied. But it's really the human condition is to be dissatisfied. That's why we're at where we're at. I like to use the saying of, well, we wanted to have something to drink, we invented whiskey. Then we wanted a cold drink, we had to invent the refrigerator. We're never satisfied. That's right. She was satisfied. Well, she, she seemed had to share that have, with you. Huh? I mean, she seemed to share that stuff with you as far as making, you know. Oh, she told me. I, I questioned her. We had long, okay, that, okay. I spent three weeks, three days with her. We had long talks about everything. I gave her a book to read, uh, that uh, uh, Cannibals and Kings. I gave her a choice of books to read. And uh, she selected Cannibal and uh, Kings. Uh, Marvin Harris, anthropologist, 1977. Get it, read it. It'll, it'll explain much of the stuff that I'm telling you. I've been telling you about what's going to happen to us where we come from, what civilization is, mm-hmm. where it's going and everything, and you'll see that you're fucking dead. But hey, don't worry about it. I mean, why? I mean, just enjoy yourself, so what? You're fucked, okay? Hey, there's you and everything, and you'll see that you're fucking dead. But hey, don't worry about it. I mean, why? I mean, just enjoy yourself, so what? You're fucked, okay? Hey, there's you. Matt's, Matt's yeah. saying that all the time. He's talking about the, the meteors coming and, you know, why, yeah. why quit smoking? Why? Well, here's the thing. Let me, okay, in, in four and a half billion years, the sun is going to run out of nuclear fuel and fuel. It will start to collapse in on itself. That gravitation, That's that, that, fall, inevitable, well, that right? fall will be converted to energy. It will it'll make it uh, get a nuclear reaction out of the more heavy and complex elements that it's converted to helium into, which means it will expand out again because of what they call a red giant, and the periphery of that red giant will include the orbit of Earth and will be incinerated in four and a half billion years. And as you come forward in time for four and a half billion years from now, it only gets worse. Because <laughs> we're going to be destroyed 30 times, 40, 50 times over. Before that, it only gets worse. Okay. Well, we're overdue for the big one as, as far as the super volcano in right. Yellowstone with 30,000 years. We're, we're 200 and uh, 307 years into a 500 year cycle on the Olympic plate shake and loose. It's done 18 times in 20,000 years. You don't think it's not going to do it again. They got that okay. meteor coming. And, and when that shakes loose, it's a plus 0.9. You've got to understand, every point on the Richter scale is 10 times the previous point. It's exponential. It's not geometric, you know. Uh, okay? In other words, a 9 point is 10 times more powerful than a, an 8 point. Okay? And we've only seen three of them in history, and, and, and with the Alaska one, we were able to observe it, and, and it was in the modern science era, okay? And when that shakes loose, it's going to shake loose the whole damn Pacific Northwest and Northern California. And I'm not talking about the San Andreas Fault. That's a whole different thing. I'm talking about the Olympic plate where it subducts from uh, the Pacific Ocean and goes under uh, Washington and Oregon, okay? And it just shakes loose. Well, okay? it, before all that shit happens, and before you miss out on chow, let me, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's almost Oh, you mean child. I can't talk to you anymore? Miss, yeah, oh, I, don't, I don't want you to miss out on chow. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, basically, you know, on, on, on your timeline and everything else, we got up to 97 when you went to work with, uh, Tabor. What, what, what time around 97 was that that you went to work with Tabor? Uh, July of 97. July of 97. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I'm going to tell you something. Okay. I took my fall in 95. I told you I pled to the unlawful charity, which right. was indicted in 94, which I quit in 93 because right. I found out 
they were investigating and yet again <laughs> right for the 15th time I called up a guy and he said well the GBI's come by and they've gotten all of my records and receipts relating to the Georgia veterans news okay hey what else is new it happened a half a dozen times they're investigating me yet again this time it was GBI this is in September of 93 mm -hmm. and, and I quit okay and in January of 94 I was indicted 25 grand bond set in April of 95 I was arrested on it and in uh, August I pled on uh, the unlawful charity and in December I pled on the theft charge out of DeKalb County mm -hmm. received five years probation concurrent restitution okay here's the point I'm making since that time with the and this includes traffic too okay since that time I have broken no laws with the exception of marijuana usage mm -hmm. and failure to file income taxes. I have not broken a fucking law until I went on my rampage. So I want to put you at, at ease there. Okay. There's nothing I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. I'm a man of my word. I'm mm -hmm. helping you, okay? I got no reason to hey, man. Hey. Listen, you can sentence me to death, you won't be able to fucking impose it, okay? I'm not no, I agree. You want, okay. When Listen, did you that, that, when did your rampage begin? Can I ask you that? I mean, yeah, it's my team. Right. Okay. Okay. Is that, when you, is that when you and Tabor had kind of a yeah. disagreement or whatever? Oh, uh, we've been having a disagreement, but uh, I, I probably wasn't getting the money. The reason I wasn't, he was saying I was a uh, historian, and uh, I, I knew what his scheme was, and uh, I was not unlawfully threatening him, but he was saying I was. And the last check he gave me was $2,100 uh, that I extorted for him. <laughs> Tabor knows me better than any person alive. Tabor knows me much better than anyone. And Tabor is scared shitless of me for good reason. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tabor knows me. I don't have to spell it out to, to Tabor. I don't have to threaten him. Okay. Okay. He knows me better than anybody. All right. Not that he's close to me. He just knows me because I've revealed myself to him over the years. Again, you need someone to talk to. You need someone to trust. So I thought, I'm not his kind of people. I mean, here's the yuppie's credo, okay? Number one is always remember that you can slum around with guys like Gary Hilton, but always remember they're not our kind of people. Number two, number two, never ever be impressed by anything that anyone has done unless they got a whole lot more money than you do. Okay? That means if I go and climb Mount Everest, that means if I'm the super mega stud of studs, don't be impressed by me unless I have a whole lot more money than than you do, than he does. And number three, don't ever let the people have a cut of the pie. <laughs> okay. Keep them down where they belong. Keep them wage slaves. Taper pretended he was giving me a cut of the pie, but he was giving me half of it. Yeah, so uh, at any rate, the point is, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, oh, the, the, so the last check Taper gave me, he left it, and on the envelope it had ransom written on it. What did he mean by that? He meant that he was being extorted and he was giving it to me under duress. Okay. okay. And then he left me a letter saying I was threatening him and and I was doing this tough guy act. That's what pissed me off. I, I was saying act. Act. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an act, dude. <laughs> no, no. But here's the thing. It, you know, in my mind, if someone gives you money, mm -hmm. and regardless of what you said to them, mm -hmm. If someone gives you money and they're saying they're doing it under duress for fear, and you accept it, in my mind, that's prima facie evidence of the extortion. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, regardless if I threaten someone, made an unlawful threat, you know, I would, you know, I, I, I say I had plenty of lawful threats I could use. You know, I fuck them up legally. That Ron McKinney suing me. But uh, but if but if someone gives me a check and say I'm giving this, this to you because I'm afraid of you, and because I feel threatened by you, and I'm in fear of, of my limited life of you, and I'm giving you the check for that reason, and they document it, okay, by writing ransom on the envelope, by putting a letter in it saying that they're being threatened, uh, and you take that check and, and cash it, well, that is extortion in my mind. Isn't it? I mean, I can see point, yeah. that's, pro that's yeah. prima facie evidence of extortion. Right. Right. If they can document it, have witnesses, uh, the envelope had ransom written on it, like, you know, ransom for your life, I guess. You know, I'm holding your life and, and yeah. you know, 
And if they're saying to me they're giving it to me under duress and because they feel threatened and I take it, and then that's extortion, isn't it? Yeah. Could be construed to be. Right, right. right. Certainly could. Right. And they document it. They document it. By yeah. the way, person on the jury, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I think under the law, too. Right. Uh, actually, actually. Well, <clears throat> what exactly, I mean, what, I don't want to get into Tabor that much, but I mean... It's you tell obvious. Tabor it's that, obvious, that girl is... I killed the girl, but you tell him that girl is dead because he's a fucking smart-ass girl. Right. And instead of instead of telling me, Gary, the jig's up, you know... I mean, I don't know what the fuck was going through his mind that he didn't know the girl was dead. Probably, and the girl wasn't. She was alive. Probably knew I had the girl. You know, it was just gone down that the girl was missing and apparently being abducted by me. What the fuck was in his mind trying to lure me? That you think you're well, going to rescue the girl that way? Well, I, like I'm going to bring the girl there, especially when they brace him. Yeah, what the fuck was going through his mind? You tell Tabor if he had just told me, and it, it makes sense. You're it's intuitive. If he had told me, Gary, they know it's you. And they're looking for you. And if you got that girl, just like you told me, the first thing you said to me is, Gary, if there's any way that that girl's still alive, please, or work to that effect, you said, please tell us. See, you were exploring that possibility right from the get-go. Not Tabor. He's too busy being a yuppie, smart-ass girl, okay? And tried to lay his coy little trap, and, and I told him, well, I couldn't pick it up that night or the next day, but I might be there the next day. Okay, because I, mean, I was still not fucking wishing the girl was still a body of life. Oh, man, I still had that. I got to now, I got to go off the, oh, God, you know. And I was just, you know, I come unraveled. You, you saw what, how, I went, I felt the rest of it. I slept almost 24 hours a day for, for the next Well, like Clay was saying, I hate bringing Tabor into it, but just out of curiosity, he just strikes me as kind of a weird, weird fellow. Oh, yeah. Based on his yeah, head. yeah. He, he kind of acts like you've had something over his head. Yeah, that's the different. impression that I got. That or is he just scared of you? Oh, he's afraid of me, and it it just may be that his wife doesn't know he's a lousy flacker that lies about everything, but I doubt that. The last message I left to him, uh, I was telling him, John, you're working an agenda that's not working for either, either of us. Uh, it's not working for me because I'm not getting paid. It's not working for you because it's not going to happen. And that is, John, uh, I will never unlawfully threaten you, John. I said, now, I can understand there's two reasons why you might think you could goad me in to unlawfully threaten you. One is that if you had done to anyone what you've done to me, they would be so mad and so outraged that they may well utter an unlawful threat. Secondly is the fact that, well, I'm a stud, and the training I received and the fighting I've done is a matter of public record. The training I received is a matter of public record, and the police have been called on me 30 times. The fighting I've done is a matter of public record. But, John, you're forgetting something. In all those instances, I acted lawfully. I keep my actions lawful. Now, as far as blackmailing you goes, he had never broached that subject, but I, I, I wanted to throw this in. I said, as far as blackmailing you goes, well, John, hey, what am I going to do? Tell your wife you're a lousy faggot that lies about everything? Man, I'm sure she's known that for several years. <laughs> I don't know, told and it's my feeling. You know, Jan is dumb. You know, <laughs> and again, when you love someone, you have this dreamboat of a guy. And you, you, I, you've seen paper, yeah, yeah. He's dreamboat for the average. You know, he's forty-four, forty. He's born in sixty-four, man. Okay, he's in his mid-forties. Your average schmuck in his forties is a sack of fucking shit, man. You know, he's done spread out. Man, Tabor's a stroking dude, man. I mean, he's tall and good-looking, yeah, and he handles himself beautifully. He's so impeccably mad. Of course, they, they pose, and they're precious, and that's the way they do it. And so I can understand this wife being blinded by that for several years. But again, she's an attorney. She was first in her class. She's not stupid, you know. So I feel sure that, that she... Did he ever, like, come on to you or anything of that? Oh, thing? no, not at all. Or not like all, share not. an experience with you? Never. No, no. Talk about no, what I no, did no. Friday night? Until or? recently in our relationship, that was, I would never, never have broached it at all. But he got could tell. politeness or just out of? Uh, no, because if you're friends with a faggot, it, it becomes accepted, an open thing between you that you're 
that he's a faggot, then you're hanging around with a faggot. And in my experience, it, if you're hanging around with a faggot that's acknowledged to be a faggot, I, I shouldn't use those words. It's pejorative. Uh, I, I think the world of gay guys, by the way. Gay guys as a group are more handsome, more talented, more smart, more everything than, than straight men. They, they are. Uh, they're beautiful. And, and talented and everything. Good looking, too. You know, but One of the ways you tell a guy to a homosexual if it's just too good looking, <laughs> head dressed too damn well like Rock Hudson. Okay. Now, now uh, Taylor, Tabor's always known for many years that I knew because he he knows me better than anyone and he understands how sophisticated I am. By sophisticated, I mean a sophisticated person understands what they're seeing and sees almost everything. That's what I mean by sophistication. Okay. In other words, I've been to New York City. So, uh, Tabor knows I'm an extremely sophisticated guy. You know, and, and the only reason I'm not rich it's because I'm crazy. <laughs> well, there's downside to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> hey, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, in a sense, it sounds weird, but, but even at this point, I wouldn't trade it for being the average of cognizant schmuck that's going and plodding along, doing a job, career, family, going to church, doing all those dumbass, mindless, brain dead fucking things, man. I wouldn't trade it even now to be incognizant. Of, of, uh, uh, as the Irish person, it, to be an, a sentient of, of, of the true reality of, of life. And it's all right there in front of us, but people have uh, the capacity to, not, to deny truths that are as big as the news on their face. It's called dimming of awareness. It's a human psychological phenomenon that, number one, reduces tension, and number two, facilitates social interaction. It's a psychologically proven phenomenon that can be demonstrated in the laboratory that we dim our awareness of situations. It's almost like the guy's got a big wart on his nose, but you don't look at it. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what drives cops mad, because cops understand that everybody's got an asshole. All you got to do is look for it, and it, it can drive them nuts. <laughs> it, it can. And that's what drives cops mad, because cops understand that everybody's got an asshole. All you got to do is look for it. And it, it can drive them nuts. It, it can, you know. It, it's part of seeing the dark side of things. That's why you were standing there scowling uh, when they were <laughs> taking my, my hair because you just spent the night with a dead body, okay? And I saw the uh, crime scene guy. He had uh, Dalton Forrest mud on his knees and on the toes of his boots. And that man, he had been down on his knees in the in the mud in front of a dead body. That used to be a young girl, and, and I imagine so did you. You spent the night with a dead body, and I think I'd be scowling too. I was really scowling. <laughs> yeah, you people, were. You a lot of people accuse me of that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people accuse me of that, and when I'm actually not, I'm, I'm, I, I get my face is naturally frowns or whatever. But you know, you know, hey, you're authorized to because you know Michael Moore, the guy that filmmaker, that, mm -hmm. you know. He uh, has referred to Americans as grinning idiots, and it, no, no truer words were ever spoken, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, especially since 1996, they all had the teeth whitening. You know, prior to 1996, if you would go to a dentist, the dentist would be wearing a lab coat that white right there, right? If you went to a dentist and said, uh, Doc, I want you to make my teeth as white as your lab coat there, the doc would say, well, I'll do it, but... Don't tell anyone it was me that did it. Because it looks so unnatural. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, everybody's that way. They're grinning fucking idiots. I call it a dental display. is what mm -hmm. I call it. It's like you, uh, chimpanzees and other apes, they do a genital display. You ever see a chimpanzee in a zoo level like that? That's a genital display. Well, they do a dental human do a dental display. That's why I love my teeth. These are both artistic, philosophical statements, and they're practical, too. If someone is fucking with me, I go, you're pretty. <laughs> it scares the shit out of any damn mm -hmm. but They know I'm for fucking real. I ain't no <laughs> yuppie. I'm a I ain't posing, bitch. <laughs> I got my fighting teeth in, bitch. <laughs> well, can I help you? How are you going to help me? <laughs> Do I look like I need some help? <laughs> You're too ugly to help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the book is so basically, yeah. <laughs> basically, on our timeline, you basically are telling me that you committed no crimes Nine. between ninety-seven Nine. or ninety-five, 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 and, and, and the present, and so, 
answer when I whenever, whenever never, you whenever I didn't I didn't get a ticket. It, the right. reason I didn't get a ticket is because I didn't break the law. So you, <laughs> so you kept a legitimate job in tapered business. The, yeah, and I did five years probation from ninety five to two thousand. Right. Okay. And the only things I did unlawful was smoke marijuana right. from morning to night, all I could get. I never dealt it. Right. I just smoked it. And I didn't file my income tax. A lot of people said you were an average marijuana user, and I used to work narcotics. And morning to night. And, and I, 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 looked in your, I looked in your van, and there's no evidence of that in your van. I had run out two days before. Well, let me ask you this. You, 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 had, the, you had the Mazda pickup truck. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. Until, uh, until what time? Mazda pickup truck until 2000. Until 2000, at which time you got the 86 or 80? Uh, 96, 96. 96. Uh, 96. 96. What? Astro. Astro. And then I got this current Astro 2001 in uh, 2005. 2005. Okay. And you didn't have any vehicles in between that time? The reason I'm asking this is, you know, everybody came out of the woodwork and they're, you know, I saw him at such and such time, he was driving a, a Chevrolet truck, or he was driving no. this. You never drove a Chevrolet truck? No. Never no. did? Never. Okay. Never drove any other colored band than, than that white band? Never. Okay. The Mazda was black. The Mazda was, was black. It was a B2200 with a gray camper on it. Camper shell on it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What happened to it? Where did it was abandoned in the parking lot of Motel 6 on uh, Oak Brook Parkway in uh, Gwinnett. Why was it abandoned? It uh, couldn't pass the emissions and I hadn't had a valid tag on it for a year. I drove it all over with an invalid tag on it. It was expired and what I did is I had a trailer hook up, the electrical hook up, and I had it artistically made so it looked like the plug-in was just hanging down over the decal of the year, but it was actually affixed to it by wire, but it looked like, I even had it artistically, so it just looked like it was dangling, but it wasn't, it was affixed by exactly. wire, affixed to by wire, yeah, they covered it, and I just, I drove that for a year with expired tags, and if, and if I'd see a police officer behind me, I'd, if I if I could pull into somewhere, I, I, I would, you know. Police officers got ESP as to when someone's avoiding them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if they see you pull into someone, they know that you're avoiding them. But so I was carved from the back. They're, right. you know, cops are dumb. They're, so uh, they, they don't have to be brain surgeons, but uh, you know, they're not dumb me to be. They're professional. Well, let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I know that you're an avid gun lover, also. Mm -hmm. um, you're pretty proficient with a firearm. Yeah. All right. You well, saw my records. No, no, the FBI's got my army file. Do you have my FBI file? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, don't. if you got me, if you got my army file, you would see that I have orders cut, mm -hmm. certifying me as an expert on the rifle, the auto rifle, the pistol, the machine gun, and the bayonet. What's your What's your weapon of choice? Do you, I mean, do you have one? And I'm purely psychological standpoint. Do you have one? According to the mission. According to the mission. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, listen, if you're, you know, a, a good weapon to have is the uh, North American Arms Mini Revolver, five shot, uh, 22 Magnum, stainless steel. Stainless steel is the only way to go, man. Especially you don't, know, wood there, man. If you don't have stainless steel, you got to oil the thing, and then you carry it in your pocket, you get oil out of it. It's crazy. Stainless steel is the only thing to have. Right. And that thing, you can just just high, but yet it's extremely lethal. It puts out generally about 300 foot-pounds of energy. It's right in the 38 Special range. It's as powerful as a 38 Special. Mm -hmm. And in other words, enough to do the job. The, all, all of your small guns generally, anything under that is not powerful enough, and that includes your 32 Auto, your 25 Auto. Uh, 25 Auto, as opposed to 300 foot-pounds for a, 25 ma a 22 Mag, well, 25 Auto develops all of 62 foot-pounds. You can take it, and I've done it. You can take a 25 auto, put it right up against the laminated automotive glass, laminated glass, bam, shoot right into it, and it'll catch the bullet. It won't even go through it. Yeah, the 25s are. But of course, the 25 probably kills more people yeah, than any of the rest. Because African Americans get them for nothing. Right. right? And, and, and if it hits you in the heart, I know a girl who, whose father carried a 25 auto. As he was getting out of the car, it fell. And hit the curb and discharged and hit him in the heart and killed him. 
So, right. but nevertheless, it's not enough to do the job. Right. The 38 specialists, the minimum power you have in a handgun. Uh, but, but of course, the problem with it, the, that is that for actual gunfighting, its rate of fire is, is not what you need because to, to reload the thing, you gotta take the cylinder out, get the, the bolt, it doesn't have an ejector on it, you gotta, you know, and knock them out with the, the cylinder rod. And then, you know, pretty little. Now, I practice doing that, and, and, and I can do it in the dark, okay? Yeah, she always had to practice yeah. reloading in the dark. But it's no good for gunfighting, though. Uh, if you're gunfighting, of course, you, you Glock 17 would, you know, be it. Uh, with a, with, uh, yeah, I got, a, I got, a, I, well, I'm, I qualified it. Uh, I call an expert on the on the on the pistol, which was the the forty five order. No, nineteen eleven. Yeah, I think it'd be a forty five, man. Myself, but. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, it's, it's just again the firepower of the Glock, the seventeen rounds, and the forty five is seven rounds. You see, but no, the, the uh, police officers are coming to the conclusion that nine millimeters aren't powerful enough. So you see them go to the forty caliber. Yeah. And uh, and forty five that nines aren't enough. So you don't like nines or uh, it, the, the the magazine capacity is fabulous. Yeah, wait, yeah, fabulous. Yeah. fabulous. How about it's forty. Uh, Never mess with. I, I don't I don't know, even know the ballistics of the forty actually. Glock uh, Glock but, scares me sometimes. I mean I'm not really a Glock man. I'm, no, I was no. always a. I've never used one, but just based on its reputation and the magazine capacity of seventeen mm-hmm. rounds. Let me tell you, man, if you're good with that and you have the thing, uh, if the gun, if you know where the gun is shooting, uh, let me put it that way, uh, kick ass on that. I mean, I don't use, my, my, my firing, uh, position with a pistol, if I'm, if I'm gunfighting, even like, there's the guy and I'm, you know, we're gonna gunfight, is go down, go down like that, and I've done this with a 45. Bam! 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 You get, with no hearing protection either. Right. And see, not only do you have a stable base, but you have a very small target. Right. And as a matter of fact, I'm better kneeling than I am prone right. with, with a 45. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in the Army at that time, in the 60s, we did not use any other standing offhand position. Was, was it was one one-handed. Handed. was one-handed grip. It's a dualist position in that you're turning your body sideways and you're presenting what, less, target. less of a target. Mm-hmm. And also, you have your you're a little more protecting you. You got your you got your lung protecting your heart. In other words, yeah, we would we would do it this way, right? And uh, I never saw the two handed stance used in, until the, the late seventies on the the cop shows and everything. I think it's kind of stupid, really, yeah. in in a way. I actually do. Um, uh, although for coming around corners, it, it it you know it maybe maybe you know maybe you can get on point right. just a little bit quicker. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Now, but I just don't want to quack the guns. I just yeah. always prefer something to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Yeah. What um what else we need? Your your thing with Tabor just kinda like you were talking about. It snuck in over time. It snuck in over time. The Tabor, half of his sales are delayed sales or go back. T- Tabor can't close. We're talking even at his giveaway cheap price. I take it that was his responsibility as far as you acquired the sale. Yeah, you yeah took the lead. He, he went and, and sold them. Even at Tabor's giveaway prices, uh, a signing job is over $10,000. Okay. Even, even at a giveaway price. Uh, still a lot of money. And even if it's a giveaway price, if it's $10,000, what are you going to say if a guy comes and presents you with a $10,000? You're going to say, I'll think about it. Of course. It's rare that the customer is so committed that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, give it to me, you know, yeah. right, right. He's going to say, okay, even if he's got bits from other companies that are considerably higher, he'll say, I'll think about it because he wants to figure out what's wrong with it. Right. In other words, you can't give it away unless you sell it. You can't. You can't. And, and what do I mean by sell it? Inducing urgency. So, sure. yeah, this is what my sales are with the way I approach selling. I lie to the customer, but I never lie about things that materially affect the terms and conditions of the job. You said the what I lie about is only one thing. And that is to get them to put, uh, huh? Urgency. 
to get them to buy from me now. And how do I lie? There's a million lies. Oh, you know something, John? For the fifth year in a row from the James Hardy Corporation, he won the Golden Hammer Award. Yeah, and every quarter, he's in the winner circle also. Yeah, this is by post-installation surveys that the James Hardy Corporation will send you. They'll send you one after we do your job. And it's based on customer satisfaction. And it's a way to think of how many jobs you do versus your percentile of customer satisfaction. And John, again, got the Golden Hammer Award. Yeah, he's going for a cruise this July on a 20-passenger luxury yacht Curtis in the Aegean Sea over there, courtesy of... Last year, they sent him to Hawaii. Well, at any rate, when you win the Golden Hammer Award, you get an allocation of 10,000 square feet of siding to help you with your business. And at the same time, increase the market share and the market penetration in any given subdivision of James Hardy products. And guess what? Your subdivision qualifies. So, right now, we have that allocation, and we're going to be able to offer you, I guarantee you, I promise you this, the best price you'll ever see. Which is true. That's, that part is true. So, you see, that's all lies. That's all bullshit. But it doesn't materially affect the terms and conditions of the job or anything else. It's simply to get them to buy from me now. You see? Mm -hmm. It could be as simple as something like business is real slow, which at the time is, is not untrue. <laughs> business is real slow. Every time we get a job in this particular subdivision, which is true, we've done 22 jobs in this subdivision. Every time we get a job in this subdivision, we got a real good chance of getting another job from one of your neighbors right off that sign we're going to put in your yard. If you'll let us keep it there for 30 days, please, after we finish the job. we got a real good chance of getting another job in the subdivision because our work is all over. If people want to understand what kind of work we do, there's plenty of examples of it right outside their door. We may have a job across the street from you. You know, the papers send 10,000 jobs. And so for that reason, work is slow. Well, rather than send the crews home, I'd rather them be busy putting siding on your house and just earning their paycheck and, and, and taking care of the material. So, yeah, I'm going to give you a siding job. You're going to give it to me? Oh, that's right. I'm going to give it. I've got to, I've got to pay my crews. And I should tell you, they're the highest paid in the industry. And you will be the beneficiary of their craftsmanship. And, of course, i got to cover my materials. I don't go steal it. But otherwise, I'm going to give you the job. And the reason I am is we've done 22 homes in this subdivision. This will be the 23rd one. When we're doing your home and your neighbors see your brand new house, then see how good it looks and everyone driving by and seeing the crews there and the work going in and our signs in front, there's a good chance we'll get a job right off of that job. You said, well, it's true. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's true, but, you know... It, so it's a, it's a blend, but the, but the only reason I'm lying to them is, is not to cheat them or to screw them, is to overcome human procrastination. That's all. So it's just to induce urgency. That's all. So it's just to induce urgency. But a Tabor can't follow up on it, and he couldn't close it. So what happens is, is more than uh, at least 50% of his sales are go-back sales. And I ascertained that through in conversations for years and years with Tabor. Every time he'd tell me he had an appointment or got a job, I'd say, first of all, is it mine? You know, and it's no. And, uh, well, where'd you get the lead? Well, it's a go-back. Well, where'd you get the lead? Oh, from a guy that I did a job and he knew someone at work. Okay. So by his own testimony, over 50 or 50% 50 or more of his jobs are go-back. And it started sinking in over the last year. Again, you, 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 you wonder how I can be so stupid. The reason is I trusted him, okay? When you trust someone, you dim your awareness. You, you, you lose your... Okay. Yeah. And it dawned on me that Tabor in 10 years had never paid me for one delayed job. Not one. Does that sound crazy or not? Mm -hmm. And see, but that's the way they always catch themselves, don't they? They get, they, 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 instead of taking part of them, they take all of it. I asked Tabor one time, I told Tabor one time, I said, hey, John, did it ever occur to you that you were taking them all? And I answered the question myself. I said, of course not. It was too, too easy and too much fun. <laughs> I told him. So, yeah, it, we, we, we had this realization. But I really didn't want to be accusatory to, to him. So I tried to kind of analog the same as the threats. 
uh, rather than a naked threat or a naked accusation, I tried to, uh, the same way as I, I, I made him aware of my cognizance of his homosexuality. I kind of let it sink in that that I was hit to what was going. Uh, and just uh, rather than saying you're a faggot or, or you stole every job from me, because you do that, and so what's the first thing that a psychopathic criminal is going to do? He's going to deny it to the end, just like a cheating husband. You know, you say, honey, you've been you've been cheating on me. He's going to deny it to the end. Well, I hired a private detective, and they followed you and heard you in a motel. He's still going to deny it. He's going to deny it till always, never, ever, you know, admit it, right? And so that's why I wasn't accusatory to her, because once you do that, then he's going to feel compelled to deny it. Then you have a debate and an argument. I tried to couch it in terms that, hey, it's, the realization is there. It's a done deal. I know it. You know it. And I'm not even going to broach it, you know, in public. <laughs> And that's the way it went on for a year, and he started squeezing me. Hey, who's going to take me to the bathroom? The detectives or... Uh... Yeah, we'll get you somebody. Okay, um, fine. Hey, good talking to you guys. Feel free to come back and see me. I may be getting out of it. When am I leaving here? Uh, don't really know. Department of Corrections probably come and get me sometime this week, I would think. Okay. I would, would think. Hey, Gary. Yeah, Gary, I appreciate it. Okay, Gary. Gary. Good. I'm not all bad, pal. I'm just a... Let, you me, know. let me hook you up Okay. Here. So these guys don't break out. Or oh, no, I understand. I understand. Hey, you got to get used to it, though. Yeah. Listen, I couldn't. Yeah. There's no way I can make it on the outside. I've told you before. I, I'd have to turn right around and walk back in here. I had no place to go, nothing to do. I'm feeling real good now, multiple sclerosis, because I'm laying in bed, just laying and reading. Where are you getting your keeping it warm? Yes, I'm laying flat on my back. I walk about a mile, mile and a half in my little cell quite often. But other than that, and the, and attorney's business and so forth, other than that, I'm laying prone. I'm laying prone all day and all night, and I and and it's got me feeling great. That's good. All my symptoms are virtually all gone. You put on a little weight. I've gained six pounds. Or at least six pounds. The food is good. It's enough of it. I'm always a little hungry, but that's the way you need to be when you're 61. If you're not always, I got it. If you're not always hungry, uh, you're going to spread out.